If you can all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you can remain standing, we have our invocation this evening by our police chaplain. Vincent the Berenger. Will you please bow your head? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for every seat that's been filled here today. For each mind and heart that fills the presence of this room, we thank you. Only you truly know what we are setting out to accomplish today at this council meeting. We have an idea, a vision, hints, even an agenda. We have talents, abilities, and time to work. However, only you can see in perfect detail the end of every beginning. Only you can see the end result of every decision, every project, every choice that will be made. Father God, in your mercy, please use us, even our mistakes and missteps, to be used for the good of all. Father in heaven, your righteousness transcends all our efforts and understanding. Forgive us for our pride the pride that puffs us up, and the pride that threatens to unqualify us. Strengthen our confidence in who you have made us to be. Set us free from comparison to others so that we can work together efficiently to make Santa Ana a better place to live and work for all. Father God, I ask that you bless this meeting today and all who, those present with wisdom, courage, and empathy. I especially ask for blessings for Miguel, our mayor, and our council members, David, Vicente, Juan, Cecilia, and Jose. I also pray for blessings to be bestowed on David, our police chief, and for Christine, our city manager, as well as all those members of our community in attendance here today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to start uh, things off this evening with a very special presentation from our state senator, Thomas Umberg. Um, as he approaches the mic, I just want to tell you that um, I believe, um, Madam Clerk, can you just bring the other mic down, please? I, I, I believe that uh, we're very fortunate to have him serving in Sacramento on our behalf. Um, um, I have found Tom to be you know, responsive, motivated, capable, experienced, and um, uh, and really eager to help, eager to find out what our issues are, what the problems are, and how to make a difference. So um, I not only look forward to this legislative update, but if any uh, members of the council have any questions or want to engage, um, we're very fortunate uh, to have our uh, state uh, senator here with us this evening. Please go ahead. You have the floor. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. After that, I'm, I'm just going to be quiet. I'm, that, that's it. I'm leaving. So, no, thank you very much. Oh, you're doing much. a good it, job. It, you're it doing is, a good job, it, and we appreciate it. It, it, it is um, quite a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I was first elected to represent Santa Ana in 1990. Uh, it was pretty amazing that, that they allowed sophomores in high school to serve an elective office. You may recall that, Mr. Mayor. I think we were both sophomores in high school, right? We were. Yeah serving this community. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just pleased as can be to represent Santa Ana once again as the largest city among the nine cities that we represent in the district. I'm, I'm pleased that you've stolen the city manager from, from Anaheim. Christine Ridge and I worked together in Anaheim some time ago. Um, what I wanted to do tonight was just, just give you a quick, quick update um, and, and invite us to be of further service to you and, and the people that we mutually serve. Um, as I mentioned, I, I represented Santa Ana once before. This is my third stint in the legislature. I'm somewhat resurrected. Uh, we've been working hard on a, a number of pieces of legislation. I'm just going to highlight a couple things here for you tonight. One is SB 450. I know you followed it closely. Uh, let me explain what that is. Um, this is a piece of legislation recently signed by the governor, and its purpose is to provide transitional housing to homeless uh, by taking motels that uh, may be a bit run down 
and then turning them over to nonprofits uh, or to cities that wish to acquire those those uh, hotels or motels rather, and install kitchenettes so that we have a more permanent base for homeless people from which they can operate to seek, for example, uh, training, job training. They have an address. They can um, they they can use their resumes and their place uh, of abode for purposes of education and for seeking a job. The governor signed it. We're pleased. Uh, one of the things that we're working on that's critically important and the city of Santa Ana has been most helpful and that's the census. I cannot overemphasize how important the census is to all of us. Uh, for each person that is not counted, we lose about $1,800. And so with respect to education, health care, transportation, it is critically important, and, and Santa Ana has been a great partner in this effort. I co-chair the Census Committee in Sacramento. Uh, the state of California is devoting $187 million, just the state, to this effort. We are at odds in some ways with the federal government in terms of making sure that everybody gets counted, and so that means that in spite of the fact the federal government's cut its budget for the census by about 50 percent, we have, I think, collectively stepped up to the plate. Um, a couple other things I, I wanted to mention, and that's, uh, that's resources. Uh, one of the most important things that you do and that we do is make sure that we uh, appropriate resources to important parts of our community. Uh, some of you may know that, that uh, part of the budget this year provided for $10 million to the Discovery Cube, uh, that there was $1.7 million to the Diaper Bank of Orange County, of which you were very supportive, as well as a $1 million for the Orange County Housing Trust. Uh, the issue of housing and homelessness is at the top of the governor's agenda, and I know it's at the top of your agenda, and I look forward to working with you to help to uh, mitigate this challenge that, that we all face. Um, SB1, you may recall SB1, SB1 commonly referred to as the gas tax, actually passed before I was in the legislature, but nevertheless, I, I'll take credit for the $8.39 million for local streets and roads funding here, um, and the $16 million going to Solutions for Congested Corridors program. Finally, uh, what I wanted to do was that every year, each member of the State Senate gets to designate one person who has been a champion in the community. Uh, we represent about a million people. As I mentioned a moment ago, nine cities. And this year, uh, the person that, that we selected as our Woman of the Year comes right here, from right here in Santa Ana, in fact, just a few blocks away, and that's Leah Smith. Leah and her husband, Dwight, every night they have about 30 homeless guests that they have in their home, literally their home. They house them, they feed them, they care for them, and they're an example for all of us in the community. They've made it their personal responsibility, and they have dedicated their lives to, to the homeless uh, that are here in, in our community. And so um, what we have is, is we actually have a, a resolution that was, uh, that was, it's a bipartisan rep resolution, as a matter of fact. It's our Woman of the Year resolution for Leah Smith. And so I, I'd ask you to stand with me to congratulate Ms. Smith on this recognition. Thank you. Senator, why don't you come on this side, and we'll all stand next to you, and we'll do oh, a group okay. photo. Great. Let's that, that way we'll literally stand with you.
come up to visit us in Sacramento. And when you are in Sacramento, I hope you use our office as, as a base of operations. And you probably know my legislative director, Ari Ghaffari. Ari is here hiding in the back somewhere. Uh, Aria, and I know you know R Richard Santana. So, if I can be of assistance, please call upon us. That's our job, just like you. Any questions? Uh, or yes, uh, we have Councilmember Vince Sarmiento. Okay. Well, more than questions, I just uh, there are more remarks, and I wanted to congratulate Leah and her and her husband for all the great work that they do. So, congratulations, you made a great selection, Senator. Um, I wanted to thank you for selecting Santa Ana as uh, as the uh, city where you have your district office, because I know you have several cities to choose from, but you decided to be here. It's important, your staff, um, you know, uh, Richard Santana happens to be my commissioner. He's a long time uh, leader here in the city and the president of, of his neighborhood association. So look, he does great things and it's a reflection on the uh, person he works with and the fact that you selected really, really incredible staff. So you've met with us not only on city issues, but you've also met with me personally on some water issues. Um, uh, with the Orange County Water District. So I thank you and your staff for, for really not missing a beat. So it looks like you never left. I mean, I know you were with <laughs> us when you were in the Assembly, but now that you're back in the Senate, it's like, um, you know, we just, you just hit the ground running. There's usually a steep learning curve for folks, but you didn't have that. So we certainly appreciate that. And we certainly appreciate you uh, advocating so strongly for Santa Ana. The Cube was a huge victory for getting those funds for those folks. So thank you for doing everything that you do. and. Um, Welcome. This is your house. Well, thank you, Councilmember Sarmiento. And you have reminded me of one of the most important things I came here to say, and that's a big thank you. Uh, we've recently moved our district office to the train station, Santa Ana. And, and I want to really thank and commend the city for the excellent job that they did um, in taking that place and turning it into a wonderful, wonderful office. Uh, it was done, I believe, under budget and actually early. Uh, which, which is an example days, for all right, of us. That? So uh, followed and, and others did just a, a marvelous job and we are so proud of our new office so I know you'll come and see us there. Thank you for mentioning that and I apologize for forgetting. Other uh, yeah. comments? Councilor Jose Solorio. Yes, uh, Senator, again, uh, thank you for moving the office to, to Santa Ana. I know a few of us attended your open house there and you do have a uh, a fantastic staff. You're doing a good legislation as well as others. We try to remind ourselves to write letters of support on key pieces of legislation, but if you ever think that there are certain letters that we should be doing or you need somebody to testify up there or down here, feel free to, you know, be our staff, you know, you know, call upon us for, for that kind of help. Thank you, Councilman Slaughter. It's almost as though you had experience there. So, right. I'm happy you're up there doing the, the, the good work. Thank you. Well, well, thank you all. Mr. Mayor, thank you all. I look forward well, to Well, let me just reiterate that oh. I think we're very blessed to have you. I know you're working very hard. I know it's not easy. Uh, and just know that we appreciate what you do very, very much, Tom. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. For those uh, that have visited the Starbucks here in downtown and 4th and Broadway, this is Israel Vidal, uh, the store manager there. And I'd like to personally uh, recognize him. Uh, Israel Vidal has been the store manager for the Starbucks located at 4th and Broadway in downtown Santa Ana for the past two years. Prior to his arrival, the store was facing a variety of urban challenges that ultimately resulted in the decrease in customer and employee confidence. Israel began to engage with the community by hosting events such as Coffee with the Cop and by displaying Orange County Educational Arts Academy student art during the Downtown Art Walk. By building relationships with the Santa Ana Police, particularly the Downtown Division, Israel has helped to mitigate safety concerns for the location and create a more welcoming atmosphere. Israel has focused on connecting with the community and responding to their needs. 
Yet he acknowledges the successes of his store could not have been accomplished alone. Instead, Israel is attributed many of the accomplishments at this location to not only the support of his leadership, but also the hard work and loyalty of his team. I want to thank Israel for taking the time to connect with your community and to ensure that this Starbucks location is an appealing place to visit for not only our residents, but to those who visit the city of Santa Ana as well. I just, again, personally like to thank you. I know you guys are, are having a little bit of a struggle right now with the construction, but hopefully, you know, anything that we could offer to help, you know, please reach out to us. And, uh, yeah, I mean, thank you again for, for really holding that store afloat and, and keeping it there and, you know, happy to have you. Thank you. Happy to be here yeah. at service. If you want to say any words or anything. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'll just keep it brief. I, I, I wanted to really thank, thank you, council member, okay. and, uh, and everyone really for giving me the opportunity to, uh, uh, to be here um, and to kind of share in the, in the success, not just of our store, but really in the community. Um, it really can't be possible without the effort of every single person that not only walks through the doors, but our law enforcement that, you know, that continues to, to make that place safe and welcoming. And, and really just everyone that, that wants downtown to be great again, to be beautiful, to be, you know, a place that everyone wants to come back to visit. And like, you know, like council member said, uh, there was some challenges and now Thanks to everyone, really, uh, it's it's a it's more of a destination place. So thank you guys very much. Um, and again, we're uh, also lucky to to have a you know to be expanding in Santa Ana as well. We have a new location opening up in uh, Grand and Fairhaven, brand new store in the city of Santa Ana. Uh, we're going to be doing a friends and family event there, and I would love to invite everyone here uh, to to that event on uh, October 9th from 5 to 7 p.m. I'd love to see all your faces there and really kind of share in, in you know, expanding Santa Ana and uh, bringing coffee to everybody uh, in the city and in the community. So thank you again very much. Thank you for the opportunity and hopefully we can continue to do great things together. Thank you. There's about 50,000 people watching from home, so you just invited. So I hope you have enough space and enough coffee. We will. We will. <laughs> Thank you, and now we have our uh, police chief, Chief Valentin, and he's going to introduce us to a special dog, I believe. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're kind of standing there right next to him, and no, it's a, it's a real canine. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, City Council, City Manager, thank you for the opportunity to um, really introduce uh, the newest member of the Santa Ana Police Department. Everyone knows that we are hiring, um, but this introduction for this new member is special, and I'm going to share a little bit uh, of the reasons why. Um, so, this is a two-year Labrador Retriever named Shadow. And she was born uh, November 27th, 2016 in Thousand Oaks, California. Uh, she was uh, tr in training to be a guide dog uh, from the guide dogs of the desert, um, really to become a seeing eye dog, a companion uh, for someone. Um, and part of the training is that they be attentive 24 seven, really. So with Shadow, what they discovered was that uh, she prefers doing what she's doing right now. And that is, uh, laying around, lounging around, and, and being petted and stroked, and she's looking at me. But the, and so that's really her forte, and so she was repurposed with additional training uh, to become a therapeutic canine. Um, with her tonight is Commander Mike Claiborne, uh, who did extensive research in the industry, specifically with the Riverside County Sheriff's Department, who has a robust program uh, with therapy uh, canines. And so in working closely uh, with them, and really through the very generous uh, donation that we received uh, from one of our partners who supports our canine unit, uh, we were able to receive the, the, um, the therapy uh, dog uh, on uh, September 6th, um, last month. And in that short time, uh, she's been deployed uh, upwards of a half dozen cases. Uh, these are sensitive cases involving 
uh, child abuse, uh, sexual assault victims. And I'll share one uh, particular story in which um, a victim is providing their disclosure of what occurred to them. Um, the victim starts crying, is very upset, and across the, the interview room is Shadow. Shadow sees that, recognizes that, comes over to the victim, um, and just really just kind of cuddles up to that victim. Um, and immediately the tension and the anxiety just down. A very, very, very uh, uh, strong interaction there. Uh, she's had success there. She's also had success in the community. Uh, she's been to a variety of community events uh, just in the, in the short three weeks that we've had her. Um, got an asylum with a cop, uh, the OC grip event uh, downtown. Um, we intend to uh, take her to the um, link shelter and schools. Um, we're accepting requests. She lives at, she lives at our police station 24-7, uh, and there's a long list of people more than willing to take care of her. So I want to commend uh, Commander Mike Claiborne, who did all the research for the program. And uh, she's been a huge success. So this is our new member of the Santa Ana Police Department. Per periodically, you had her, have her come to city council meetings. She's here. There's a lot of important decisions. She's here. She's here for you. Look at this. Yes. I mean, it's already yes. having a common effect, right, <laughs> David? If there's anybody that needs therapy, it's me. I, I sit between <laughs> Cecilia and Jose. I'm kidding. Not a problem. <laughs> this is much better. <laughs> much <was> better. <laughs> that was a joke, guys. Right. So, thank you for the opportunity to introduce her. She's uh, here, ready, and available to, to work and provide support. Next Mike. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's get a picture with a dog. Come on. So, the other thing I might add is... Uh, since we received Shadow, there's been three other municipal police agencies in Orange County that have adopted this model and have acquired a therapy dog. He's bringing her up here. <laughs> we'll just put a little uh, mat behind Councilor Peñaloza. Little, we need some water. Need that dog for the vote. <laughs> you can get her back after the meeting. All right, now we have a presentation by our city manager, I believe. Or please go ahead. Correct. You have the so, floor. I don't have a dog, but I do have a PowerPoint presentation for you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. All right, so honorable mayor and members of the council, we are here before you tonight to recap the efforts our staff have been undertaking to address the homelessness crisis in our city and to share our plans for what more can be done to keep our streets clean and safe. It's no secret that homelessness poses an existential crisis to the operation of our city and the quality of life for our residents. While homelessness is a symptom of many other societal challenges, it undermines and threatens the fabric of cities, especially here in California. California has 12% of the country's population and approximately 22% of the country's homeless population. In 2017, the countywide point-in-time count showed that Santa Ana had 1,000 homeless people in our city. That breakdown was 534 sheltered and 466 unsheltered. In early 2018, the city conducted its own emergency point-in-time count and concluded that the number had increased to over 1,600 in little over a year. You can see the unsheltered population especially exploded. As of early 2019, our numbers have grown again to almost 1,800, but with many more people sheltered than in previous years. 
The challenges of homelessness are many. First is the human toll of suffering for those who find themselves homeless and struggle to get back on their feet but have a desire to do so. Then there are those who suffer from drug addiction and mental illness and inhib- that inhibits their ability to operate as productive members of society or make rational decisions to respond to outreach. There are those that also represent a criminal element and refuse aid due to desire to remain outside of the law or rules of a more formal structure or solution. And while these souls, souls who inhabit the streets and parks of our city are the core of the story, their impact is felt by our community at large. Petty crime increases and trespassing is common. Families feel less secure in their own neighborhoods and find themselves not allowing their children to explore their neighborhoods. Our public safety resources are drained as officers and firefighters are called to deal with issues created by homeless, tying up valuable resources that could otherwise be focused on other high-priority calls. In the past year, 17% of the calls into the Santa Ana Police Department have been in response to homelessness. In the past year, 18% of calls into OCFA, Orange County Fire Authority, have been in response to homelessness. In those instances between Santa Ana Police Department and OCFA, those are valuable public safety resources being directed. For Santa Ana Police Department, in particular, their time, energy, and resources could otherwise be spent on crime prevention. Visually, the blight of homelessness both serves as a constant reminder of the risk and insecurity for our community and tarnishes the very image our residents and visitors have about Santa Ana. Homelessness tears at the faith in our institutions and the public's belief in the government's ability, whether federal, state, or local, to truly solve a challenge. These acts undermine quality of life, damage our resident and visitor experience, and generally do not advance our community. On these issues, our city is taking a stand and forging ahead with a renewed resolution and commitment. Case law, such as Martin v. City of Boise, has made it clear being homelessness is not a crime. Being homeless is not a crime. That particular case ruled prohibition against sleeping in public violates the Eighth Amendment's prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment when the homeless individuals have no access to alternative shelter. The Martin decision confirms that cities cannot enforce camping lodging prohibitions if their local homeless population faces inadequate shelter space. Also, the city enforcing the ordinance must have shelter space available within its own jurisdiction. Municipalities can conduct cleanup of encampments on public property, though. Santa Ana's response to the wave of homelessness that has swept the West Coast has always included a level of compassion. It was with this ethos that drove the speedy opening of the Link Interim Homeless Shelter to provide beds for homeless residents from Santa Ana in just 28 days. It was a symbol to Orange County, if not all major cities, that progress can happen through partnership and a must-do attitude. The council and our community should be proud of what was accomplished with the link and the efforts of private parties and our public works agency to create another option for sheltering our homeless and cleaning up our streets. Yet while the link affirmed our community's value of compassion, it also opened the door for us to apply a standard of raised expectations and responsibility. The link, since it's been open, has taken nearly 250 people off of the street, and it's um, it's also affirmed something that we all know we are frustrated with. Not everybody wants help. Indeed, 47% of unsheltered homeless have a choice to take a shelter, and they refuse. And this is where our community hopes for responsibility, accountability, and raised expectations. Santa Ana is tackling this second great challenge, and in some ways a harder challenge, how to help those who do not want it. I hear from the community and I hear from the council that you are frustrated with what seems to be slow progress. I know the frustration feeds into the pressure on council and therefore the city to do more. We are ready, willing, and trying to do more. We are prepared to innovate around the limits that the law and courts have placed on us. But as public servants and concerned members of public, we should all know the workarounds we face to address this 47% of our unsheltered homeless who may not want our help. And while we can all understand the sentiment that simply being homeless is not a crime, we also know that being drunk in public, high in public, littering and trespassing are crimes. More recently, we have made some progress where homeless people occupied property along the Union Pacific Railroads. 
Through our sweeps and cleanups, we have now made an improvement in an area that had become and continues to be an encampment spot. This work was only possible through legal action taken by our city to seek a warrant to clean up the property. The judge granted the warrant and four others. The city will be billing the railroad over $118,000 for the cleanup efforts as they failed to address the problem on their own land. On May 22, 2019, at approximately 8 a.m., over 50 City of Santa Ana staff, code enforcement, police, public works, parks and rec, community development, as well as private contractors, began large-scale service of the inspection and abatement warrant at five locations within the city. The one-time warrant authorized to enter the private property of Union Pacific to perform inspections and abate dangerous conditions. For example, the warrant that was exercised along the 1200-1300 block of Ed East Edinger discovered 60 encampments occupied by 16 individuals, trash and debris was strewn around the area, staff determined it was imperative for public health and safety to immediately abate the dangerous condition. Public works crews and private contractors began the cleanup efforts. Police officers and representatives from the Orange County Health Care Agency provided outreach to all 16 con contacted individuals experienced homelessness. None accepted services. One individual was arrested for a narcotics violation. We are currently in negotiations with Union Pacific. I'm having my second face-to-face -face meeting with their VP of Risk Management, and we're coming to a letter of understanding, that, and they are going to make improvements and conduct maintenance on their property. So I look forward to telling you more about that. And as another example, Santa Ana worked with Caltrans to bring to light encampments on their properties in overpass areas. It was an eye-opening experience for the district director and one that has now resulted in Caltrans doing the right thing and making daily sweeps of their property to remove the encampments. Santiago Creek is a definite problem area within the city. The city has conducted over 30 cleanup efforts in Santiago Creek in 2019 and removed over 150 encampments. The Quality of Life team was initially formed back in January of 2018, and it was formed to be a two-week pilot program for the city. It was modeled after a best practice approach presented at a police education Executive Research Forum National Conference to address the broad societal homelessness impact. Our quality of life teams are now seasoned veterans and their work at Homeless Encounters have given us key data and insights into the labor input required to address the average homelessness incident. These teams have been the cornerstone of our proactive outreach efforts. It is these constant efforts at contact and service direction that have set a tone in the city that we expect you to help accept help if you're going to be in Santa Ana. If you're a resident or a business owner wishing to report a concern about homelessness such as abandoned property on city right-of-way, you can download the free My Santa Ana application with an iPhone or an Android and report service request. Um, in addition, this month we are going to be launching a brand new My Santa Ana app where there will be an easier way to report issues relative to homelessness. Santa Ana app also has benefits for achieving superior data. Over our Santa, our Santa Ana app provides geocoded data on reports of homelessness incidents and issues. This data provides mapped information with details that are now guiding our targeting efforts to move from response to systematic and routine engagement across our community. There have been a number of ways city staff has gone above and beyond the call of duty when it comes to addressing homelessness. The IT department has created a dedicated homeless services phone line and is recording messages for phone lines that provide information on our homeless services. City staff is assembling and reviewing code complaints and police incident reports for the multi-service center, the MHA multi-service center, and the surrounding neighborhoods in preparation for a letter campaign to the Orange County Board of Supervisors, CEO, and MH Board of Directors. The goal is to call the county and MHA to take actions and take an active role in addressing the community concerns. In December 2018, the Quality of Life team launched Operation Dignity, a seven-day intensive outreach and enforcement effort. Teams worked in two shifts from 4 a.m. to 10 to implement the city's enforcement policies and direct homeless individuals to available shelters and resources. As many as 24 people accepted shelter in one given day. In January 2019, the Quality of Life team launched Operation Safe Passage, another six-day intensive outreach effort. As a result, over 400 homeless individuals throughout the city were contacted, 37 referred to a shelter, of which 32 accepted those services at the link.
The city's quality of life team quickly came together and completed a successful September special projects calendar with six days of cult activity along with the regular Monday through Thursday 9 to 4 operations. The team cleaned over 16 tons of trash and debris and 38 trucks of trash and debris, arrested over 23 individuals for outstanding warrants, over 20 cited for municipal code violations, and five accepted services, two of those to our link. The Public Works Agency Maintenance Services Division has provided major contributions to the city's efforts to mitigate the impacts with the unsheltered population. Over the last year, they've responded to 1,186 service requests for transient debris. The number has increased 1,000% from the year before. They also have handled 11,000 service requests of abandoned property illegal dumping. That's a 43% increase. The status quo is not our standard in Santa Ana. We have unfortunately been on the forefront of homelessness challenges in, the, in our area of Orange County. But a silver lining is that we have gained experience and vision on these matters. In that regard, we are better equipped to address the challenge going forward. Our community is a part of the solution, being the eyes and the ears for the city. But I am also aware, and our employees are very much aware, that there are at least another 1,200 set of eyes that can be constantly scanning the horizon and looking for issues to address so we can bring even more fidelity to our data sets and response time. We have begun emphasizing with all staff that it's not okay to look the other way. The mayor and council have made it perfectly clear to me that addressing homelessness is a top priority for the city and every staff member who serves this community. From Parks and Rec to Public Works, each plays a role in addressing either the underlying social challenge and the results in homelessness or in treating the symptom itself. The cost to address homelessness in Santa Ana goes far beyond just the quality of life team. Police, fire, public works, code enforcement, management, attorney's office, everyone is involved in some way or another. From what we can estimate, in the last fiscal year, this city spent about $16.7 million addressing homelessness. In the current fiscal year, we estimate that we will, that cost that we will spend addressing homelessness will rise to $25.5 million. Police and fire have the largest burdens with almost, eight, with, with almost $18 million alone between them. That's 71% of the homeless-related cost to the city. Between cleanup, code enforcement, homeless services, and park safety, that's another brand new $6.1 million that we anticipate spending this fiscal year. So now what are we going to do moving forward? I am proceeding with a homeless strategic plan that includes a four-step action program with a focus on four key areas, clean, outreach, housing, and communication. So those goals, clean, is intended to reduce the negative impacts to our community, ensuring that our city is safe and clean. The outreach is geared at being persistent in our contact with anyone that has experienced homelessness. And housing is to reduce the number of unsheltered. And when I say housing, I mean all forms of housing from shelters to permanent, supportive, to affordable. And communication is something that I don't think we've done a very good job on in communicating what our efforts have been in the past. And so that is an area that we're going to focus on so that we can have engaged and informed community regarding our homelessness and homeless solutions. So walking through each one of those, to starting with clean, Santa Ana has had a large concentration of Orange County homeless house within the yards, house within yards of where we sit today. Recall that it was only 18 months ago when roughly 200 people occupied the Plaza of the Flags, and we were having to continuously enter the encampment to clean up feces, urine, and reduce public health risk, while also trying to protect those in the encampment from others who wanted to prey upon them. The city systematically and compassionately worked with each occupant of that encampment to redirect them to services or to find another venue to occupy, but eventually we reclaimed our civic space for all of Santa Ana. Under the broken windows theory, blight inspires more blight, but clean streets inspire sustained streets. We have a big effort to get there, but we need to push hard on the cleanup. No matter how you enter the city or what neighborhood you walk or are sidewalks, our sidewalks need to be free of litter, free of feces, free of remnants from homeless encampments. It's an achievable standard and one whose pursuit will elevate our overall expectations for our city. So the short-term actions that we're taking to achieve this goal include changing the chain of command for Colt, increasing the presence of Colt during dusk and dawn and Saturdays. We're supplementing the Colt team with contracted Colt team members, so bringing contractors on 
to provide 24-7 assistance. We're going to implement a 48-hour turnaround on service request. We are um, already procuring supplemental services for the public works maintenance. So in addition to our maintenance workers being called out to clean up debris, we will have contractors on call to clean up debris. We're also going to procure supplemental service for the retrieval and storage of belongings. We're going to increase patrols of, of the hotspot areas, and city staffers will increase the reporting of the homeless impacts through our Don't Look Away. And then one item before you tonight will certainly help address one of the problems in this area, and that is the oversized vehicle ordinance that's before your consideration tonight. Longer term, uh, actions that we'd like to advance to is implementing a 36-hour turnaround on the service request. We want to implement physical changes to facilities to increase the ease of rubbish removal or the ability to patrol. We want to review other existing city ordinances to identify possible areas where we can improve enforcement. We want to take a hard look at recycling centers for compliance. We want to increase code enforcement efforts on private properties, including those vacant and abandoned. And we want to mitigate hospital drop-offs in the city of Santa Ana and work to create equal distribution of crisis stabilization programs. The second step was outreach. And this is where we're looking to double down on our outreach efforts. We've modified our approach to be a hybrid of staff and contractors to address homeless-related issues and general maintenance in the city. As of yesterday, the city staff has duplicated our single cult team into two cult teams, one working east of Bristol and one working west of Bristol. These two cult teams are further augmented by two new contractors with maintenance crews to scan the city to ensure a more proactive response to service requests while backfilling the public works crews that are a part of the cult team. Not only have we expanded the number of teams, we have also expanded the hours of service to include night and weekend coverage seven days a week. The short-term actions are to address the needs of the unsheltered homeless population, procure supplemental outreach workers, uh, which we've already done an RFP and we should have a contract on board before the end of the month, augment hours of outreach to include dust dawn and Saturdays, collaborate with the county's COC HEAP-funded city net agency to assist in stranded homeless population, longer-term outreach or longer-term actions include coordinating outreach operations with city staff, partners, and service providers in public spaces. Balance the needs and rights of individuals experiencing homelessness and the larger community through updated fair legal and enforceable policies and ordinances. The mission to sustain contact with our homeless population and make it clear that our standard in Santa Ana is that you will accept services. The third area is housing. Housing continues to be a top priority. We have nearly 1,600 units of affordable housing in our city, with an additional 857 affordable housing units in the pipeline. Santa Ana is part of only 3% of the jurisdictions in California that are on pace to meet the arena goals this cycle. This work needs to focus on the spectrum of housing, but temporary shelter and navigation centers are perfectly acceptable pollution as we push forward for a higher standard across our city. Short-term actions include expanding the pathway to affordable housing opportunities, develop eviction prevention programs, utilize our ESG funds for those currently or at risk of becoming homeless, and longer-term actions include establishment of a permanent shelter, support efforts for countywide increase in the mental health services and addiction services, increase permanent supportive housing pipelines throughout the county, and prioritize Santa Ana homeless develop landlord incentive programs and increase markability of housing vouchers, strategize regional equality of affordable housing throughout the Orange County Housing Finance Trust. Lastly, we need to communicate. The city's success with the link made headlines and graced the cover of Western City Magazine, but our other efforts warrant the public's awareness for a simple reason, progress promotes more progress. Short-term actions before November 1st include develop educational materials to promote health and safety, develop a homeless resource kit, distribute kits to businesses and residents and other interested parties, provide cult ride-alongs, increase responses to reporting parties, distribute a community needs survey, and upgrade our homeless-related web pages. Long-term action, so this after November 1st, improve our best practices with existing stakeholders addressing homelessness throughout the county, use our technology to distribute real-time cult data, 
increase homeless presentations to Santa Ana's neighborhood associations, increasing knowledge of homeless solutions and supportive tools through public awareness campaigns. Addressing our challenges in Santa Ana is not just a city job, it's a community job. Our community has a history of taking on big issues and making progress, and tackling homelessness will be one of the biggest. Yet homelessness is so pervasive throughout our community that we share a common interest in, adjust, in addressing this challenge. Showing each neighborhood how they are making progress and how to contribute to the future of our city will be a force multiplier on our efforts. Action steps under this four-point strategic plan have already begun, and I look forward to implementing all of our goals under your leadership. And that concludes my presentation, and if you have any questions, I'm available as well as all of the departments that lend a helping hand to addressing homelessness in our city. Thank you for that. Uh, comments, questions. We're giving the dog back, by the way. We're going to keep it longer until we all settle down. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, go ahead. Now I know why it's therapeutic, because I paid no attention to anything Christine said. <laughs> I'm kidding. How, but how I do did. you feel? It felt awesome. I was <laughs> He's very happy, Christine. We'll She's smiling, so maybe this is good. All right, uh, thoughts, comments, Ceci Iglesias, go ahead. I have questions for you, the city manager. Okay, how many individuals are part of the cult team? So can you put up the org chart? So on the org chart, the cult team operates, there you go, so you have it in front of you, yeah, under the me. CDA executive director, so you have a portion of him. Our homeless service manager is 100% dedicated to it. You okay. have a sanitation inspector that works on it. And then down below, the blue represents what we currently had, and the yellow and the red is what we're adding on. So originally, we always had a full-time heart officer, two assigned police officers, two social workers, two public work staff, and a park and rep staff. That made up what we refer to as the cult team. So you can see on the org chart in red, we're duplicating that exact effort. And in the middle, the yellow, those are the contractors that we are adding to supplement them. So if you count the individuals, we've doubled the number of cult members, and then we've supplemented it with contractors. Yes, but how many members? Because I don't have that presentation with me, so... Oh, it's it should be on, it's on your screen in front of you. Oh, I can't see oh. it. <laughs> okay, Sorry. so let me count for you. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and we doubled it to 16 mm -hmm. of assigned cult members. And then in addition to that, we have contractors, and then you also have your homeless services manager. So 16, 17, 18 people. So 18 people are right now with working on the cult team. Cult are overseeing it. Okay, so how many, um, how much money are we, are we allocating? For cult, um, the cult it's spread up among departments, so I don't have exact figure. But I, for the current fiscal year, we're anticipating spending twenty five around twenty five million dollars on homeless, and I can tell you where it's coming from. Okay. It would be ten million from police responses, seven point six from fire responses on cleanup and code enforcement. It's around one point four million. The park safety, that includes the newly deployed security officers, that cost is around 700000 And then our homeless services is about $4 million. And management and legal, about one point two. That's where we're getting to the $25 million. Okay. So um, as we know that many of these homeless are not our homeless here in Santa Ana. They don't have any roots in Santa Ana. So like the $25 million that you said that we're spending of um, Santa Ana resources and Santa Ana revenue, how, mu how much of that can we uh, demand from the county to reimburse us? Because a lot of these individuals are not part of our community. They just are coming in, just like you were saying, 47% refuse help. So the 47%, if you were saying, okay, those 40% would leave, that would be 12.5 million that we would say technically we were putting into numbers. I know it doesn't, it's not quite that easy, but it's something that I feel that we have been 
taken advantage of as a city from the county and I, I think it's time for us to step up and so how much money can we ask for us to be reimbursed from other agencies? You, it's not easy to identify, as you mentioned, the 25 relative to what those individuals that we serve that have nexus versus the police and fire calls that we're just serving a homeless that happen to be within the city's jurisdiction. I will say that for a link shelter to seek shelter and then be offered shelter, and that they have to, homeless have to have a nexus to Santa Ana. So I can't really give you a breakdown in the other cost. Um, it would be something that you would probably have to litigate if you attempted to receive recovery of any of our other charges for well, providing services. Well, is that something services. that we can consider? Well, you currently right now have a cross-complaint filed against the County of Orange. Okay. So I, I, for me, I think it's something that's important that we should be addressing because it's time that we as a city stand up and say no more. Um, also, how will you achieve the clean goal? The clean goal? Okay. So partly it's going to be getting reported the debris and encampments throughout the city quicker and then having the resources to respond faster to clean it up as opposed to sometimes now there's, there's a lag between when something gets reported and something gets cleaned up. We're always going to have the challenges associated with private property because we can't go on to private property to clean that up. So our tool in that regard is code enforcement. And that's one of the things that the new app is going to address because it will have um, pull-down menus to report debris on public property or debris on private property because it's a different approach to how we address it. So I mentioned in the presentation under that category of clean, the short-term steps that we're going and the long-term steps. I can certainly give you a, a, a copy of the detail. I don't know if you want me to read them again. Yeah, because my concern comes in where, okay, I see the public um, space, which is, even though when I call it in, it doesn't get cleaned up. So what gives me as a council member hope that they are going to be cleaning it up? For example, I, I sent in an email for them, um, for our staff to clean up from on, on First Street from, from Standard to Grand, you know, and th that section. They, they um, you know, Angie, who is our, my assistant, she, she sent out an email on, on behalf of the council member to have it cleaned up it seemed like they only picked up a little bit. And then it's like I passed through there the next day. And it's like it's the same trash that was there. And, you know, our staff had said that they had already cleaned it up. So, and then, so I had to make two calls in order for them to clean it up completely. So I asked for pictures of before and after. But this is something that I feel that we should, as a, um, as a community, we need, to be, we need to be more receptive and also be more aware of what our community is seeing, you know, that that it, it, this is only like what's in our view, but imagine what's not in our view, which is our, the things with our, and I know you only have five minutes. Um, so the, the, um, the what, what we can't see like in the alleys, what we can't see like in the um, train, train tracks, that is something that I know we, we hide behind the fact that saying that's not our property, it's private property, but to the community, it doesn't matter, it's in Santa Ana. So what are we going to do according to your plan to address this that we know when we call something, we see something that it gets done right away? Well, we've added substantially more resources. So before, if you called in debris on a sidewalk, we did not have available staff to go out there and address it immediately. We now have 24-7 on-call contractors that are not only responding to requests, they're out patrolling the city. So that is going to greatly increase the response time in that area. In regards to private versus public property, I mean, we have to follow the law the way that it is written, um, so I'm not quite sure how I can address that we change our approach to private property because we do have to do our work in the limit, within the limitations yeah, of the law. Yeah, but it's no trespassing. How can, I mean, it, the law is a lie. There's no trespassing, so can we do that? I mean, can we enforce a no trespassing? The we, 602, I know that, we know we've talked about this, this form, we have, the 602. We have, and the police department on their website has a vehicle for a business yeah. who wants to fill out a form and give authorization because the only person that can charge no trespassing is the owner of the property, and they have a means for an owner to do that. If you're referring to the uh, Union Pacific Railroad tracks, we have not accepted their request to prosecute no, or charge no trespassing because I don't have a large enough police force to patrol the miles of the Pacific.
specific railroad yeah, but tracks. if we start, and I, and I know we start somewhere, Christine, we, should, we shouldn't be saying it's the Union Pacific. I think it's something that we should be saying as a city. We have to do this. If we see it, let's do it. Get them out. If you say, we've spent enough money on, on, on police officers, that I think it's something that we're, it's owed to our community. Okay, and you don't have to start the clock. I'm done. That was for the next speaker. I'm Just had a David Peñalosa. Question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Madam City Manager, with the, in regards to the amount of money spent in fire OCFA, in regards to homeless um, situations, for the seven, the six, was it 7.6 .6 million? It, yes, for 2019 it was 7.661828, and that's basically taking 18% of our contract cost. That, that's what I was going to ask. Now, is this an additional added cost on top of what we already pay OCFA annually? Is Are they coming back and saying, hey, this is how much we... No, it's, we you, you're paying $42.5 million to provide your fire protection services in the city, and 18% of those are being diverted to, towards addressing homelessness. So it's 18% of the contract price. Okay, so 18% of those costs and the work that they're, the service that they're doing to, in the city is related to homes. Correct. So it's not an, uh, an added, or I guess it is, it's still a cost, but I'm just saying it's not an extra cost on top of the No, the we, we don't pay it above the contractual obligation. Okay, thank you. That's all I wanted to know. Any other comments? Jose Solorio, please. Equal time. <laughs> yeah, start at <laughs> noon. He gets a new five. <laughs> I'll, try, I'll try to be uh, quick, because I know there'll be a follow-up. Uh, First, I do want to thank uh, the staff for all the help with the cleanups at Santiago Creek. Unfortunately, they really aren't enough. I think as you know, we're hearing, unless you are out there every day, uh, it's tough. So I know we've been working with Caltrans and others on maybe closing those areas off, and uh, let's continue to, to do that with hopefully some success. On the MH, MHA facility on South Main, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear about the report and call for letters. But I think the council really was looking more for a legal uh, action through an abatement, a, a nuisance abatement process. And so the new effort hopefully is complementary, not instead of. Um, we heard mention of a new, a new phone number that individuals can use to call in homeless issues. I don't know. I'm aware of what that is. So maybe you can now or, or, or separately mention you want me to mention that the actual number? Briefing. <laughs> yeah, or where it is, or when it's going to go live, or how we ought to present that to the public. You could share that with us separately, but I, I, oh. I, I, I know we've talked about it in the past, but it uh, looks like it's coming online. Uh, on the quality of life team, it's a good start, but as, as you've heard from me from day one when you started, it needs to be increases by a factor of times five or times ten. That's how great uh, the issue is out there. Uh, also happy to see that you added uh, review of recycling centers and, met and metal shops because there are uh, issues there that uh, continue the issues of uh, uh, theft of metals. Um, things I don't see, that doesn't mean that the city isn't focusing on there or that you aren't focusing on, but I'll, I'll quickly mention some other things that I still like to keep on the radar because they're on the radar. Number one, uh, external issues, regional ones. Uh, for example, uh, the new facility that this, that Quirk Silva's office and the governor is interested in at Costa Mesa, Fairview. the Fairview Developmental Center. We should keep pushing for that because that'll be good beds overall on mental health. Uh, with Irvine, there's land cited over there with the purpose of you know homeless shelter, and you know we're still pushing for something there or instead of. Um, we also have uh, the courtyard. Uh, we know that there are issues there, and I know some of the uh, litigants uh, have issues with uh, ADA and other issues there, so it does need to close down and be moved somewhere else. We need a good replacement for the link. Um, we need, uh, with the United Way, uh, they have a program where they're trying to get individual apartments to uh, take more Section 8 vouchers or other things. I think it's a fine program, but it ought to be countywide so that it's not just, uh, you know, more individuals with needs uh, in, in, in our city. Uh, on enforcement dollars, we really haven't been forceful enough with the county asking them to either help uh, enforcement, like along creeks, channels, county properties, or they can reimburse us for our uh, very big dollar amounts. 
um, with the state and we had our senator here. Uh, we are always looking for more, more resources. There's also, we're, many of us are well aware of the jail release issues and he, because of his law enforcement background, may be a good ally in that. Um, drug treatment and homeward bound programs, I know we had discussed that as well, particularly on the drug treatment. And I know that a recent idea came up with the cannabis fund that we have even including for youth. Let's do drug treatment uh, uh, work. And then finally, because I know my, my time is up, um, so, some, some of these items uh, you know, for our next budget committee, uh, we I think have a responsibility as council members also to help you find more resources. And I know I and my colleagues are committed to do that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Vince Sarmiento. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And so I wanted to start by saying, um, I appreciate the update. I think more it's for the benefit of the public because a lot of us have obviously been privy to a lot of this information. And we know this is the issue that's polling um, as the number one issue in the city. So it's overtaken crime. It's overtaken other issues. So we know that this is a certain, this is a pervasive issue that's been with us for a while. So my fatigue level, I guess, is a little bit higher than some of my colleagues because I've been dealing with this for a while. And I've known that the... Um, irresponsibility of our friends across the street at the board has led to this problem. They're the vested agency that's supposed to be addressing this. And we tried to work out a legislative um, response and solution to this. And I know we uh, finally had to go down the judicial path and file a suit against them. Um, so I do think that the discussion about reimbursement is relevant. I think, you know, we, we understand that monies have been expended from, from our general fund for purposes of abating and mitigating the impacts of the homeless when it really rightfully should have been borne by the county. So that is what I think frustrates me. Um, and, you know, I know we wanted to play nice and, and, and think that they were going to be receptive and responsive, but they just haven't been, and especially our supervisor that represents this district. They receive money from the Housing and Urban Development Department annually for matters like this. They're, they're, the, they're the safety net agency that um, is supposed to be addressing this, not just with homelessness, but with mental health and any other social service um, impacts. So it really, um, it really is frustrating at this point because I know that we were heartened when Judge Carter took on this case and then uh, the Jones case was handed down. Um, and we thought, well, now we can, you know, we can address this problem solved. We go ahead and, you know, open up a shelter and we can house people and we can um, you know, not have the anti-camping um, uh, issue prevent us from, you know, picking up and cleaning up some of the folks and really placing folks where they need to be because it's not a matter of just locking folks up. It's a matter of providing them the services that they require. Uh, so I think that um, we're not using our advocacy well. And that's one of the things I think that we should be looking at. Our friends at the county are not our friends. They see this as, look, they're perfectly fine um, not placing any shelters or doing anything in the Southern Spa or any of the southern, uh, South County cities. They're certainly fine putting um, shelters here in our city and other services here. And we've had cities in Central County step up and try to do their fair share, but we've been disproportionately impacted for years. So to the extent that we bypass the county, go straight to the state, work with our legislative advocates and see if we can find a solution that the legislature can hand down, um, you know, I think at, at that point it's that extreme because I think there is a, a complete abrogation by, um, by, by the county. They bust in tons of folks from Irvine and they listen to those residents saying, don't put them in our community but leave them in Santa Ana. That's in essence what happened. And so... Um, our kids are no less valuable, no less important, um, no less sensitive to the impacts that the homeless have on them than folks in South County and in Irvine. And I think somebody spoke to the 100 acres that was available um, in, in the city of Irvine, and they completely, completely just laughed in our face. And so they listened to them. They didn't listen to us. So to the extent that we have to find a way and a path to have them listen to us better, um, I think that's really the only way that we can be uh, more aggressive. But I certainly appreciate what's, what you're doing and what the staff is doing because we are almost fighting this issue with one hand tied behind our back. So, um, so let's continue um, doing what we're doing, but let's see what we can do to circumvent what the county has been preventing us. And thinking about our you know, congressional representative, I see as you know, staff person here, 
Senator Umberg was here. We need to call Assemblyman Daly and let them understand, and they know this, but more acutely, why we need specific um, help, right? And um, and that's, I think, where we are at this stage. So, um, but thank you for the update. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to thank the City Manager for your um, presentation. I know I spoke a lot last uh, meeting regarding this issue, and I'm anxious to see how much of an impact the new plan is going to make, and we will adjust accordingly. We have to increase. Thank you. Thank you. I want to um, echo many comments that have been made here, but in particular tell folks that you know, the last few months I've just decided, I don't know why, but I'm driving around and I just stop. I go and I talk to homeless folks. Maybe it's uh, all this court stuff with Judge Carter or just getting frustrated and saying, what can we do differently? Um, and one thing I've found is that some want help and they'll accept help. Others do not. But those that do want help, they, they you know, go over the link or they go to Wise Plays, they do different things, and they, they try to keep moving on. Something I didn't realize until more recently is like this weekend I was behind Ace Hardware, and there was uh, an African-American woman, you know, sleeping on the concrete. And I said, you know, do you need help? And she said, yes. I said, how about if, you know, we go to a shelter, et cetera, et cetera. And then I said, I'll get you a unit. And a police officer was driving by, saw me, so he pulled in. We started talking, and then, you know, she immediately grew hostile because she said, I don't want to be arrested. If you're going to put me in a black and white, you're going to arrest me. And it's, no, 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 we're not. I'm the mayor, and, and I'm trying to get you help. <laughs> and she's looking at me like, I, you know, you must be pulling my leg. The marriage is going to stop. And I said, yeah, we're, we're trying to, you know, help clean up the city. We're trying to help people. We don't want you sleeping here on the street. And so ultimately what happened was I made a deal with her that I was going to, because this was on Sunday, so I said Monday at 10 a.m. An, an unmarked unit is going to be here to pick you up, take you over the link. Well, it turns out because we continue to follow her that day that she called her mom from L.A. Her mom came, picked her up. She, don't know where she lives, but she's now in L.A. Uh, with her family. And part of the lesson learned is that the more we intervene, the more we track, the more we try to find out what's going on, who these people are, you know, can we help? Sometimes, you know, good things happen that you didn't even have planned. But I really want to thank the city manager because I think this plan can really make a difference, especially if we have unmarked units, we have workers that are going out, talking to people, because it takes a lot of talking. You can't just, you know, show up and in five minutes you're done with everything. It just doesn't work that way. So I think this is the number one issue in the, in, in the city and beyond. We need a, just a very, very uh, solidly on this and understand that it's more than homeless. It impacts property values. It hurts people's lives. It, it, it robs of all of us because of the, what it does to humanity and, and, and the conflicts that arise. And then, of course, I think in certain cases it's related to a lot of crime. You know, you know, they can go, they can steal things, they can take them to the recycling center, exchange it for money, use the money for drugs, and, you know, we're in a negative cycle where we're all, you know, part of the victims and part of the very, very bad situation. With that, my light is red, so I'm going to not have folks start telling me that the light is red, and let's just go on to the next, uh, next item. So, Madam uh, City Manager, any conclusion or any thoughts? Uh, no. Thank you so much for your input, and I will build those into our short-term and longer-term goals, and then also make sure that we post a copy of the entire four-point strategic plan so you can further refine it and direct us as you see fit. Thank you. And may you come back with a report at some point, not so much for the council, but for the community at large that watches TV and or comes here to the audience and kind of want to know how we're doing. Of course, we're really not going to know how we're doing when we see our streets in better conditions because, uh, you know, there's just a lot of homeless out there still. So with that, uh, let's go on to our next item. I think now we start our meeting, I mean our regular meeting.
Okay, um, first let me ask the city attorney, is there anything to report out of closed session? Mayor, we had several closed session items, but there was no reportable action this evening. Okay, so with that, we have one speaker on consent, Chris Schmidt, 25H, why don't you come and speak to that? And then, um, and then I'll ask the council if they want to pull any items and we'll proceed. Please go ahead. Good evening, Mayor and uh, City Council members. I'm talking about agenda item 25H regarding the settlement agreement with the Orange County Catholic Workers. I was reviewing the uh, verbiage, the language of that agenda item, and the actual settlement agreement court document. And I had some concerns because words are important, especially when it comes to legal documents. Um, it's 25H, right? Correct. Yes. H. So in reading the agenda item and the staff report, I was so, thought some words were kind of vague, like there is no definition of a low barrier shelter. I don't believe there's any acceptable low definition of it. I've looked for it. There is no accepted definition. We were under the impression we were going to get a shelter similar to Bridges or the Link. We had to be referred, background checks, you couldn't be on drugs or alcohol, things like that. So we're a little bit concerned that how it's going to be operated. Uh, so again, the wording is a little strange. The staff report says there's no financial cost, but you guys just spent several minutes talking about the homeless plan and how much the Colt team cost, OCFA, SAPD, responding to calls for service. The link wasn't free. It cost us several million dollars. The new shelter will cost us seven million, several million dollars. Who's paying for it? We the residents. So I don't agree that it says no financial impact because we the residents are paying for it. <clears throat> Lastly, when I look at the actual court document, it's signed September 23rd by the city staff and the city manager. So why are we discussing this now? It seems like you robbed the residents of their opportunity to discuss this. You might have discussed it back in closed session, but there was no reportable actions. And now we're told, oh, you're going to get it, and guess what? We already signed it. So why are you discussing this now, a week and a half after she already signed it and Judge Carter's agreed to it? I don't agree with this. This is wrong. You keep doing this. You did this with the Yale Street and Central location. You signed an MOU with the county. A month later, you told them, go by Yale Street. You keep hiding this stuff from us, and that's why nobody trusts the city. Again, why are you discussing an item that she signed on September 23rd? I don't think that's fair. Thank you. Do you want to address that real briefly, Ms. Um, city certainly. Manager? Certainly. I'd be honored to. So low barrier, he's right. There isn't a definition of it. But in our settlement agreement, you will see the term low barrier used for the one that we have to provide. You will also see in your staff report when you opened up the link, the same term was used. So our replacement shelter is intended to be identically operated just like the link. They both have been referred to as low barrier. In regards to fiscal impact, I do think it probably is a little bit confusing, but the staff report was for the settlement agreement, and there isn't any fiscal impact that we have to pay the attorneys of the Catholic worker but that probably could have been explained a little bit better um, it's signed already but it's not an effective agreement so if you read the order of the court and if you read the full settlement you would see that we reached it at a status conference and we have a stay on it until I, I believe we had seven days to bring it back to the City Council to be discussed and ratified it also has another contingency in it that unless we reach an agreement a settlement agreement with the County of Orange through our cross complaint, the section three in the settlement agreement, which puts the obligation on us to have that other the shelter for 200 to 250 beds, doesn't go into effect. Thank you. Thank you for that. Let me now bring it back to council, uh, the consent calendar. Uh, I would just note that uh, item 10C uh, is being uh, pulled uh, at staff request, so that's not before us at this time. And any other items? Councilor Jose Solario? Yes, uh, item 19C, and just with a comment in 25F and G with a question. All right. Um, any sorry. others? Councilmember uh, 20, 22A and 25A. What do you want to do with those? Pull them? Pull them, yes. Okay. Are you getting all this, Madam Clerk? 
Counselor Ceci Iglesias, what do you not want to pull? I know, right? Yeah. Well, they... They've, they already beat you to it? No, actually, they said different than when I did, so we're going to have ahead. a lot of discussion. So um, other than 19C, I want to pull 25A, 25B, 25H, and 25C. Any items to my right? Boy, if the left could be like the right. <laughs> so with that, uh, let's ta entertain a motion on the balance. I'll move it. Second. Those in favor, please press green. Jose, that's one on the right. He's got double buttons. He can vote twice. <laughs> All right. So now, which is the first time? Was it 19C? Madam Clerk? That is correct. All right. Who had 19C? Go ahead, Sol Councilman Solario. I did. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I had asked uh, my colleagues and staff to look at the issue of parking in our city because I really believe we need a citywide parking needs assessment and management plan. Uh, and there were leaner dollars back then, and uh, the public works staff took it upon themselves to have an in-house team of engineers and staff uh, look at a couple areas in our city to see what the uh, overcrowding on the streets might be, uh, some challenges, some possibilities, and uh, today as a receiving file, and so it's on the public agenda, uh, we have a, a PowerPoint with their work and findings, and I think there is uh, some promise uh, there, and so maybe through uh, our budget committee or elsewhere we, we shall follow more on this, but uh, a big finding in it is something that I was recently thinking about is there might be some areas of town where if we can find enough local neighborhood consensus, there are some parts of our streets that we can open up for on-street parking, uh, as well as we have some strip malls in the evenings, as well as schools or city community centers that in the evening they're you know closed off, and maybe there are some shared parking and security arrangements that we can um, we can do to op open those up because some areas are are very constrained. Uh, for this pilot study, they looked at, it, at an area in, in northeast Santa Ana, as well as the east side neighborhood. Uh, so I just wanted to say uh, I'm thankful for that and that we will uh, have additional meetings to really get into that and figure out how we uh, do some next steps on that. Councilman Vince Sarmiento. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was, yeah, I was just going to say the same thing the council member said. I know when we discussed this before, we had talked about any future joint use agreements with the school district could incorporate the use of the um, of the surface street lots that they have, at least in the evening, um, and that might alleviate some of those impacted neighborhoods. And so uh, we have a lot of different reciprocal understandings in those joint use agreements. Maybe this is one that we start considering incorporating into those. Thanks. Thank you for that comment. Uh, Councilor Iglesias, please. So on, on Thursday, I attended the Comlink meeting, and permit parking was the topic of conversation. And one of the, there were many issues and concerns that were brought up, but one of the, the things that really resonated in individuals wanting was um, there's a lot of neighborhoods that are impacted by uh, you know, high density apartments that are parking in the areas of the neighborhoods, and and not only that, but also cars that don't belong to either the the residents of the high density apartments or you know in other in our in other areas. So um, I was wondering if there's a way for us to do some type of. I would say like a study and also maybe a collaboration with Comlink because I believe Comlink is the, um, I would say the organization within the city that has a better understanding of each um, different neighborhood. And, and they're able to tell us where exactly we have these pockets of areas that are affected by, you know, over parking in, 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 in our neighborhoods. So, you know, is there an opportunity for us to maybe have um, them to be maybe like an advisory to, to the city council when, and our staff when it comes to looking at, at plans that, that come before us, you know, regarding parking? 
Um, I, I know that um, paying for it is, for some, is something that it's not affordable, but I, I know we talked about it last time that we could, as a city, somehow subsidize for those that can't afford it. Because my concern is if we even we went with, you know, having, I guess, understandings or MOUs with private partnerships or maybe with the school district, is it'll open it up to whoever. It, it, how are we going to manage that? So there has to be a mechanism of management that to ensure that the people that are using those are really residents of our city. If not, we're opening it up again to anybody can come and park in. How, how are you going to control for that? So if we do something like that, I would encourage for us to have the conversation to, to have Comlink to be the um, organization that's going to help us with this plan throughout the city when it comes to um, permit parking and other parking issues that we have. Thank you. Yes, Council Member. Peñalosa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to thank staff as well for this uh, study. I know that, that uh, William and I, along with some other members of uh, staff from Public Works, were at a Wilshire Square Neighborhood Association meeting over this specific issue uh, in regards to permit parking over the summer. And uh, I mean, I was, there was over 100 people there from the Wilshire Square Neighborhood uh, at, uh, at somebody's home. And uh, there was a lot of concerns with the process and the way it's done uh, along the lines of, you know, you know this is, we all know this is a renter city. A, a huge part of this city are, are renting uh, in homes. And there was an issue because a lot of those various renters do want to have permit parking in that neighborhood. But because of the, the, the way our ordinance is written and rules uh, pertaining to parking permits, we need the, the majority of homeowners, actual homeowners, to sign the petition in order to become permit parking. And part of the, the concern from the Wilshire Square neighborhood was that you know you have people that have been renting, that have been living at these homes for 10, 15 plus years, that you know, you know, the homeowner lives on the East Coast or you know in other parts of the country and they they can't get a hold of them it's by the timeline given so there's a lot of um open ends to this policy that we need to look at and and address and look into deeper there wasn't anything in this report about the the way that permit parking is is done um which is important that we look at and in regards to uh, an advisory group um although the comlink people are a great Organization, I think you know they're a very small group in a very large city, and we should include multiple people from different entities, not just the one organization. Um, and those are just my thoughts. Thank you. Uh, any additional thoughts? One thought, Councilmember Iglesias. Just, just to piggyback on what on Councilmember Peñalosa said about the you know having the majority approve of of the I guess of the homeowners to approve if they're going to have permit parking or not. I know that Tate was there and what he mentioned was, is there a way that the city, because I think right now it's like 66% for them to to approve it, is there a way that we can lower the threshold so this way we could have more, and, and more of an opportunity for us to pass something like that at the city level or, you know, at, at the neighborhoods, because I know they get close sometimes, but they can never pass that 66% threshold. So is that something that we could look at? It would be. And on the, the comments regarding the permit parking, the city did recently streamline substantially the length of time that it does take a neighborhood to seek that process. But it's our process, so we can establish the, the thresholds. So when, so when are we going to start those conversations as uh, council members? And so we, can, so we can give you more input. Okay. Um, well, today it was just a receive and file. There actually was a PowerPoint presentation. I'm not... I think you guys have already said all your comments on it, um, so I guess we can skip that. But our next steps would be taking that report where we did our study and we identified the parking deficient areas. We put together some recommendations that would be returning back to you with the solutions that we think we should move forward with and also engaging, obviously, the communities that are impacted, which include not only residential but commercial businesses as well. And, and, and just to add to that, um, with the signatures, the 66% that's required. I know that some of the concerns that were also brought up in, in uh, this neighborhood meeting was that 
uh, there was one street that only had, it was a little cul-de-sac, it only had three homes, and they needed 66% of the, of the homes. So it was easy, and all three of them signed, they got 100%. But then when you went over to the other uh, streets that go uh, north, and, north and south um, in, in that particular neighborhood, you know, you're talking 100 homes between the two, so it was very difficult to get those 67, 70 homes to sign, especially when you're talking about homeowners, so that's a great point, and uh, we could just look at that as well. All right, so pleasure of the council on this item? So just move on. That's move to comment. receive and file. Okay. Any opposition? We'll just receive and file. Okay, next uh, item, Madam Clerk. 22A. Who had that one? I did, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead, please. Uh, 22A was approve a purchase order to courtesy Chevrolet Center for three vehicles for an amount not to exceed $82,000 to be funded by the general fund. My reason for pulling this, and, and we briefly discussed it, Madam City Manager, uh, was courtesy Chevrolet is in San Diego, and I know there was a, a, a bidding process that you went through, uh, and they... Uh, came in the highest uh, in regard to the pointing system, the point system. Um, but I was looking at the, at the staff report and, you know, the vehicle purchase price for, I, I just need more information on how we go about purchasing items like this because the vehicle purchase price, uh, for example, for one of them from courtesy Chevrolet in San Diego was $26,363 and guarantee Chevrolet in Santa Ana was $26,450. That's $80 more. Um, is, is, I don't know the, the, the legal process, but is there a way where we reach back to the local business and say, hey, you know, if you knock down your price by 80 bucks, we could, you, I mean, I don't know if that's legal or not. I'm just trying to understand because I would rather have, give that business to a local business owner in Santa Ana and, um, and I'm just thinking, courtesy Chevrolet in San Diego, what is the, what the, the process? Do we send a staffer down the five freeway to get it? Do they deliver? Do they, because I'm also thinking of any extra cost of getting the vehicle here, uh, if that adds to the cost at all or not. So if you could just answer those questions, Madam um, Manager, Certainly. Please. So this is, it's a low bid. So for a good, unlike a complex service where it's an RFP and there's like a point rating system for just outright purchase of goods, we're obligated to go with the low bid. We do give a preference to uh, businesses that are located in Santa Ana. So if you look at the staff report for the column of the prices of Guarantee Chevrolet, that already takes into factor a 1% local preference for that vendor. So the price has been lowered by 1% on that, those prices. So the price differential in reality is a little bit higher than the small amount that you you pointed out because we do provide a 1% local vendor preference for businesses in Santa Ana. I do not know the method in which we, uh, we pick up the vehicles, so I would defer to either Public Works or our Finance Director purchasing to answer that question. Does anybody know how we get the cars? I'll have to follow up with you on that okay. answer. Okay, because I, I was just thinking, you know, if that isn't included in the initial cost of the vehicle and there you have uh, a staff member whether it's public works or parks and rec or whoever you know having to go down there and get there it would be cost you yes. have staff time you have liability you have all kinds of uh, different um, costs added that might not be taken into consideration and again I'm just this is me just thinking out loud and, and thinking of various ways that this could uh, add cost and just trying to keep it We have an answer for it, and you're going to like it. It's delivered. Okay. <laughs> All righty. Well, those are my only questions, so I would move the item. Council Member uh, Sarmiento. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. So um, I get that we're obligated in a procurement to go with the lowest bid, but that doesn't mean that we have to ratify it or adopt it. I think that we had this conversation in the past when we were looking at vendors and looking at what's called a multiplier effect. So even though there's a lower bid than maybe what one of our local vendors 
um, recites or proposes, the fact that the money is spent locally has an effect on the local economy. You have people that work in the, you know, in the local um, car dealer or whatever vendor it is. So if we, let's say we were purchasing furniture and, you know, people were going out to bid and we had something in Orange versus Santa Ana, so transportation isn't an issue and that stays fixed. The, the fact that we're paying not a premium but maybe more um, here locally, it's an investment in our town. It's an investment in folks that work here. They're going to be spending money here. Those employees, you know, go and eat and have dinner and lunch and different things here. So I'm not sure if we even factored in a multiplier um, effect on this. And I always thought that the 1% was a little low um, as, a, as sort of a, a preference that we give to our local folks. But to me, the disparity is so small that, you know, if it was, you know, twice the price or if it was maybe even a third or 50 percent, but it's a very narrow disparity. So I think it's something that we, I mean, I certainly would want us to reconsider that if my colleagues would, would consider. I mean, I certainly think that we should go with this local vendor because not only does this local vendor local, but Guarantee has given scholarships to many of our students. Yeah. They've stepped up. They're part of the chamber. They've been part of our stakeholder community. So I think that without violating any procurement process that we have, I think we, we can, with, you know, given other considerations, even though they're not the lowest bidder, they're very close. Um, I don't think it would violate any of the uh, procurement process, or maybe I'm mistaken, uh, Madam City Attorney. Is that something that we could, we have the discretion to do up here? Council member, you absolutely have the authority to approve whatever you would like. You're a charter city and you made the other regulations up. So right. you have that ability. And then we can, on a go forward basis as well, well, look at the vendor preference and maybe it's a percentage. If there's a local vendor that falls within a certain percentage to the another lower bidder, we automatically go with it. And it's no flaw or fall to the staff. I mean, you're, you're bound by, you know, the process that we've, you know, we've dictated to you. But I think for us, we do have that discretion, I think, to, to you know, make some uh, adjustments. And I think it's warranted here. So I know there's a motion on the floor. What I would suggest is I would propose a substitute motion to go with the uh, bid that was submitted by Guarantee Chevrolet on both, both vehicles. Councilman Iglesias. So, um, we have a substitute yeah. motion. So I, th those are exactly the same questions. And, uh, you know, I'm glad that uh, Council Member Peñalosa moved, um, moved to talk about it because I was going to pull it, too, because I, I remember having this conversation with you. Um, Guarantee Chevrolet is a very good partner of our community. And just like Council Member Sarmiento stated, they do provide a lot of scholarships for our students. And they provide a lot of incentives here for um, for our for our community, so um, I would second your motion, Council Member Sarmiento, um, be, because uh, it's it's something that I when I asked you, you said it's only eight hundred dollars that it was a difference, especially with the first one and the second one it was like you know not even nine hundred or something like that. So it's very minimal, and and it's and it's uh, something that's coming back to our community. It's revitalizing our economy. And, and they're great. They're great with our with our families. And maybe we could look at the model that we have with the the school district, because I know with the school district we had an exclusive, um, not an exclusive contract with them, but for some things we did with um, Guarantee Chevrolet. So if you could look at that, um, at that at that contract that we have with them on how we did it with the school district, would be something that we're looking into that we could apply here at the city because. It's, it's, it'll be beneficial for our community. We can do that. And, Council Member, I would like to acknowledge I spoke, you raised that same issue. And, Council Member Penaloza, you raised that same issue. I, as staff, have to follow the rules that we have in place, so I couldn't change the staff report. But this board does have the ability to do that. Very good. So we have a second from Iglesias, and uh, Council Member Solorio was requesting to speak. I, yes, uh, I'm, I'm supportive as well as I think of what we want to accomplish, but. Can we legally accomplish that today, or do we need like a two-week continuance really to justify a change in, in, uh, in recommendation? I'm actually taking a look at your local rules right now. Um, what I would recommend is if you want to take action on your substitute motion, um, that you can do that. If, um, I, if the only areas where you are not um, allowed to make up your own rules 
are sometimes when the state law imposes rules for like public works contracts, um, prevailing wages, and things of that nature. You are otherwise completely allowed to adopt your own rules. What you would be doing tonight, in my opinion, is you would be deviating in a small part from your purchasing rules. But honestly, given the very small deviation in this case, as I look at the numbers, um, I would say if that's the direction you want to go in, um, you can do that. And we will come back with an ordinance to clarify this. But your ordinance does have provisions in your purchasing that where the city council finds that it's in the best interest of the city that you can do this. And I think you have articulated some findings tonight as to why you feel that's in the best interest. Why don't you make a motion, Councilor Peñalosa? Uh, Council Member Sarmiento. Oh, you already did? So, 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 we're, so, we're, so we're discussing that, and I think there's, there's a lot of support. Yeah, so I've been, uh, with what you said, city attorney, I'm am, am supportive. Um, but continue to do legal analysis, and if in the next few yeah. days you come up with anything contradictory, we can always come back and and uh, you know, f figure out whether it needs to be, you know, undone or, or, or tweaked or something. But I am supportive of the of the motion. Just don't want want it to be in violation of any laws. Thank you. And and I'd like to withdraw my original motion. All right. Uh, can you just state the motion very briefly, please? Yeah, the substitute motion was to go with the um, with the guarantee Chevrolet bid for reasons that were articulated. Got it. And we have a second. Those in favor, please press green. Good job. Next item, Madam Clerk. 25A. Who had that one? 20. Oh. Uh, Council Member Penalosa and Iglesias. Oh. I did so. Um, uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, 25A is approve agreement with the State of California Workforce Development Board for the Prison to Employment Implement Implementation Direct Services Grant. Now, um, Madam City Manager, I, I wanted to pull this item because I wanted just more information on the, the process that was done to this because of the 85B item that I do have on the agenda tonight, which also is to discuss uh, state parolees in our community. I wanted to um, just see if you could answer these questions for us. Um, why did, did we submit a proposal on, be I went through the staff report and, and you know one of the things that, that I noticed is that we, along with the city of Anaheim and the county of Orange, uh, have a workforce development center, which is great, but why did Santa Ana submit the proposal on behalf of the region? Um, I'm going to call Community Development Director uh, Mendoza to answer your questions and any that Council Member Iglesias may have. Thank you, Council, very much. The City of Santa Ana submitted the proposal on behalf of the region, which includes the Santa Ana Work Center, the City of Anaheim Work Center, the County of Orange, which has a center in Irvine and Garden Grove, on their behalf um, because uh, they have to we we have to have one fiscal agent we decided to be the agent this time and take the lead as it rotates every single time so this was our turn at the plate every three years there's new monies that come out mm -hmm. and we were the it was our turn to be the fiscal agent for this so round. three years ago Anna, uh, Santa Ana didn't uh, submit the proposal no it would have been one of the other agencies okay now the thank you the RFP required a partnership with the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation Divisions of Adult Parolee Operations. Mm -hmm. uh, what exactly does that mean? Deborah, can you come on up? Um, can you repeat the question? The RFP requires a partnership with the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation Divisions of Adult Parolee Operations. Yes. This was directly taken from the staff report. That's because we will be responsible for enrolling the parolees and or probationaries in training, the completion of their training, attained in industry value certification credential or degrees, placement in post-secondary education, and placement in state-approved apprenticeships and job placement. We're required to do all of those things, and we have to have that agreement in place to do so. Deborah, can you, this is Deborah Sanchez. She's in charge of our work center. Yes, we'll be working with the probation and parole officers who will be making referrals to the various work centers when the parolee or parole off parolee is ready to look for work. 
And we're required by who? By the by the RFP? Required by the state. Okay. That was in the RFP, yes. I, is this in any way encouraging the release of state parolees in our city? No. They're already being released in our city if they were from our city. Same with Anaheim, same with Irvine, same with Santa Ana. We're not attracting more parolees to come to Santa Ana once they come out of jail. We are serving the ones that are coming out of jail into Santa Ana. But ones that were originally arrested in Santa Ana? Yeah, they go back roots. to the county of which they were. So, so the state has the ability to release inmates into the city they were arrested in, but the county of Orange doesn't. So we'll make note of that for later. But um, where are these state parolees housed at while they go through this workforce development? With their families or on their own? They're not housed by the work center. But usually within Santa Ana, because that's where the services are, are offered, correct? They'll be served throughout the whole county. So if they live in other parts of the county, they may go to the Irvine location or the Anaheim location, whatever is closest to them. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Those are the questions I had. Yeah. And I believe uh, Councilwoman Iglesias. Go ahead, Councilwoman Iglesias. So my question is, are the individuals that we're serving all Santa Ana residents? The, the grant will serve residents in a number of these cities. We will be administering the grant. The people that come to the work center most likely will be Santa Ana parolees. Yes. What's the percentage of the individuals that are from Santa Ana have the roots to Santa Ana and that we're trying to get them back? We in? won't know until we serve them. We don't know who's going to walk through our door. We're going after money in order to have parolees that are in Santa Ana or probationaries in Santa Ana get some assistance to get jobs, get employment, and get back on their feet. Okay, so how did it work then with Anaheim? Were they only Anaheim residents? Because you said three years ago another city applied. No, no, it's just, it's just one agency taking the lead on behalf of the multiple agencies. You know, we don't, we're always duplicating services. So if Anaheim applies for this grant and Deborah applies for the grant and Irvine applies for the grant, you have three people applying for grant. This is multiple agencies acting together to apply for the grant and one taking the lead for it. Okay. It doesn't put another, it doesn't put extra focus on Santa Ana to add probationers or um, parolees to our city. These parolees or probationers will be released in our city irregardlessly, irregardless if we have a grant for, to get them jobs. This grant will help them get employment. Yeah, but, but okay, so just to understand you then, so Santa Ana is just going to have oversight of this grant, mm -hmm. and then say they're from South County, they'll go to Irvine, and if they're from North County, they'll go to Anaheim? Yeah, and likely they'll go to the And place. then we'll only serve Santa Ana. No, they'll likely go to the office that's closer to their residence that if they're If I can maybe in. clarify, yeah, Stephen, do you happen to know for all of the other programs at the work center what percentage of clientele come through your doors that are Santa Ana residents? Do you happen to know that? Because I would think that would hold true to these other services. Right. Currently, we're serving almost 70% 70, 70 of Santa Ana residents, and the balance are coming from the cities surrounding our community. Okay. What cities would that be? We get clients that come in from the Corona area to Orange, Tustin, Irvine. Um, it's where the person feels best served, and so they'll come to our offices versus something that's closer to their home. Okay. How many, uh, how many are you intending to serve under this grant? 310 uh, parolees, probationers, are being proposed in this grant. Uh, about 70 will be from Santa Ana, 70 for the city of Anaheim, and the balance is Orange County. Okay. Thank you. Only 70. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I was just going to say, my understanding is that every probation office that is uh, providing services, when people come out of custody, they're supposed to report to uh, the local probation office, and they're in different areas. So depending on what area, if you're in South County, you go to the Irvine one. If you're in this area, you go to the Santa Ana one. If you live in Orange, or you live in Anaheim, Fullerton, so on and so forth, you go to, you report to the Anaheim office. So from there, they implement people into, they, they refer people to the workforce or the, the workplace, and they go and get, receive services there. So 
That's basically how this whole thing works. Now, when it comes down to the state, they're under the state um, being released from prison. The state has an obligation to take them back to where they are from or they report they're from. So, um, and if they come back to this area, then they receive the services. Same place. Because I believe the probation department is the one in charge of giving the services for the state. And that happened a while back. All right. I think we've learned quite a bit. Uh, Councilor Solario? Yeah, just a couple more, more things. Uh, with multiple agency grants, really from a programmatic and financial standpoint, it's better to be the person organizing it all because you have more control over what you do, what others do, et cetera. So it's actually a good practice. And it actually shows that the other communities see that we have the leadership on the staff to get the grant, follow the rules and, and, and do the work. Uh, with parolees, as has been mentioned, yeah, there is a state law that we'd like to say something comparable at the county level where, uh, you know, individuals leaving the state system go back to their counties of, of, of less residents. Uh, also, a lot of these resources go to uh, service providers in different cities other than Santa Ana, so it doesn't mean that everybody will come here. Uh, and then finally, because we manage the grant, uh, it helps us pay for rent for you know portion of of the staff that, that we have. So on the whole, it's a it's a good grant, and maybe we have to spend more time figuring out how those dollars get used. But uh, I am very much in support of this uh, effort. Thank you. All right. Do we have a motion? A second. Make a motion. Approve. Okay. We second. have a motion. A second. Those in favor, please press green. Okay. Next item, Madam Clerk. 25B. Council Who member, had that? Councilmember Iglesias. This this one, my question is um, for the, this is the one for authorizing the city manager to execute a one-year agreement extension with NAFCARE to provide basic and emergency inmate health care services for Santa Ana Jail for the period of um, October 1st, 2019 to September 30th, 2020. My question um, and for the city manager and or the chief is this money that um, we are going to be paying in the tune of $2.7 million, where does that money come from? Um, Council Member Glacius, the amount for the vendor and what's before you tonight is a um, to execute an extension with them, and the price differential from last year to this one-year extension is a thirty-five thousand dollar increase. The amount that pays for these services gets charged to our jail operations contract services account. So it's basically a cost of operating the jail, like every other cost of operating the jail. Okay, so it comes from the money that we charge. It would be, I mean, it would be offset against all of the revenue sources that the jail receives, and then this is an, an expense of doing business. I will say I, we don't achieve 100% reimbursement for the medical services, and we are required by state law to provide those medical services to inmates. So is that something that we can like into saying um, the seeking reimbursement, say, from the state or from the county, like through Cal Optima or through Medi-Cal? Um, I don't know the answer on those programs that you had mentioned to me before, like Cal Optima. I would, I would more than likely assume that if it's an incarcerated individual, they won't qualify for those other programs because incarcerated individuals receive medical services. Um, but we are, we have started the process and the talks for some of our contracts that we charge a per night uh, to raise that daily rate, and that that certainly could help offset some of these medical costs as yeah, well. Yeah, but if they're not. Individuals from Santa Ana, because my understanding they're not individuals from Santa Ana that we're housing at the jail. So why are we spending our money to um, offset or you know the balance of what you're saying? Not everything. That's not 100% reimbursable by what we charge. So we're paying some money out of our funds somewhere. So why can't we charge that money? We can certainly explore all areas where we could seek other reimbursement. But right now, that it, it's a cost of operating the jail, and our, our jail doesn't turn a profit. So okay. So is there a, so for future? Then I would like some type of report or something of how we could go about getting 100% reimbursement for this type of um, services that we're providing. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Did you want to go? Uh, 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a quick question. Perhaps the cost is coming from the inmates who are not federal inmates, yet the inmates that we are processing through our jail, and if we could get some, you know, uh, some It certainly back. could be, and also attributed to the pay and stay program as well. Pay to stay program also. Thank you. Okay, with that, I'd entertain a motion. Oh, and we have a second from Iglesias. Those in favor, please press green. Madam Clerk, what's our next item? 25C. Who had that one? Council Member Iglesias. Okay. This is just more of a general question what this is about. It's for the mail screener. Um, so it's authorizing the city manager to execute a two-year agreement with Chem Image for the purchase of the VeroVision mail screener and drug presumptive identification system for Adani Com Compass Dual View Full Body Security Screening System for the period of October 1st through uh, September 30th, 2021. Um, what exactly is this? Why are we putting money in? Three hundred sixty-seven thousand dollars into them. Okay, um, I can certainly ask the chief to come up. But in general, there are two different tools to keep drugs out of our jails. So one of them is screening mail, which is a way that drugs oftentimes get sent into jails. The other one is actually a body scanner that's um, scanning body cavities for anyone trying to transport drugs within the jail. And I'll ask the chief if you you want to add anything to my very short description of those two machines. Thank you, City Manager, uh, Mayor, City Council. That's essentially um, the information is there are two um, assets to ensure the safety of the inmates and the staff that work in the jail, um, funded by the uh, Welfare Inmate Fund. So it's actually, it, it falls in line with providing for the safety and security of inmates and our staff. Okay, so it's not coming from general fund money or money from... What what fund is it? This coming? It's the again? it's the welfare inmate fund. Okay. It comes from commissary and sales within uh, the jail itself, and it's specific for providing for the safety and security of inmates and also uh, our staff. Okay, and then so we'll be provided a report on how this is working and what's not working, and because what's the reason why we're even having this type of uh, system coming into our jail? Was it because what was there before wasn't working, or? Well, unfortunately, in some instances, it's non-existent, and what we have found is there's an increase in contraband coming into custodial facilities, uh, specifically fentanyl, which is colorless, odorless, and very, very potent and dangerous uh, to inmates uh, experiencing overdoses and, in some cases, death. Okay. Uh, so we have a, a duty and an obligation provide, to provide for their safety. This is one uh, resource that we've researched thoroughly uh, for that effort. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The motion to approve, Mr. Mayor. Is there a second? Those in favor, please press green. What's the next item, Madam Clerk? 25C. Uh, Who I'm had sorry, that 25 one? 25F, excuse me. Council Member Solorio. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, really, uh, 25F and 25G are, are very similar. I received uh, some inquiries from the public about uh, these items. Uh, what's innovative is really just this terminology of on-bill financing. Uh, rather than me explain it, which I could, uh, maybe there's somebody on staff that can uh, describe for the public how these lighting retrofit improvements at some of our parks uh, really are uh, cost neutral, if you will, to the city and the residents because the retrofits uh, reduce the energy cost that the city would have to pay uh, and you know that that's my sense of it but it would be good if we could have somebody from uh, city staff uh, confirm to that point or add to it certainly council member and you also 20b was one of these retrofits with on bill financing as well so you had three before you one at the stadium and then you have these two one at um, Rosita Park and one at Jerome Park so what they're doing is they're retrofitting the lights to be LED which draws a lower amount of electricity so our power bills with Edison drop down that differential is used for Edison to finance the retrofit for us so we keep continuing the same pay the same amount of bill even though our electric uses 
percentage is lower, and the differential pays back Edison with no interest cost. Meaning it's revenue neutral to the city? And it is. The money is fronted to us, and, and then we pay it back through our bill over a 10-year period. Right. And, and I agree, and there's comparable models out there uh, uh, in, in, in the marketplace. A, a related question, though, is uh, particularly since you know we finished this last year uh, in the black, uh, why not just pay for these outright so that there aren't any financing costs? Would that... Uh, reduce any of our costs, or is it really no no, no difference? Uh, without the interest costs, it would be just uh, by this way we can stretch our dollars farther by using mm -hmm. this feature, which has no interest costs, so it's cost neutral. Okay, thank you. And that, and that was my thought as well. Maybe in the future in the staff report we can add a little bit more to that, Certainly. so that uh, community members reading it can um, have uh, those type of questions addressed. Thank you so much. Well, with that, uh, I move. Uh, We'll Is there a second? 25 F and G. Those in favor, press screen. What's the next item, Madam Clerk? Um, can I ask uh, the council members to please press screen or red, however you want to vote? They have. What's the next item? Um, count 25 G. 25 G, who had that one? Council Member Saloria? Uh, in, in, in that motion, I said uh, 25 F and G. Because they're really then the same. 25 H, Council Member Iglesias. For 25 H, um, the reason I pulled this was because um, it's the settlement that was with the Orange County Catholic worker. And I have a concern, and it's something that the. Um, member of the audience, um, Chris Smith, brought up, which was about the terms and conditions of um, construction and operation of the shelter. Um, on page six of the agreement, on um, I would say it's item number three, it talks about, it says, at the time of this agreement, the city operates a temporary low barrier shelter in the city with a capacity of 200 beds no, known as the link. Um, according to the information that's out in our community, um, the link is not a low barrier shelter. It's more of a high barrier shelter because it, individuals that can go into that um, facility have to be referred by police and they have to have roots in Santa Ana. So they have to first be screened in order for them to be placed at that site. And um, it states that the city shall fund, obtain funding for, or coordinate third-party funding for the construction and operation of an additional low-barrier sh homeless shelter at a different location. So um, my question is, is the link a low-barrier shelter? Yes, it is. And that was indicated in the staff report with your agreement with Mercy House when you engaged them to run the shelter for you. Bridges at Kramer is also considered a low barrier homeless shelter. You can still have um, transportation and different operational procedures. They still can be considered a low barrier. So are those um, things that you just mentioned right now, like transportation and uh, they can't come in and out as they please, is that something that was put into the negotiation or is that something that you are going to bring to council after? Well, this body would have complete control as to what operating standards you would want your shelter operated at. Of course, we would recommend, given the success of the link, that we mirror what the operating standards are at the link. Yeah, and I do have a concern, too, um, you know, doing things um, retro or, you know, coming before the council after something's been signed and for us to come for approval. Um, I'm not very comfortable with that, and I, I just feel that this this um, MOU is something that was decided by, I guess, by you, but it's something that I'm not very comfortable with, so um, just the fact that we don't have concrete information in here other than it's, it's very vague and very... Um, I know it doesn't give the city or, or the um, residents here in Santa Ana or the community protection of not having more homeless people dumped in Santa Ana. 
Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to say that I believe, uh, Madam uh, City Manager, that you were following the directions of this council, the majority of this council that allowed you uh, the leeway, and you, you told us the goals that we had. We discussed it in depth many times, and I want to thank you for uh, doing the work that you do. And of course, this agreement is still contingent on our. Um, on what happens with the county. So uh, thank you very much. I want to clarify that very uh, here in, with the public. Thank you. Uh, one comment, then I'll call for a motion and a vote. And that is that I think the city manager acted absolutely correctly in, in the procedure here, meaning we have to have, in essence, a tentative agreement to bring to the council. Otherwise, we would never finish. We, we're not going to have the judge in front of us, the, you know, the uh, uh, Catholic worker advocate uh, trying to negotiate a tentative agreement so that we can approve it. So I, I, I think that by the very nature of how you have to do things, the city manager acted correctly under our direction. She did a tentative agreement, brought it back to us, we can go up or down. If we say no, we don't like it, we can vote it down and there's nothing. But if we vote it up, we have to know what we're voting on. And that's, that's what she uh, provided. So with that, I would entertain a motion. Motion to approve. I'll be happy to second. Those in favor, please press green. Motion carries five to one. So with that, let's go on to the next item. Mayor, if I could respectfully ask for the administration a vote for the reappointed of the yes. commissioners. All right. If you're here to be in, sworn in, Irma Macias, Phil Schaefer, Andres Masson, Mark McLaughlin. I don't know if I've seen Mark here today. So you're going to take the oath for him, Phil? All right. I could ask. Come around. Come around. He still has those? It's a big, a big number. Okay. It's a small group. If I can ask you to raise your right hand. And then, um, Why don't you go, stand closer to the mic so oh. folks at home can hear what we're up to. Um, I, and please state your name for the record. I, Andres Matskin. Mm -hmm. Irma Macias. Phil Schaefer. Thank you. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. swear. That I will. That I will support and defend, support and defend, defend the, Constitution the Constitution of the United States, the United States, United States and, the and the Constitution of the State of California, of the state of California. Against, all against all enemies, foreign and domestic, foreign and domestic that, I will that I will bear true faith, bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. That I will well and faithfully discharge the duties Discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter. Upon which which I'm about to enter. Congratulations. Thank you, Thank you again. Come over here and shake hands. Oh, sure. Absolutely. I believe our next item is item 50A, 
And uh, Brooke, I think we have a request to speak, and also Mike uh, Tardif. Go ahead, Mike. You go first. You're walking faster. Not bad for broken legs. Well, it's you're still walking faster. There you go. Uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, I'm here regarding Agenda Item 50A, the proposed oversized vehicle parking ordinance. Um, I'd like to commend city staff and council for proposing an oversized vehicle parking ordinance for the city of Santa Ana. I believe that would be a valuable and okay uh, to go along with that. I, I believe it would be a valuable safety measure to add a maximum width to this to the description of oversized vehicle. In researching other California cities, it appears that many such width restrictions are between 78 and 82 inches maximum width. Uh, there, there's no maximum width noted on the proposed ordinance that I could see. I think that a maximum width restriction of seven feet, which is 84 inches, is, would be generous and reasonable. An example, my utility trailer on which I tow my Jeep is 94 inches wide which would be 10 inches wider than the maximum we could allow. But it would be covered by uh, a permit when required. Um, so if you could add that seven foot width to um, the, the description we have now is 22 feet in length or seven feet in height, but there's no mention of a maximum width. I think, I think seven feet maximum width would be reasonable. It uh, would reduce obstruction to the rights of way access and provide additional parking for residents' vehicles um, if they're not allowed on, on the streets other than at permitted times. Um, also in the or proposed ordinance, there's a mention of signs being, be, being required to be posted in order to enforce this ordinance. Um, to me that seems it might be unnecessary. unnecessary. It certainly will be a costly expense. If the ordinance would simply apply to all residential areas, it might be simpler. Um, I, I would hope that the permit process is easy to use and preferably done online. It's not specifically lined out in the ordinance how that is to be done other than that the city manager will be responsible for for uh, organizing that. Oh, the staff report mentions that there will be no charge for permits for the temporary parking permits for oversized vehicles. But I noticed that the ordinance does allow for a charge uh, for permits to be determined by the city manager. I imagine that's just in case you decide to need some extra revenue. Mike, it's red. Thank you. Thank you. Brooke, you're on. Welcome, by the way. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council. Um, I am coming tonight to urge you to do a little more investigation before you pass something regarding the RVs. I'm not sure, as written, that it's lawful or meet your goals. Um, the city is really trying to take a leadership role in looking at health care first and reducing homelessness. And an important part of that is considering what actions the city and the state are taking that risk increasing homelessness. And we know that individuals living in RVs, that may be their retirement plan. It's often seniors. We've seen it in other cities that have implemented these types of laws, sometimes with lawsuits later and joining them from enforcing the bans on overnight sleeping and things. But the result is that the people who are living in those RVs are often the more vulnerable members. And enacting this type of law without a plan in place for what to do about that risks ticketing those individuals and eventually seizing their RVs and then having them land in your shelters where they become an increasing burden on the city. Um, so I'd suggest instead the city consider using your outreach personnel to figure out who are the people that are in the RVs, what are the needs, and figuring out exactly what 
the issues are that they're facing and who this population is before you take the step of criminalizing. Because this ordinance as written does that, right? It doesn't just say you can't be here. It doesn't write a ticket like a parking ticket, but it actually creates a misdemeanor um, where a person risks going to jail because they couldn't afford to not live in their RV. Um, so I think there's, there, there, I understand there's concerns and there are some things that maybe need solutions, but I would suggest that the city really look at kind of what, what are the goals of this and if it is just providing solutions to specific problems, is this complete ban going to provide that? And if not, are there things in between or services the city needs to look into ahead of time to ensure that the actual goals are met and that it doesn't have these unintended consequences of actually increasing homelessness instead of increasing public safety or comfort or whatever the other things are that the city is hoping to do. Thank you for those thoughts, Brooke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, let me bring it back to council. Comments or thoughts? Councilmember Solario, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I am uh, prepared uh, to, to move the item, but also did want to state that uh, a couple of things I do agree with with the, the, the last speaker, Miss um, Weissman, is for other similar ordinances, we've taken out the misdemeanor provisions so as to not criminalize it and just leave in the financial uh, fines in place. And maybe we also start with a warning uh, and then we do a, you know, a, a fine structure. Uh, and then in addition to just doing that, we should do some you know, outreach and education of, of options for them shelters. Uh, one big thing I'm concerned with with these RVs and other similar vehicles is what folks do with, uh, uh, you know, the human waste. And, you know, there ought to be education about if folks do live in RVs or other vehicles, what, what some, you know, safe uh, options might be. Uh, but uh, I guess long story short, uh, I moved this item w with uh, uh, the change in section 36 dash 152, which is the enforcement remedy section, to remove the, the misdemeanor uh, provisions. Uh, another reason to do that, in addition to just it being the, the right thing to do, is that for uh, some, if they have uh, uh, an immigrant status that, that is under review, you know, you know, a misdemeanor on their file would, uh, would be harmful for, uh, for, the, for their status or their change in status. So that's another reason to remove the the misdemeanor with respect to the outreach that could just be done administratively. Thank you. Yes, Councilman Penaloza. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Madam City Manager, this this uh, question, I actually had a question for the Chief of Police. I don't know where he went, but um, maybe you could answer the question. Uh, Madam City Manager, uh, what, what uh, time at night is the shift change in PD? I'm going to have to defer to the chief on that one. Okay. Yeah. I think the question, Councilman, is what time does the shift change? Yeah. And that's uh, 6 p.m. for graveyard, uh, 2 p.m. for cover watch. So 2, two, well, two p.m. 2 p.m. to 2 a.m. is cover watch, what we call cover watch. Graveyard is 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Okay. Um, the only uh, change that I would want to see in this ordinance, uh, th thank you, Chief. Yes. That was all. The only change that I would want to see in this ordinance is, uh, is in Section 2, uh, Letter A, Madam City Manager. I'm sorry, sir. It's okay. You're discussing the ordinance. I have a question. For okay. The um, how, how did we come about the, the 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. hours? It mirrors the other um, sorts of parking restrictions um, so that really it was the issue of overnight and whenever a city bans overnight parking, they usually have the restrictions apply from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. Yeah, I've usually seen 10 p.m. I've seen 12 uh, midnight. Um, this one is just 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. is a very short window. Yeah, we have to make sure we, we approach this ordinance from the perspective that it really was about parking and not about homeless because that's what is important. 
it is really important for the reasons um, one of our speakers stated and that we are really looking at this as a parking. We have a parking problem in our city. We are treating these vehicles just like we do any other vehicles. So when you do that, when a city normally bans overnight parking, overnight parking is usually enforced within those hours. So we were mirroring um, overnight parking standards. If you're going to uh, if you're going to have a rule that says you can't park overnight for a car, which is two to six, we wanted the RVs to be similar. Because from from what I understand, and and just as, this is also I have planned on make uh, making a comment of this during council comment, uh, and again meeting with numerous neighborhood residents, uh, specifically Memorial Park neighborhood, uh, the the signage at these parks and these parking lots are faded, they're deteriorated, and that is the excuse that, that according to the resident, PD is giving and the reason why they can't enforce the law of cars uh, overstaying their visit at night in the, in the park parking lot is because the signage is faded and there isn't any proper signage to, to which I understand, but if that's the case, we should be uh, addressing those signs and making sure that it's visible and clearly stated that that car should not be staying overnight in a park because public parks close at 10 p.m. Yes, and I'd like to just address that. I can't address the sign issue, and I'll defer to the city manager and public works on that. But I would like to address the issue of overnight parking. There is a difference. A city has almost complete authority um, on setting regulations on property it owns, parking lots at parks, parking lots on city-owned property. But with respect to vehicles parked in the public right of way, hold, hold on, Madam it's Senior, different. I, 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 city Attorney, I can't. Do, do you guys mind? Just really quick. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. So sorry. So um, with respect to your ability to regulate parking on in parking lots on city-owned property, you have a complete right to set the times of, of your um, opening and closing of those facilities. When you're regulating an RV, it's a vehicle as defined under the state vehicle code, you have numerous restrictions. You can only regulate vehicles and their parking on the rights of way in accordance with the rules. You have to be able to state health and safety reasons. So you, yes, you may see a ban on overnight parking in parks that starts at 10 a.m. and goes until 7 a.m. But when you're talking about the parking of vehicles on the public right of way, there are different rules that apply. And so, that's where we aim to be more consistent with the rules for overnight parking on all public rights of way. So the latest we could we could start is 2 a.m. or earliest. That's correct, because it's a vehicle that enjoys protection under the vehicle code. So if uh, so, what is the the earliest hour in the night that we could start enforcing? If you were going law? to ban, well, you could go earlier, but if you're going to ban RVs starting at 10 p.m., then you're going to have to ban vehicles starting at 10 p.m. And you may have locations or under your parking rules where you're not going to want to do that because people may be driving a, a smaller vehicle and you don't want to make them leave someone's home or not be able to be parking on that street after 10 p.m. But I thought this was an a ordinance pertaining to oversized and recreational vehicles. Yes, but in order, your legal authority to regulate those vehicles has to be in strict compliance with the law. Which is only 2 a.m.? That's, that's no. the 2 to 6? You've got to be consistent. You've got to treat the RVs like you do cars. So if you want to ban overnight parking of these um, RVs during those, because that's what we're really trying to do, right? We're trying to regulate the overnight parking, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So we have to treat them in the same way we would other vehicles that are parking on public you, rights. You can't right. treat them differently. You have to treat them the same. So, so the other vehicles could only, uh, you could only enforce. If you want to have a rule in your city that you cannot park vehicles on the public streets overnight, and you want to define overnight as being from 10, 8, 10 p.m. till 6 a.m., you can do that, but it's going to apply to everybody. That will cause you major problems. Major problems. All right, look, it's red. If you want to come back, I'll come back. Let me just see what other okay. folks want. Sassy, go, go ahead. It's just more going on what uh, Council Member Peñalosa was saying. The 2 a.m. time doesn't make sense to me because I've seen signs that says tw no parking over, um, from 12, p 12 a.m. to 6, 6 a.m. And um, that would be okay because what we're trying to do is this oversized um, – Vehicles are parking in areas that they're not supposed to be parking in, and they're affecting our neighborhoods. And anyone that would have a, um, you know, somebody who would be there, like say, like a regular car, 
wouldn't that be an opportunity? F I mean, I don't think they're just that much congested, but it wouldn't have an opportunity for maybe the neighboring homes to have permit parking. Wouldn't that be something that they could also apply for if they, that's what they wanted? But I, I feel 2 a.m. to 6 a.m., it's, it's not enough time. It's not really giving anybody anything because, you know, they, they could be there till 2 a.m. And sometimes people want to go to sleep or do some type of um, <laughs> rest. But at um, 2 a.m., I think it's too late at, into the morning. 12, 12 a.m. for me would be better. That's what I've seen uh, in most of the of the parking, I would say the parking signs. So, and also I was wondering, um, when you ask about, when you talk about oversized vehicles, um, are these referring to vans or just like RVs, trailers, detached trailers? What's, what's, what's the definition? Um, so I believe the, the ordinance that you had on the books, and please correct me if I'm wrong, city attorney, is that it just addressed commercial vehicles. So RVs didn't fall within that definition. So this changed the definition and created an oversized vehicle. So it's based on length or height. Mm -hmm. um, and if your vehicle fits that, then you're prohibited under this newly proposed ordinance. Okay. So then, no, the, like the trailers, the detached trailers and all that? Trailers are defined in here as well. How about how about the ones that you know, like when you haul things? I don't know what those are called. Trailers um, too. I've, uh, are those the recreational part? vehicles? Like the no, the ones are where you haul things. Like they 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 hook up to the back of your truck or your you know you're hauling them. So just because I've seen some of those also parked in the on the streets too. Yeah. Um, that is covered by this as well because it includes any extension to the vehicle caused by attachments. Okay. And it goes by the, I would say the length. Would it be height. by the length or would it be the type? Height or length is how we're defining our oversized vehicles. Okay. Because I've seen some neighborhoods that have um, detached trailers like that, that, um, that they're being parked in the neighborhood and the owner nowhere to be found so so let me clarify so you're asking if a if a trailer without a vehicle attached mm -hmm. to it is parked mm -hmm. city attorney with that well we have other rules that apply this applies to a motor vehicle okay um, and so we would have other we were trying to cure a, a deficiency in our code with respect to motorized vehicles we have other provisions in our code that would deal with um, unmotorized vehicles okay, so or that's, unmotorized so trailers. that's another conversation Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead, please. Thank you. And um, this is more directed to the city attorney. So um, just some questions on how we arrived at this, because I get the intent, and I know we're trying to address a problem that's um, of concern to many of our uh, neighborhoods. So, you know, I know there was a time back where we tried to regulate lunch trucks and other vendors and we tried to use some TPMs time place manner restrictions and we've had a permanent injunction as a result of the um, of the effort that we made back then so I'm a little concerned about what was raised by um, Miss Weitzman when she came up here because I think she's correct this could be seen as a way of circumventing um, you know uh, state law and protections against the homeless population because some of these vehicles could be considered dwellings um, and I know that the election code um, recognizes vehicles as dwellings for folks who don't have homes um, for purposes of voting and other, and other um, uh, things as well. The, the issue on signage, I think, is, is critical because to the extent that we don't have signage, you don't have notice. And so if you wanted to enforce anything, um, you have to be able to make sure that the person um, understands um, what they're doing is in violation of either uh, uh, municipal code or some other uh, ordinance. So this could lead to some unintended consequences. As, as we're trying to address one problem, we're going to invite um, other challenges and other lawsuits. So I wanted to get your thoughts about this. You know, I, I get the effort. I just, wanted to, I, I just want to make sure that we're um, going down the right path um, and we're not um, trying to... Um, you know, solve one problem and, and create another. So, you know, I just think that what happens is, you know, we may be, um, we may not be as focused because if it's a citywide ban, I think these problems 
arise in certain areas, and I do think somebody mentioned, I think, the uh, permit process uh, did a lot to address this. And so I thought that that was a, a tool that maybe we could revise or maybe we could use as well because that hasn't been challenged. And that is something that I think has been so far um, you know, not met with any opposition. But um, look, I just wanted to get your thoughts on this. Um, you know, what do you see about or what do you say about uh, Ms. Weitzman's comments? So um, first of all, I'd like to, to tell you that we looked at this very, very carefully. It took us a, several months before we presented this to the City Council, um, primarily because we were trying to balance the City's right to protect health, safety, and welfare against what we knew would be a perception that this is really something you're trying to do to regulate homeless. Um, we have a severe parking issue in our city, as you know. It's come before this council numerous times. When you have um, parking of these oversized vehicles in particular neighborhoods, these vehicles take up three or four parking spaces where others who are driving smaller vehicles could park. That's primarily why this is being presented to you. Um, so what we did is we looked at the health, safety, welfare aspect of this. We also looked at cities where ordinances have been challenged in particular the city of San Diego, and we took the regulations from cities whose ordinances either survived a legal challenge or where there were conversations with advocates for the homeless where they um, okayed the types of regulations. And so we believe that our ordinance um, is defensible. We can never guarantee that you won't be challenged and we can never guarantee that you wouldn't be successfully challenged, but I think staff has done an excellent job and reviewing um, other communities and putting forth some regulations that have survived scrutiny. Right. Thank you for that. My time's up, so I'm, I'm just going to leave you with a couple of issues that you may want to consider. Look at the election code and how it treats folks and how it defines dwelling. Um, number one, the, the election code, because when a person is to become eligible to be a voter, you have to give a, a, an address. And so folks who are homeless don't have that, but recent case law has shown that folks can either uh, site their vehicle and where it's parked as a um, as a physical address. So that may create an access to a dwelling. So right. to the extent that that's just something that we consider. Yes, um, and I'd like to address that. This ordinance doesn't address anyone living in an RV, for example, if it's living on a piece of property where it can be lawfully parked, whether that happens to be someone else's property, whether that happens to be on a commercial corridor. We do know of some cities that are actually um, selecting areas of their city where it's okay to park overnight as a way to address homeless that are living in vehicles and that potentially is something that you could look at in the future um, if that's what you wanted to do but I yes I do agree look with I, you. I'm just putting that out there just so you know and the second thing is just to you know that vehicle that large vehicle that takes up three or four spaces that also can be regulated through a permit as well so thank you okay so we lost the mayor for a second do we have a council member so, uh, so uh, just another comment. I know on some things like the hours, um, we are going to have a second reading of this. And so some things like that are easier to change, right? We're changing digits. So whatever fine details like that, you know, if we can't come to agreement t today, we can always make that tweak later. Because on the parking hours, I would like to see, for example, a sheet showing for other types of parking things what their hours are. So there's consistencies, and I know, for example, with uh, mobile truck vendors, we've you know, been back and forth with these kind of things over the years, and so we do want to have some consistency with how we treat different types of vehicles out in the community. Thank you. Councilmember Iglesias. So just a um, quick question. I know I asked you um, this, um, Madam City Manager. Is this citywide ordinance, or is it just specifically for neighborhoods? It's a citywide ordinance. Okay. And that's part of the reason I know you mentioned the permit parking. The permit parking is a residential streets mm -hmm. program. Okay. So then this also would go into the areas, too, where we have a lot of industrial buildings, where that's where many times we see um, the oversized park, I mean, Correct. vehicles parked. As long as it's a public street. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we have a motion on the, uh, on the floor. I do not have a second unless someone sent it and I missed it. Do we have a second? This is for to just to press green. Oh, okay. I'll second. Okay. All those in favor, press green. I'm going to abstain. Okay, motion passes. Uh, Madam Clerk, what is the next item? 55A. 55B. 
A. A as an apple. Move the item. I have a comment, Mr. Mayor Pritchard. I'll second that. Uh, Council Member Peñalosa. Thank you. Um, 55A is to adopt three resolutions for Memorial Community Center, Sandra McFadden and, Ray and Myrtle Park projects for the submittal of the statewide park developments and community revitalization program grant. Just wanted to thank uh, uh, Lisa, Parks and Rec staff, along with Ron. Uh, I know you guys have been working really hard uh, to get these, uh, you know, going after these grants uh, that are much needed for these uh, three different parks. And our city manager and staff, thank you for that. Uh, this is, um, I'm, I'm excited for this, Memorial Park. Again, I, I learned to swim in that community center, well, not in the pool, not in the community center. And uh, I got yelled at at the community center a couple weeks ago at the Memorial Park neighborhood meeting, which is awesome. I enjoy it. Um, but uh, very happy to see the, the investment into these, these parks and these two new parks that will be coming. I just wanted to, um, maybe this is a conversation for a later date, but just have some ideas with the renderings that were included in the staff report with the Memorial Park. Uh, just, Lisa, if you could answer this, or Madam City Manager, just in regards to the additional basketball court that was shown. Are, are these, are, are these uh, phases and renderings, are these set in stone? Is this final? Is this... Um, Uh, these are just conceptual uh, drawings, so we would uh, refine them if we get the grant and hire an architect and okay. engage the community. And, okay, so. and, and that, that's what I figured, but I just wanted to make sure that was clear with myself and with the community. Right. Uh, because I know that the other two parks on Wright and Myrtle and McFadden and, and Standard, uh, there's, uh, there's uh, the skate parks, and w which is great, but I, I, maybe we could have a... a community surveys and further outreach to see if, if skate parks are really uh, the, the number one desire from kids in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I know that back when uh, now Pat McGuigan Skate Park uh, was, was done in the early 2000s, you know, it was uh, very popular. Everybody wanted to be a skater. I wanted to be a professional skateboarder because Tony Hawk was right. the only thing playing on my Nintendo mm -hmm. 64. And that was like the, the thing to do. And uh, now I, I, I don't Obviously, I'm not in that age group anymore, but I just wanted to have the conversation to see if skate park is the desired uh, option for these newer skate parks, mm -hmm. uh, because there's one at the Raider Myrtle that's, you know, conceptualized, and McFadden and Standard, and I know there's another one in downtown coming somewhere, and we have uh, Mariposa Park, which is also including a skate park. Mm -hmm. So just wanted to make sure that that, re that really is a desired need by our residents or the majority of the kids that are going to use it. Just for when we go down this line, you can have that information ready for when these grants hopefully, you know, come our way. So that, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Okay. I just want to note that we did have some uh, several 15 uh, input sessions by the community. So this was identified uh, during those sessions. Uh, but yes, we can, we can certainly uh, revisit this. Thank you. All right. What is the pleasure of the council? There was a motion and a second. Those in favor? I'm sorry, who, who second? <laughs> uh, I believe. Also, I made the motion. All right. What's our next item, Madam Clerk? 55B. Okay, we have no speakers on that. I would entertain a motion. I'll move the item. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Those in favor, plus green. This is the approval of Shadow. Yes. Who was here? <laughs> You're adorable. on a first name basis. Uh, your buddy. All right, next item, 55C. All right, we have some speakers. Claudio Gallegos. Followed by, if you could come on down, Ty Fan and Alexander. Go good ahead. E good evening, Mayor and Council. I um, speak on behalf of Congressman Lou Correa this evening. I write to you in strong support of item 55C on your Council agenda this evening. 
regarding a proposed resolution opposing the Department of Homeland Security's public charge rule change as applied to legal permanent residency applications. As you may know, the President has released his final rule related to public charge in the Federal Register. This rule forces struggling families pursuing the American dream to make the impossible choice, feed their children or become a U.S. citizen. Worse, this rule supports the factually incorrect notion that immigrants are a financial burden to the American taxpayer and subside on the welfare state. Let it be known these stereotypes are false and dangerous. The United States is the land of reinvention and opportunity. For most of us, our immigrant ancestors arrived in the United States with nothing but a hope and a prayer. And from that, we built the wealthiest and most powerful nation the world has ever seen. The administration's change to the public charge ignores our history and turns the nation's back on our legacy. As a high-ranking member of the House Committee on Homeland Security and the House Judiciary Committee, both of which have jurisdiction over the rule change, I have been pushing back on policies like this for my two and a half years in Congress. I have spoken to the Secretary of DHS and USCIS and demanded that these policies not stand as they are detrimental to my district. As, communities, as this community's representative in Washington, I have fought to prevent this change from taking place. As a chairman of the Department of Homeland Security Committee and and a member of the Judiciary Committee, I have stood arm in arm with our allies and face to face with our opponents. Be it General John Kelly, Secretary Kirsten Nielsen, or Acting Secretary Kevin McCallinan, I have stood up for this administration's consistent assault on immigrant communities. We must not be silent when our families, our neighbors, and our values are under attack. While this resolution before you will not prevent the administration from implementing this rule change, it shows that the city of Santa Ana stands in solidarity with its citizens. I urge you all to support Mr. David Peñalosa's um, resolution tonight and our immigrant community by standing with our family, friends, and neighbors in rejecting this rule. It's your job to stand up for the citizens of Santa Ana, and it is my job to stand up against the president. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ty, and then Alexander. Okay, it's low enough. Hi, good evening. My name is Ty Viet Fan. I'm here before you to ask that you approve the resolution brought forth by uh, Council Member Peñalosa. Uh, I am an attorney. I work, have lived here in Santa Ana most of my life, and I work in the local community. My sister is actually currently in optometry school. So I became an attorney. She decided to be a doctor to one of me. I would say, for all intents and purposes, we have made it. I think what a lot of people don't know is that we didn't start out making it. I was born three weeks after my parents fled Vietnam and landed in Thailand. We have crossed jungles. We have avoided literal pirates and landmines and have crossed the Pacific Ocean to come to the United States. I came here when I was two. For food, we relied on food stamps and food banks. For housing, we relied on Section 8. And for medical care, for my mom's handicap and her amputation, and for my asthma and my dad's cancer chemotherapy, we relied on Medi-Cal. If public charge had been the rule, the law of the land, when we came to America, my family would have been turned away for being poor, for being of no value. Essentially, what that rule, public charge, says is that there was no hope for people like us, that we were not of value, and that we were worthless. I say to you that any person, any immigrant who has traversed deserts, who has crossed jungles and who has crossed oceans to make it here so that their child, who, by the way, if I had been born a few weeks earlier, we would not have been here. So by the grace of God, we did make it. Anyone who has a grit and determination to do that has potential to be a great member of our American family. 
So I would say that the public charge rule does not just reflect, it's not just anathema to our American values of hope and potential and change. It's just plain cruel. And so as a city of Santa Ana, I think that we need to stand up because we are a melting pot of communities. We are either immigrants ourselves or children and family members of immigrants. So we need to stand up to President Trump and the administration and say, no, Americans like me, we have potential. I came here with nothing. My family came here with nothing. And I would say today, we're giving everything we have to our community. Thank you. We have one more speaker, Alexander. Um, hi, good evening, Mr. Mayor and uh, City Council. Uh, I am a supporter of the recall committees against you, uh, Juan Villegas and Cecilia Iglesias. It is clear that you are a Trump supporter and not suited for elected office in Santa Ana. The citizens of Santa Ana demand transparency and honesty from you. The agenda shows uh, you attended Washington, D.C. for legislative meetings, but we all know you're lying and hiding the truth. The fact is you attended the White House again with your Trump supporters, friends, to support Donald Trump. Now, uh, Facebook shows you having brunch at the Trump Tower and parading around the White House, clearly deceiving our communities in Santa Ana. How many times have you attended Washington, D.C. on taxpayer dollars? What legislative me meetings did you attend, if any? What real purpose and justification for such taxpayer expenditures is there for you to attend Washington, D.C.? Or, or is it a, uh, nothing more than a paid vacation for you and your significant other to visit Trump and wine and dine on the taxpayer dime while you show your loyalty to a White House and President Trump, who is clearly attacking our most vulnerable immigrant communities? Is this theft or gifts of public funds? Uh, and at minimal, you should be ashamed of yourself, a so-called man of the law. You say you are in law enforcement. What exactly is your job? Are you actually a specialty security guard? Um, Santa Ana demands to know your it, it, itinerary and meetings for those three days and for all your vacations to visit Trump and Washington, D.C. Another public records request is all, uh, to disclose the cost of all your trips, vacations, or as you say, legislative meetings and whom you attended with. The truth is the city does, does have a lobbyist in Washington, D.C. and in Sacramento. Have you attended any legislative meetings in Sacramento? Probably not, as President Trump is never there or welcomed there. If you are a man of integrity, you will disclose the truth of all your trips and, and pay back the costs to the city for your vacations. Per the AB 1234 disclosure, you are required by law and the residents of Santa Ana demand you disclose tonight in council comments the name of every event you attended as a council member or guest and who paid for these events. Thank you. All right. So, uh, Councilor Peñalosa, would you like to make any comment? Or thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just uh, thank you, staff, for bringing this resolution to us uh, rather quickly. Uh, you know, make no mistake that we all know the intention be behind these changes and additions to the public charge rule. This is a clear attack on immigrants across the country, and. I found it in, in my responsibility as an elected official in Santa Ana to stand with the residents side by side and the immigrants in our community to, and I know we don't have any influence over federal law, but just as a symbolic gesture that we stand by you and we oppose these uh, changes that could severely impact our community and uh, our immigrant community. So with that said, uh, thank you staff for bringing this forward. Uh, I'm happy that you guys are going to be having those workshops throughout the city to educate the community on what these changes exactly mean. Um, but I'm happy, you know, that there's, you know, I'm just happy to, to oppose the Trump administration's uh, changes to the public charge rule. Councilor Iglesias. Um, just to piggyback on what you just said, Councilmember Peñalosa, so we are going to be having community education on what when there's a law that's coming down how it affects our neighbor our neighbors and our residents okay because sometimes that that's where 
all the miscommunication and also all the misunderstanding rises from from the lack of understanding and the lack of education into our community. So I, I want to thank you for including that in this resolution so we could be more in tune on what's really uh, affecting our community and also what it is that the federal government is trying to come down on us as local leaders. So thank you. Mr. Mayor, I was yes, go ahead. misunderstood. Uh, these, I mean, that education aspect is important, but these public charge rule changes are drastically going to impact our community. That is, that is known, and that's the intention behind it because of the hateful rhetoric that we've seen from the administration and the, the Homeland, Department of Homeland Security. Just wanted to make sure that that was known. All right, anybody else? Uh, Councilmember Ben Sarmiento. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I, I want to thank uh, Councilmember Peñalosa uh, for bringing this before us. And I know I, I think it was on an 85A from last meeting. And so I'll be happy to second this motion that you have on the floor and that you proposed. Um, so I was in uh, Washington as well last week, and I was on an advocacy trip that was funded and supported by the Orange County Water District. We were there to speak with our delegation, the um, federal EPA, the Army Corps of Engineers on water-related matters. But as we were there on uh, Tuesday night, um, the news broke about the um, uh, House's decision, the House Majority's decision to uh, begin the inquiry on, on impeachment. And so... I was very glad to see um, uh, Councilman, or excuse me, Congressman uh, Correa um, uh, leading the effort. He sits on the Judiciary Committee, and uh, those in our delegation, which are now six, all six of our congressional members, uh, were very supportive of what was going on. So it was a really good environment to be at. That wasn't the purpose of my trip, but it was great to be a witness to what was happening. And I think it speaks well of, um, of our Congressman, because he represents a very, very targeted community. So this is, you know, let's not be, let's not be mistaken. This is a mean-spirited effort. This is a bigoted effort. This is an effort to attack the very people we represent. And to see the congressman take a stand and be strong may be really proud to be one of his constituents. And I think it's, you know, about time that all of us, you know, as the councilman says, these are federal issues. We at the local level really can't do much to influence that decision. But to the extent these gestures give um, some solace to the people that we represent. It does let them know that they live in a community that we care, that we're going to stand side by side with them, because this isn't going to end, and it hasn't ended. So we've survived, you know, these, these, this, this, this administration's just a litany of um, gross violations of people's rights that we represent here. So um, I do, you know, want to thank you. I think that. Um, you know, the councilman, you know, realizes that these are things that we obviously can't enforce, but uh, we're going to continue standing with our, um, with our residents and our neighbors. We have a diverse community, so to the extent that we know um, we, they look to us for leadership, because even though we don't influence the public policy at the federal level, we can influence those that represent us. And that is indicative by the letter that was sent to us by Congressman Correa. So I, um, I want to thank him. I don't take the opportunity to thank him enough. But this is, you know, this is one that he has stood strong, and I certainly uh, applaud his courage on this. So thank you very much. Any other comment? Right here, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mayor Pro Tem. So thank you very much. And I did vote uh, to approve this resolution. This resolution affects veterans also. I am a veteran of the United States Army. I uh, have a great respect for whoever is uh, in the uh, Oval Office. That's what military people do. That's how we are. It really doesn't matter who the Commander-in-Chief is. That's the boss. That's who we respect. All, everyone in this audience or listening to me today, if you have not served in the military, I don't expect you to understand. And that's okay. But uh, this resolution, this change in the uh, public charge rule does uh, affect veterans. And um, as a matter of fact, if you're active duty, I was reading, if you're active duty, it also affects them slightly, so they're able to change it. But, you know, anything that has to do with veterans, I'm always a big supporter. We need to protect them because they gave their all for this country. Thank you. So with that... Um, Mr. Mayor, just a... Yes, go a, ahead. A quick point. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, we all know what 
you know, the Trump administration is trying to do with this. They're trying to deny giving more immigrants legal status. And that's bad. We should be doing things like this. And if we should go, and if we go to D.C., we should go out there to advocate against it. Uh, and so we are here to share our voice that we disagree. We are uh, happy that Congress Member Correa is also here and, and did a letter. And uh, you know, we need to be careful about what we're saying or doing in D.C. because people will read the wrong message into things just by our mere presence. So we need to be clear and consistent that we oppose the actions of the Trump administration, and most of them are anti-immigrant, and this is an immigrant city. Yeah, and it's funny because I still have a personal opinion on who I uh, respect. You expect people to respect your position as a council member or the mayor or what have you, and just because we have a difference of opinion doesn't mean we're you know, awful people or anything like that. You know, the thing is, you know, I give them respect, they give me respect. You know, if there's a difference, that's fine, but I don't, you know, um, uh, you know, I voted on the sanctuary city. I voted on this, on some things that are really, uh, you know, uh, controversial. I wait and see what the court says. And, and we can differ in a, in a And we have difference manner. of opinion, and that's, that's all it is. We can be civil. And it's still, my main job is to serve the people of Santa Ana. And when I do go to D.C., I do have right here information of where I've been and what I've been doing. And that's what I do. I go out there to try to uh, represent, speak, represent me with the Department of Justice to get more grants, meet with Feinstein's office, all of that. And I'll be reporting that later. All right. Thank you. Maybe enough on this item. Do we have a, a, a motion or a second? Yeah, I'll, I'll move. Well, I don't think there was. There, was, there is? Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Those in favor, please press screen. All right, next item. 55D. Pardon? 55D. Isn't it? The, it's the Santa Ana 55 Management. 55D? D, correct. I heard 65. Move okay. the item. 5-5. Five, five. Okay, we have motion a second. Those in favor, please press screen. Okay, uh, the next item, I believe, is at uh, E, 55E. Move the item. Those in favor, please press green. And the next item, 55F, I would entertain a motion. So moved. I'll second it. I'd like a Mayor. comment, Mr. Mayor. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. So I would like to apologize for to the uh, PMA, the Police Managers Association, for this taking so long. I wish there was another uh, uh, MOU or contract I could vote on. Everyone knows that uh, I was not supportive of the previous contact, uh, contract, and I um, am going to support this. Because uh, when you start paying politics with people's livelihoods, I'm going to draw the line there. And everyone knows that you know, uh, they're, you know the, the raises right here are pretty, pretty high. There's a few things that we did get out, out of, as in the uh, Me Too clauses, which I think was worth it. For future negotiations, there won't be a Me Too clause. But uh, you know, I, I don't like playing with people's lives, so I'm going to support this. And if I'm going to support one, I'm going to support them all because they're our employees. And everyone knows where I stand with the POA contract, and that's what started this whole thing. But I'm going to draw the line because this is just taking too long. We're talking, I don't know how many months, almost a year now, that these folks have been without a contract. All right, we have a motion and a second. Yep. Uh, Councilor Solario. Uh, I, I today am not prepared uh, to, to support this. If we're to come back uh, differently, I would definitely... Uh, entertain that. Uh, first, just some questions to staff just to clarify and make sure folks know what we're, what we're doing. So this, this is... Uh, Start the clock, uh, please. This is an MOU with the Police Managers Association um, to the tune uh, this year, I, I think it says of 696000 uh, general fund money. And so is, is there some Measure X sales tax money that will help pay for some of these increases? 
Um, well, I can't answer that question, sir, because Measure X is a general tax that goes into the general fund. Um, also, not necessarily all salary costs are general funded because police officers have other sources of funds, depending on what they're okay. working on, so, that they can charge their salaries to. Thank you. I, I know in other settings with similar questions, you've answered that because it's all cold mingled. Yes, there is Measure X money in there. So today's slightly different response, but that's okay. Uh, there are 21 approximately members in this group. Uh, if you do the math for this year, 696,000, uh, you divide that by 21 members uh, in this association. They will all receive, if this item passes tonight, about $33,000 in direct compensation and benefits. If you add the the various layers of increases is not just the 5% that I did support for POA. They have 5% for so-called compaction across the board. Uh, they have various other percentage increases for other things that when you add the third year of the contract, uh, it literally totals $80,000 per member over a three-year period with raises in excess of 20, 20%. Uh, that given the fact that they're already the best paid as managers compared to their counterparts. Uh, they, they're also in that department. We have no retention, no recruitment issues as we did with POA. Uh, we also have dire financial needs uh, across town, particularly to address the homelessness uh, issue. Uh, also, these various bargaining agreements that we're doing now, they all have different start and end dates for the retro, and I think that's unfair to the other groups that have shorter retro pay, pay, pay periods. Uh, and so for those reasons, I, I can't support that today. If it was really something that was, you know, a 5% increase, you know, I'd support that. But there's a lot of folks in Santa Ana, they don't make 80000 in three years. This actually would give them 80000 per member over that same three-year period. And I, I, I don't think it's, it's the right thing to do. Okay. So uh, we have a motion and a second for you to vote. Those in favor, press green. Do it again. All right, what's the next item, Madam Clerk? For, for clarification. Okay, thank you. Um, item 65A. All right. Um, the item two and three carries, but item one would fail. But two and three will pass. So there's no money for it. There's money Very for bad it policy in the doing budget, this. but it's not being transferred to the right accounts, which it can be done so throughout the fiscal year. All right. So we're on 65A. Authorized staff to prepare documents for proposed water and sewer rate adjustments at a cost not to exceed seventy-five thousand. I, I would entertain a motion. Motion approved. Second. Those in favor, press green. Next item, Madam Clerk. Seventy-five A. Okay, we have Loretta um, Shuwari or Shawari wanting to address us. Please come on down. Good, good evening. Thank you for having this meeting for a voice to be heard. Certainly. Okay, well, my concern is I've been living in this area for more than 30 years. Okay, I've never seen it so congested. As you all know, you said all the neighborhoods are congested. I don't know if this area has been addressed. Uh, the congestion has started when Cafe No, the cafe that was built right on the corner of Fifth and Euclid, there's 15 parking stalls. And during the week, there's probably 25 plus customers. On the weekend, there's 35 plus customers out of 15 parking stalls. The overflow goes into the parking lot where the 402, 402 medical building is going to get built. 
I addressed it at the board meeting with the Building and Planning Commission. How many parking stalls are going to be in the medical building? There is going to be 19 parking stalls. Out of the 19 parking stalls, how many staff members? What is the capacity of patients for the medical building? Um, what is the solution? If it's overflow of parking, what's, what are you going to do with the residential? When I have family parties, like for Christmas gatherings, Thanksgiving, there's no parking. Is there a solution for that? Yeah. I don't know. That's why I'm here to voice my opinion on this. Thank you. Okay. Any other speakers? No other Seeing comments. no one, I will close the, uh, I was asking the audience. Seeing no one, I will um, uh, close the public hearing and bring it to council for consideration. I would entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, I have some comments. Go ahead, please. Um, with uh, Madam City Manager, I had some, some comments in, in um, with the, the single family homes that back up against this property. What kind of a, of a setback are we, are we approving here for between the, the single family homes and the, the, uh, the property? Um, if you'd like, we have a presentation that happens to have a slide that will visually depict that for okay. you. So we can put that up. Good evening, Council, uh, Mayor and Council. The question, I believe, is the setback between the building and the residential homes. Uh, so between the building and the property line, it's approximately um, 70 plus feet. You have five feet of landscape, uh, 18 feet of um, parking, and 23 feet of aisle, and then between that and the building is you have about 10, five to 10 feet. So, what was uh, the total? 75, uh, you said? If I add that up, it comes to about uh, 60 plus 70 feet. And uh, the, the, the building, it's uh, three stories or two? It's a single story building. Single story building. Okay. The, the concerns that I have, and um, I've, I know that all last week, I was on the phone with you and the city manager and even the police department over the, the modern day parking structure lights uh, that are glaring into the neighborhood. We've addressed that issue, but I don't want that to, to happen here. Um, I think it's something that we got to look into uh, in regards to uh, the, any zoning or, I mean, I'm sorry, um, plan checks that PD puts in place or whether that's planning to deter crime and whatnot, to force these new developments to install very, very high voltage LED or, or uh, very bright lighting on their buildings because it is a nuisance and it does cause a lot of light pollution to people that live around these properties. Um, and I don't want to see that here. I know there's a parking lot and they're going to say, oh, it needs to be lit for security reasons and whatnot. But, you know, they've been sitting up against a, a vacant dirt lot that's pitch black for years. So um, what kind of, of lighting will you have surrounding this property? Thank you for the question. So our code does require a minimum standard for parking lot, which is one foot candle. Of course, that one foot candle is view differently when you have different type of lighting. LED are extremely bright, as you understand. Um, what we do have are mitigation measures that we can uh, look at, and those type of mitigation measures include using deflector to help guide the lights away from residential. Now, that does work when the light is of a certain height. Other aspects of that mitigation we can look at is to placement of lighting. So in this case, we can look at a lower placement of lighting as to not spill into the residential. Those type of notes will include as part of our plan check process to uh, ensure that we're sensitive to the neighborhood. 
the deflectors, um, from what I've seen, don't really do much of it, have much of an impact on the lighting, uh, as I've personally witnessed with the with the parking structure lighting. Right. Uh, so, you know, there's I know there there's always talks about adding green screening and 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 trees. And that's the same thing that was done in my neighborhood. But the thing is that they come in and plant these itty bitty trees that are gonna not cause you know grow in another 15 years. So I want to make sure that that some uh, green landscape is included to block any lighting or 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 uh, activity from that front building to the single family homes. There is a planter between the parking lot and the home, so there will be planting along that landscape planter to address some of the concerns you discuss. Okay, I, I just hope that you guys work with the designing of these lights to make sure that they're facing away from the, the single family residential areas and are pretty blocked from coming into the, the, the cause I, I know it's gonna, I don't want it's a year and a half from now be like, oh, there's this extreme bright light blurring in through my window all night long, I can't sleep, you know, help us. And, and I just see that happening. So if you could please make sure that's addressed, man. And Madam City Manager, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. No, I have a question. Go ahead, Councilman Iglesias. So um, looking at what you have brought up on your screen, um, Councilmember Peñalosa, so is that something that you could also, you know how we are requiring of 2525 for them to have big trees or something like that so it won't affect, uh, I guess, the residents uh, that are neighboring that um, project? Is that something that you can require of the develop, of, of, I guess, the owners of this project for them to put up trees so they won't be able to, I guess, for privacy purposes? Is that something? There will be trees located along the, the, what would be the west property line, which is against the residential uh, homes. H how high are the trees? Um, the initial size of installation is 24-inch box, would equate to about 8, 9 feet. Uh, some depending on larger size, they can reach about 11 feet as well in terms of initial insulation. But generally, anywhere between 8 to, to 10 feet would be a good uh, size for initial insulation. Okay. And then so we have enough parking for the purposes of what it is that they're going to be using it for? Yes. There's enough parking there? There, uh, the uh, square footage of the building dictates that they have 19 parking spaces and 19 have been designed into the, uh, the project. Is this, and I don't know if this is a different conversation, um, Madam City Attorney, but is this a project that you could also um, have some type of um, agreement with the neighborhood, neighborhood or neighborhood association for them to have, you know, added parking for their residents that are close to that area? Uh, this is something that the neighborhood can discuss with the property owner uh, as part of this approval process. Uh, we're considering the, the land use aspect of it and not necessarily the private use of the property. So that's something that we said that the owner, uh, once they uh, you know, develop the project, can work with the neighborhood to provide for some uh, private solution. So, but is that something that we can request of them, not can? I mean, is that something that we, we should facilitate? That's something we can help facilitate, but we uh, really are not in the purview of dictating uh, their private uh, land use enjoyment. But yes, certainly we can help facilitate yeah. the conversation. I, I would like that if we could have that as part of the process so we can help the, also the neighborhood and the neighbors feel comfortable with this project and build that relationship with that, with that owner, I think it would be a good place to start. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Any additional comments? If not, I would entertain a motion. I'll move it. I'll be happy to second it. Any additional comment? Not, uh, I personally, I think it's a good project. The building looks nice. I think it's 3,700 square feet. It's not uh, an excessive building or anything. I think it'll serve the community well. Yeah, I think that the only thing I was going to mention is to the, to the um, member of the public that spoke, you know, what's interesting is that this um, zoning amendment kind of goes contrary to what we've been doing recently, which is 
amending zones to remove professional office, commercial, and light industrial in place of mm -hmm. residentials. So we've seen that those impacts from multifamily developments have been impacting single-family neighborhoods, right? Um, so this one, I think, is hopefully a much less intense use. And to the extent that um, it's designed well, I saw that the building is on the corner, and so there is no setback on you know any of the right-of-ways, and the parking wraps and creates a buffer between the neighborhood and you. I'm hoping that's going to give you some relief and some comfort. But um, yeah, we've just seen just the contrary, you know, because really the highest and best use for a lot of our lands in open space has been residential. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, hopefully this will be something that hopefully you know, should it's a trend more. and it creates jobs. So jobs and taxes. Can I say something? Very briefly. <laughs> So it's another building. Right. Yes. Got it. But they were going into the overflow for OT. So look, we may have to come back and bring the other one, but right now what we have before okay. us is this project. But thank you for coming down. Thank you. Okay, those in favor, please press green. Okay, next item is going to be 75B, this time and place for a public hearing, uh, approved uh, zoning ordinance amendment 2019-04. Sections 24, 41, 45, 41 through 198. It's basically uh, uh, we're taking the same municipal code here prohibiting cyber cafes as a permitted use in the city. Um, do we have any speakers? Um, seeing no speakers, I'll nonetheless open up the public hearing. If anybody wants to address us, you're welcome to come down. If not, I will close the public hearing bring it to council for consideration. Councilmember Jose Solario. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate the staff bringing this forward. Uh, we've had numerous very problematic cyber cafes throughout the city, and sometimes they're called cyber cafes, sometimes they're called other things, uh, but, but we do find them, and uh, working together, code enforcement and PD does, and the city attorney's office does an amazing job uh, closing this. They're awful often very involved because we have to you know, track down the property owners and close off utilities and a bunch of other things, uh, but they do it and do it well. But we know that uh, the problem continues and doing something along these lines, which would you know, prohibit uh, cyber cafes, I think is, is, is a good thing. Uh, and you know, I entrust that you know, the staff for things like you know, libraries or computer centers, you know, like you know, the FedEx Kinkos, you know, they obviously still have uh, uh, you know, computers and some may want to say that's a, you know, internet cafe, uh, but there's good detail in here and we will, uh, you know, try to differentiate them as well. Thank you. Okay, with that, Mr. Uh, Mayor, Councilor uh, I'd like to move it with comment. Go ahead. Um, move the item with comment. Uh, w in regards to the, the cyber cafes, I just wanted to, to make sure that are, are we basically just blocking and prohibiting any cyber cafes from opening up in our city again and with the definition of, of that we included here and not to include uh, you know delivery services and whatnot correct so in the past you did a moratorium on them and you studied them quite lengthily and what you're doing now is you're actually prohibiting them within your municipal code so permanent moratorium in other words okay that's good uh, which I'm happy to see and like Councilmember Solodio said I'm sure staff and along with Alvaro and PD and code enforcement, we'll, we'll be on top of any of them popping up illegally throughout our city. Um, just to, I know of one in particular next to Bristol Sound on Warner and Center. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Bristol and Center. Uh, uh, Central. Yeah, Central and, and Bristol. A friend of mine uh, called me while he was in the parking lot of the coffee bean, and he said, hey, where was that, that cyber cafe, illegal gambling cyber cafe that you talked about. I was like, oh yeah, it's right there next to the Bristol Sound. I was like, it's, I guess it's like nobody knows about it, but it's there. And then he said, well, there's three lucky sevens on the, on the front window. How is it secretive? <laughs> you know, that is like literally slapping us in the face, you know, and that's what I've noticed with these places. They're not very secret and they're not very, uh, and I'm not sure what kind, and I know uh, Alvaro has a plateful and, and with PD and going after these, these different, uh, 
code, uh, cyber cafes and illegal cannabis shops and whatnot, but uh, would, I don't know why that one's still operating. I could probably clarify that for you, Council Member. You do have businesses that were permitted before your moratorium and before this prohibition, so they're grandfathered in. They cannot expand. If they close down for greater than a year, they cannot reopen. And obviously, if they are determined to be engaging in illegal activities, action would be taken. But if they solely operate as a legal cyber cafe under your old ordinance, they can exist. Okay. Because uh, I also know that, that two council candidates live up against that cyber cafe. They're neighbors, which is weird. But um, I, I, uh, they've, they've both brought it to my attention of the activity that goes on till 4 in the morning every night. Uh, the, just the yelling, the fighting, the shouting, the, the drug use, the, the smells. And that, I'm sure, is not permitted. The they activity. might be violating. And it, it happens nightly in that. That, that whole business center where the, where the medical offices are and the coffee bean, that's a dark... Uh, Alvaro, that's code long, enforcement. So, but, so I'm happy for this. Uh, let's, let's close them all down and uh, I'll move the item. Okay. Uh, we have a motion, but and quick I'll comment. Second, and I'll second it. You'll second and a quick comment. Okay. So, so my, my comment is going to be, and I, think, and I believe I spoke to you, uh, Madam City Attorney, um, not only is it affecting you know, the, the neighbors, but it's also affecting the, uh, the coffee bean. I think that's the coffee bean that's in front of it. Um, the one that's facing the the hospital. I received calls from the from the owner of the coffee bean and also the manager that they have lost business in in that uh, area because uh, their employees don't feel safe um, closing later on at night. So they're closing even early because they don't they don't want their employees to be you know exposed to these unsafe conditions. So I'm glad that we're looking into it, but um, if you could follow up with that, uh, with that owner, I would really appreciate it from the coffee bean because they've been adamant that it's, it, their business is, is being affected because of that. And then, um, so I know Alvaro is here, but I don't know if you can tell us how soon you're going to be lo looking into going. Tonight in at 4 a.m. Yeah. Is, is that something that you could tell us now, or is that something that is... Um, how about okay. it? Come on up. We don't get to see you very yeah. often. Yeah, and I'm glad that you're here, Alberto. You're wearing a nice suit and everything. Let's advertise our crackdown plan. <laughs> right. <laughs> tell everybody. Tell how them what time, tell them what time we're going to be there. Your secret yeah. plan. Well, if you can look at the list, we actually yeah. closed right six out of eleven. So where we can use um, some of the other. SEMC sections that we adopted so that if folks operate outside of the approved use, then we can void the certificate of occupancy and we can go ahead and um, revoke their approval, which is okay. what we're doing in some of them. Well, we can disconnect utilities, we can do that. Okay. In this case, it's not easy because they have a shared meter. And then we're also working with the police department and another more yeah. bigger type of yeah. investigation. And I'm not, I don't mean to put you on the spot and tell you like what the plan is, but I want you, you know, to just kind of explain the process, what happens when you do this, because sometimes, you know, we see this for months and it doesn't, it seems like nothing's being done. Okay. Well, I'll say it like this. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're tracking probably 42, yeah. between 35 and 42 actual properties. Mm -hmm. And so to the extent that we make the inspections and so we notify the property owner and we provide notices, so and so that then sometimes it's a you know cat and mouse game where some folks do remove the part of that attraction that's the illegal gaming. Mm -hmm. Why we work very closely with the police department, so where we can make the most impact. That's what we try to focus. In this case, we're only talking about cyber cafes. Okay. So we are aware of the ones on um, the two on South Bristol. Okay, nice. And we are working very closely with the police department. Some of the property owners have taken. Um, uh, through the course to the unlawful detainer process, which takes time. And so for us, that withheld sometimes our enforcement efforts. Okay. Because again, there's a legal process. You actually have folks with legal tenancy rights. And so we're combining that with our enforcement efforts and with the police department. So we do have a strategy where we think we can be successful. No, and, you, and you've been very um, instrumental in making a lot of changes and a lot of things. So thank you. How about it? Can you put the other mic down, the one on this side? Down. I keep asking the clerk, and it keeps going up. There you go. Thank but, you. Mr. Mayor, before we take the item up, I just wanted to prop these guys up for a little bit because 
Um, you guys did a really, really huge service to a neighborhood association that I represent, which is Grand Sunrise. And they had a cyber cafe right on Grand Avenue, just north of the 5 Freeway on the west side. So to the chief, to everybody else that was involved, we had a, you know, a big neighborhood meeting. They all came down here and we spoke. And it was a matter of weeks that you all resolved the problem with the city attorneys. Uh, staff, with code enforcement, with PD, everybody else involved. So that was a very, very efficient and effective way because that wasn't just gaming. That had a lot of right. peripheral nuisance was impacts. Happening in the other that companies. was right up against single family homes that were being impacted. People were like going over the fence and, and yes. hanging out in the backyards of people who lived there. So um, you guys were very effective there. And, you know, to the extent that becomes a template or a model for use, right. um, kudos. That's a. Uh, this that's is one of our priorities. We are focused on it. Yes, stay up there. I'll uh, bring the mic up so you can talk some more. There you go. Go ahead. Before I forget, um, I know that I, I've had conversations with, with you and might have been the chief a couple months ago about, about storage of the Cyber Cafe uh, uh, electronics that, that they're using. Um, I, I want to make sure that that doesn't, running out of space to store these things or, or doesn't keep us from, from enforcing and cracking down. I want to make sure that, that we uh, work together. If, if we need to find some money to find some, some storage units or warehouse somewhere to, to store all these, uh, has that been a problem with, with storage? Not anymore. Yeah, no, we've resolved the issue. You did? We did. What, what was done? Was it a additional? We've resolved the issue. <laughs> it's a secret plan, but yeah. it's been done. <laughs> all right. If you want more information, well, just, you just so that, that you know, right. these, these these machines are evidence of crimes, oh, and right. so we've resolved. Okay. We've resolved. Okay. Okay. Issue's been resolved. Fair enough. Thank you, Councilario. Stay you. up there, Alvaro. You don't know what's thank coming. You. Thank Thank you so much, uh, Code Enforcement Manager Nunez. Uh, since we're getting to specifics, I know for my part of town where we were closely watching, uh, you all helped close down uh, uh, one by floral. Floral Park and West Floral Park on, on West 17th Street, uh, one on East 17th Street next to the norms that many of us go to on, on, on frequent occasion, and at least one on North Grand Avenue. Uh, and I know that many of our constituents and myself and the council and the staff are, are very happy with that. And uh, oftentimes they weren't quick and overnight, but they, you know, you followed the process, you dealt with numerous departments here in the courts. Uh, so th that was awesome. For as small as your group is, the amount of work and the type of work is amazing. Uh, I'm pleased that our council and staff, uh, you know, were able to find uh, resources to grow the, the code enforcement department by, I believe, four officers four. this year. So that's awesome. And uh, uh, I can only imagine what more we can do with additional personnel. Thank you so much. Well, Alvaro, since everybody's saying good things about you, how can I uh, just sit here and watch? Um, so, no, you do do a great job. You know that. You don't have enough staff. We all know that. You balance things out. We try. Very tricky job. Try and explain things to folks. Get those that want to comply to comply, and those that are just not going to, you know, you know, getting tough with them. But you do a very important balancing act in this community, and sometimes we don't have a lot of problems. Because of all the things you already solved. We try. Yeah, you try. It's kind of like what Kaminsky says all the time. Uh, you know, he's out there solving problems all the time that uh, before they get big, right? And that way the chief doesn't even hear about it because you already handled it. He's a deputy chief. And then, Sonia, the way you said it's been resolved, what did you say exactly? Because we could send you to Washington. Just keep that in line. <laughs> Just keep saying that same line. Thank you, Alvaro. Thank you. Take care. So with that, I think we have a motion and a second. Those in favor, please press green. All right. What's next, madam? City clerk. 85A. Don't we have to do the housing authority? Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. All right. The housing authority. I'll call the housing authority meeting to order. And we have no excused absences. Um, we have to approve the, the special mi uh, minutes. So I would entertain a motion on item number one. Second. Those in favor, please press green. Next item is going to be 
we don't have any housing authority member comment, so we'll dispense with that. And I'll reconvene the, the council agenda, and we'll go to item 85A, and council member Iglesias, please. We have uh, Bomarco Vicente, I believe maybe at uh, Vicente Bomarco. And then we have uh, Eric uh, Garcia, I believe it is. And then Jackie Cordova. Please hi. go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is Bumado Bomaro Vicente, and I'm currently a fellow with Chispa. I was born and raised here in Santa Ana, Santa Ana, California, and I was, I was very fortunate to, send, to attend UC Berkeley on scholarship. It was that time at Cal I was appointed to, to serve on the City Police Review Commission for the City of Berkeley, one of the first police oversights in the country. I served for two terms as a Police Review Commissioner for the City of Berkeley. I was able to work on policies relating to use of force, body cameras, deployment, etc. I sat on police case hearings and made recommendations to hold officers accountable for police misconduct. This commission allowed the community to gain a sense of how their police is serving them. It helped reduce tensions and allowed officers to be honest with their intentions in patrolling. Lastly, it served as a platform to address the distrust between police and residents. My time on this commission provided me such an invaluable experience and allowed me to see the power of civilian oversight. Coming back to Santana, I am seeing the lack of accountability of our police. Santana Police remains one of the leading agencies in Orange County for total number of fatal incidents and police shootings per residence. Police oversight commissions help address and ensure accountability and transparency is vital among police departments. Values our police department does not have. It is imperative that the city council take action I hope you all make the right choice in ensuring public safety and accountability is present in our city. <laughs> Thank you. Go Bears. Next speaker, please. And then go ahead. I do have. Uh, so uh, two years ago, uh, these conversations were prompted uh, by the council and mayor. And at the time, uh, my name's Eric. I'm with the ACU of Southern California. And at the time, we submitted a letter of support, sort of outlining some of the uh, basic principles that we believe um, to be essential to have an effective and meaningful oversight body. And so I did bring hard copies. I also emailed them. Um, so you'll have access to that um, in case folks. I know the council might have changed. and so. And so I, I think just the, uh, I think it's important to sort of understand that uh, police officers, uh, w whether or not they exercise that power, I think it's important to understand that police officers are the most powerful public employees, right? Society has bestowed upon them the right to take life, right? Whether or not they exercise that, I think these sorts of incidents and incidents when that happens need to be looked at and taken very seriously. Uh, and to that end, I think um, the need for our oversight is, is particularly, at least in the state of California, profound because of the secrecy that's built into California state law, right? Uh, fortunately, that sort of, um, we, made a, we made a step forward with AB 392, um, the, the right to no bill. Um, and so that sort of uh, is changing, and, and there, the state of California is moving toward this, right? But I think this is an opportunity, a unique opportunity, right? Because I know Anaheim is, is lauding itself as sort of being the first of its kind in Orange County, right? But as somebody who regularly att attends those meetings, right, there is still very many flaws um, and, and issues that are outlined in the letter that I've shared with you that Anaheim did not adopt, right? Uh, primarily the, right, the, 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 the power and give the power, the, bo uh, the board the power to, to call and investigate officers and in critical incidents. Um, and so I think, uh, I think that we then we believe and we continue to believe that an effective and meaningful oversight board needs to have the authority to independently investigate critical incidents, policies, and practices. And then just moreover, the board must inform the public on their findings. I think something that, that Anaheim um, on that regard is lacking.
lacking is that it's uh, those meetings are uh, sort of riddled with presentations as opposed to reporting back on findings of critical incidents, which is ultimately what we aim to, to achieve with civilian oversight and transparency, right? And so I think any, over, uh, any oversight board should include a mechanism by which the recommendations are seriously considered in ways. Oftentimes what we're seeing is that a board can do all its due diligence, make recommendations, and ultimately the chief can say no, right? And so I think the board needs a mechanism. What that looks like, I think, is up for account. It could go so far as to say the board has a weigh-in on whether or not the police office, uh, the, the police chief is fit um, to, to, to help move progressively on oversight, right? That is up to you all and, and how you all want to hold that, uh, that person uh, accountable, right? But to the extent that there needs to be a mechanism by which the recommendations are seriously considered as opposed to, we, and Anaheim, Anaheim is going to be releasing their report and so we'll get a chance to see what recommendations have been made and what, um, what sort of, ha but to my understanding today, there has not been right, a single sir. recommendation that has made it to the desk of the chief, right? And so just thinking ahead of these things. Thank you. Uh, Jackie Cordova. Followed by Perla, and then after that is Laura Perez. Good evening. I am Jackie Cordova. This message is mostly for Solorio and Pulido, who have left the stage here. I am a mother of Santa Ana. I am here on behalf of the Truth Disclosure. In God we trust. I invoke Archangels Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael. We pray for the Church of the World. I would like to dedicate this meeting in honor of victims of terror and gun violence. I would like to acknowledge the victims of the terrorist attack Las Vegas shooting two years ago on this date, October 1st, 2017. I would like to apologize on behalf of Santa Ana for our part in these terror events and the blood on our hands for these orchestrated attacks and using them for political gain. That was for the chief of police. I call for unity and the community driven solutions presenting themselves to you with accountability, communication and oversight. I call for an end to the corruption that we may move forward with a pure, clean heart. The people have spoken. We say no to David Benavides and career politicians. We say no to Jose Solorio and stolen seats. We say no to Miguel Pulido. We say no to Lou Correa and false flags. May the Lord rebuke you. Thank you. Thank you, Perla Dominicio followed by Laura Perez. Um, good evening, it's Dionisio. Thank you. Um, good evening, uh, Mrs. Iglesias, I wanna give you props. I know that you and I had a run-in at SAUSC, but I always told you I stand up for the right reasons. And tonight I am here to thank you for your initiative and to approaching this matter. Because it is not right for the SAPD to continue its dirty work and placing all you bendidos on those seats. It is not right that people are scared to call the police, whether because they're immigrants or because their, their living conditions are deplorable thanks to the decisions that are made in this chamber. You talk about homelessness and you talk about permits. The homelessness problem has increased in the last 10 years thanks to the development that you have had access to blocking and protecting our residents, yet you profit off of it. And it goes beyond 10 years, it's 25. And you expect our city to continue being quiet and leave you on that seat, and you are gonna fight the whole way, even after your 25 years are over, it's ridiculous. You need to do the right thing and just allow the community to come forward freely and not be scared of talking to, to the police. So again, I praise you, Ms. Iglesias. And like I said, I know we've had a run-ins, but I've always said, that respect should be said when respect is due. And you taking on this says a lot about your character. And I appreciate all the support 
and all of the Santaneros that have worked very hard here in the city, gone out to universities, and now are back. I have been absent from city council because I began teaching. I am now a special education teacher here in Santa Ana, something that I am very proud of because now I can start teaching our little ones about resistance and about the 500 years of history that we have of, and strengthen our ancestors to come up here and stand up and tell you that you need to go. Thank you, Laura Perez. Um, hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I didn't plan to be here tonight, but I was kind of dragged out of home tonight. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, Councilwoman Cecilia Gillespie. You've done an amazing job um, with the prostitution issue that we're, we're currently experiencing. Um, I'm a little sad in that Solodio's not here. Uh, you know, he's running for mayor, and this is taking place in his ward, which is really disheartening because he's taken no initiative to clean up, literally clean up the streets where my retired parents are cleaning, are picking up these condoms. Instead of him cleaning the park a month ago, he should have walked three blocks over and literally cleaned the streets. Um, I was really excited to see that there's a, you know, there's, there's a recommendation for a possible oversight committee. Um, I've, I've had really bad experiences, and, and I'm, I'm, really, I'm also disheartened that the city manager's not here because this recommendation was for her to, to consider. Um, I wanted to report that the signs that she put up three months ago have not been effective. We've had three shootings since then. We've had a police officer um, allow himself to be groped by a hooker. Um, I've reported the video to one of the, uh, the investigators, um, Barragan. I have not heard from him yet. Um, we have fire engines going by and waving at these girls, and I haven't heard back from the, uh, the chief of the fire department. Um, Mr. Villegas is part of an email where I said, you know, I'm ready to sit down with everyone in this committee. We haven't heard anything. So, you know, I'm here to sign up for this committee. Whatever it takes, I'm willing to, to step up and figure out how we hold your department accountable because you guys have done a really poor job. From your officers allowing themselves to be touched by hookers, and we have it on video, police response taking up to five hours to show up and clear the streets from these guys that are coming into our streets every single night. It's really busy right now. The girls are coming out at 7.30 at night now, since it's getting darker. Um, Kerminski, I, I mean, I don't know, you're about to retire, so you're just here waiting time out. All I heard from you when I gave you guys um, all of these, uh, you know, suggestions, uh, putting on the barricades, all I heard from you was, we'll see what we'll do. We'll see what can be done. And that's all. So, um, you know, sign me up for this committee, whatever it takes. Um, I'm willing to come to the table. I've sent out emails. Um, I have a few more to send out to Mr. Peñalosa, who's also taken a great initiative. And... Um, you know, if it takes going on council next year, then I'm willing to take out Mr. Villegas. All right, thank you. Your light is red. So with that, those were the last speakers. I'll bring it back to Councilman Ray Iglesias. So, thank you, um, everyone that spoke on behalf of the need um, to have this in, in our city. One of the things that I started um, researching when I, you know, when I became a council member was, you know, the trust and the our community has in our police department. I, I understand that we have many officers who are great at what they do, no issues, but then we have those that may not have the same compliments from our, from our residents, um, of them being you know, effective and really looking out for the best interests of our community. So, you know, I'm doing my research, I'm like, okay, I, I know that the, this has been done in other cities, and I, when I spoke to the um, city manager, you know, we, we looked at different areas where 
where this has been implemented, and one is really close to us where we are at, and this is the city from where you came from, Miss City Manager, which is Anaheim. And, um, you know, so in, in Southern California, we've, th th there has been civilian oversight of the police department. And um, Anaheim being the closest one, we've also had them in Riverside, Long Beach, and L.A. And then also nationally, there's different oversights, um, civilian oversights at the national level that they even have a national association of civilian oversights that they, that they meet on a yearly basis to see, you know, what's going on throughout the nation. And I know Anaheim just went to the one, it just happened recently in September, I think it was September 23rd, that they were in, um, I believe it was in Michigan. That's, the, that's where they had the, the conference. And it just kind of brings accountability to what we, you know, to what our police department is. And, um, and yes, you know, our police department, it, it is the most powerful department in our city, I would say, because, you know, we've as a residents and and um, voters of this city have given them that that authority, and which something that I, I am for law enforcement, I am for fair you know law enforcement that treats our community well, and I and I believe most of our our department and our officers have done that, uh, but just you know to to have this collaboration between our police department and also our community members, it's good to have an oversight committee. You know, oversight is good for anything that we have. We do have an oversight committee for Measure X. So having a civilian, civilian oversight for, the, um, for this would be awesome. Uh, also, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't want to see it where, you know, that we're trying to oversee everything that the police department's doing, you know, like with their, um, I would say with their, uh, when you go into personnel issues, uh, like into their discipline, or I mean, I, I think that's something that should be brought back to us as council members and things that we should be deciding on. But to the to the point that we we need one that is going to you know be the voice of our community that our community members can be voicing our concerns to them, and I believe this is how they you know how these um, uh, oversight committees are or boards are are put into place as like, you know, for, for the committee to reach out to them. So it'd be the, kind of like a planning commission kind of sort of, you know, they go to them first and then they, they come to us after. So um, I'll, I'll forward this to you all, which is a city of Anaheim, the police review board. It's like, what is it? It's police, police oversight made up of Anaheim residents, which would be Santa Ana residents, that advise and make policy recommendations to the city manager, who in turn brings it back to the city council. So they receive, they receive real-time input on major policy incidents, access to officer-involved shooting scenes, private briefings on major incidents, community concerns, and complaints. Um, the Santa Ana Police Department uh, responses to police recommendations. Uh, they'll review current and proposed police policies. And they will also report statistics on officer-involved shooting, uses of force, complaints, and recommendations for an annual report. And I know Anaheim just got theirs, and then the, the chief is able to respond back to the, the committee's recommendation on what they can and cannot, and then it's up to the council to, um, to say if they agree if, if they don't agree with the recommendation. So I would ask my, co my colleagues to um, please um, support me in this, because this is something that I know is our community has been asking for even before I was on the city council, something when I, when I when I, you know, as a longtime resident of Santa Ana, it's something that we've been seeing, and it's something that I know that would benefit our community. So, I would ask with this if we could rec we could uh, direct the um, city manager to start looking into um, uh, uh, research into the the oversight committee or the oversight board. Uh, consider establishing one for the city of Santa Ana. Thank you. All right, with that, let's uh, hear a comment from others. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So we've been down this road before here at this council, and, um, you know, I, I, I understand that the uh, city of Anaheim has a uh, oversight board or um, committee, but the city of Anaheim is not the city of Santa Ana. They have very different um, problems you know, issues, I should say. Every city has issues, including Irvine, and you don't really hear about it, but if they have uh, different types of crime down there that are, that are uh, you know, uh, problematic. And uh, the city of Anaheim, they have had some really problematic uh, issues with the shootings. They've had some riots. They were all 
within the same uh, time frame, and it, it was tough. Santa Ana is a little different, and you know we do have the DA's office that oversees this. We have internal affairs. We have the FBI. We have the grand jury from the state and the federal government. We have the personnel board here at the city. And we also have, which I think, well, the courts also, here the state courts. And then we also have this council. This council. We shouldn't have to go to the citizens to demand accountability when we already have that authority. And we should step that up. I understand that we have been trying. It's tough. The response times are low. I've said that. The response times are, are tough because we don't have the personnel for it. This city is very active. And I hate to say it, and I've been one of those guys that when I call, and four hours later, still nothing, and I call repeatedly, I shouldn't have to say, I, let me just say, state this for the record, I never say I'm a council member, mayor pro tem, or what have you. I never say that. You know why? I shouldn't have to, because I'm only here for a short time. I'm here for a while, because we're here to serve in this position, and then we move on. This isn't a whole career. There's term limits here for everyone. So... You know, if I can make it better, great. I love our police department. It's been very tough to vote no on the race. They do a lot of work. I wish we could afford it. You know that argument. But moving on to this, it's this council here that has the power. We have a city attorney to uh, subpoena these folks. And we have a, a good police chief. In my opinion, to make things better, we need to have more training and we have leadership. Chief Valentin has been here now for a, a little over a year now. So things, things are shaping up. I know that we had a different police chief and there was some, uh, some differences in leadership. And, and we need more officers and we're trying very hard for, um, for recruitment get to get them. Well, that's true. We just got to be able to afford it. You know where I'm going with that. So anyway, it's this council here ultimately that we have the authority. You know what I will say I'm in favor of? A chief advisory committee, if you get people from the community that want to advise the chief on issues, great. But how do we qualify someone to be on a committee here or that in Anaheim you have someone that goes and responds to a scene? I mean, are they an expert? Sometimes they don't know the whole story. And when it comes down to investigations, you got to be very careful. You don't want to mess those things up. And people have rights, including the officers, by the way. But this department has been doing the best they can with what they have. We've been trying to improve it for a long time. It takes money. It takes effort. All the agencies across the state and across the nation, actually, are having difficulties recruiting people, but especially here in this state because, you know, people smoke a lot of marijuana. So you don't qualify, and I'm sorry to bring that up. But anyway, getting off track here. But the, we've been down this before. There's a whole bunch of oversight already and just adding another layer I don't advise that but an advisory board for the chief yeah yeah we you know there was a study done by uh, UPI not too long ago and they were saying that we were having problems and that assessment was inaccurate it wasn't thorough our police department even the media knew that it wasn't accurate and you didn't, it didn't get out there because our Fine, police department has a good, thank you very much. There are, our police department is doing the best they can, and I support them, but uh, I believe that this isn't the most uh, effective way to go about an oversight. An advisory committee would be great. Thank you. Uh, additional comment? Councilor Solorio? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. As has been discussed, we've, we've, uh, we've heard this issue before, and so... Uh, some overlap with some comments a year or two ago. Uh, I, I do believe, you know, similar, similar to what Councilmember Viega said, that really this council hears the oversight board and it is an important enough function that we should be providing oversight uh, ourselves, and, and we do. But I also do think that we need to do more outreach with the community to discuss these issues because that's something that we're not. 
uh, doing. So, for example, I don't think there's a good understanding in the community on how we budget for the police department in comparison to the general fund. I know oftentimes I'll hear, you know, why do you guys spend about 50 percent of your budget on, on policing? And that's just because every, every city is different. You know, we're not like Anaheim. They have Disneyland. They have their own, their own utility. And so percentage-wise, it looks like they spend less, but per capita, they spend very, you know, very similar uh, amounts. Um, also, staffing ratios uh, related to that. You know, I've looked at national ratios, and actually, I've been working on a document that hopefully in the next, you know, two three weeks, uh, I'll put out. But we really have about half the number of officers that we should have when compared to like-sized cities a a across the country. Uh, also, data is something that, that's very important and how we compile it and how we put it out. Uh, you know, we're slowly moving towards more open data and, you know, we keep pushing our IT personnel and others uh, to, to go there. But there are always little issues. I mean, we found out, for example, uh, about a year ago, Mr. Krishmit, who's uh, there in the lobby probably listening, you know, he, you know, he flagged me that uh, unlike other cities, on our crime mapping tool, for whatever reason, we weren't reporting sex crimes. And that's wrong, especially if we know that there are issues of domestic violence, prostitution, et cetera, et cetera. And it took uh, several months, but with the support of uh, Chief Valentine, that, that did get corrected, and we do now uh, report that. But for example, I don't know if there's other things that aren't being reported. And you know, I in the community uh, ought to know that. Uh, also, I know from recent inquiries that you know, due to some recent tech changes in, in, in the police department, data and and how we share that with other agencies, there's there's uh, some issues there that we we need to rectify. And then finally, on response times, uh, that's something very concerning to all of us. And you probably know about six months ago, I. I asked our department for the past five years on, on police response time. On priority one calls, 911, used to be about six minutes and a half. Now it's a little over eight minutes on average. That's an extra minute and a half, and a lot of bad stuff can happen in, in a minute and a half. Uh, but I'm equally interested, and I'm going to ask for a response time for the other tiers of 911 calls. Because more and more, as I'm out in the community, the biggest frustration isn't that they don't like our officers. They do. It's not that they don't like our black and white, they do. It's that we're not responding. And, and a big part of that is, is staffing. We've been working on that. The POA contract that we did do is helping with recruitments of uh, new recruits, uh, laterals, and we're retaining uh, folks longer, so, so that's a good thing. But those kinds of things, we need to have an uh, ongoing dialogue with the community on. Uh, and I think this council should be doing it with the staff and our PD uh, in conjunction with the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Council member. Peñalosa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I just wanted to, to point out, uh, Chief Valentin, that I know that you guys have been doing a lot of investments in your training and de-escalation tactics, uh, simulators in the PD, uh, which I know, uh, you, you know you've only been the, the, the chief for a little over a year, but you're, you have a lot of uh, work to, I think a lot of, there's decades of repair to do. Um, in regards to the PD in the city. And I know that just, uh, I could speak probably for my colleague, Councilwoman Iglesias, I can't speak for the others, but I know that us too, we've been very uh, tough on whether it's the homeless issue or just police accountability uh, uh, behind the scenes. And I mean, just do a public records request act to see any emails or, or, or whatnot or, or conversations of what's going on and, and updates and statuses and why things aren't happening. Uh, the, one of the young ladies that spoke, you know, I had that, that same uh, request and just a uh, conversation uh, with the chief and the city manager just last week. And I know that the city council is a, an oversight committee. Uh, if, if this was a year ago when uh, Tony Rokakis was in office, I'd probably say, yeah, let's do it. But I have a lot of faith in the new district attorney as well, Todd Spitzer, who is taking no BS from anybody, whether it's a politician or whether it's a police officer, we should have accountability. So I have faith in that. And I want to see uh, what that's going to look like in the next couple of months, what that's going to look like in the next year. So uh, I, and those are all the, the comments I, I want to say is that, that um, I do agree with uh, Mayor Pro Tem Villegas 
in, in the current state of our, of our city's uh, various uh, oversight committee boards. Uh, let me l allow others to speak first uh, that haven't had a chance. Uh, do you want to say anything, Councilor Mento? Sure. So, yeah, we have been down this road before, and I remember being part of this discussion, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was uh, former Councilwoman Michelle Martinez who proposed this on an 85A back in April of 2017. And we um, supported her and gave direction to the then city manager to come back and um, bring back some findings, and I believe the city attorney also worked with um, one of her uh, deputy city attorneys, I think uh, Ms. Bogosian, to work with a consultant to talk about what this would mean. Because, um, you know, I think then we had a concern with um, what the funding level was and what the accountability was. Because if you think about public safety, it doesn't just incorporate the police, but incorporates also fire, which we outsource to OCFA. But if you combine those two expenditures, that's three-fourths of what the entire general fund goes to. So we have general fund monies dedicated to commissions for parks and rec, arts and culture, planning, um, historical resource, and for the largest expenditure, we have no commission where any, any members of the public sit. That's what drove my, um, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of decision to see about creating a commission. Um, also, you know, the risk liability issue, um, how much we were expending on excessive force cases, wrongful death cases. Um, obviously, there's so many things that we could look at when it comes to an oversight um, uh, relationship and something that we would start. It could be a commission. There are models that have an auditor designated that would oversee what the, um, what the conduct is of the department. Um, uh, you know, you have some boards that have investigatory powers. They have subpoena powers, and they're very, very, um, you know, strong. And there's others that are very um, passive. They have advisory roles. Um, so there's a litany of things um, that we could consider. But one of the things that we have to consider the most is that there are due process rights for both um, uh, officers, members of the public, and we have to respect those as we go through it. Um, I think that, um, you know, I don't know where this is coming from. I guess that's why it bothers me, because the context is a little difficult for me to understand. The dynamics back in 2017 were clear. We wanted to have some accountability. We felt that monies were expended at a very high level. We had some concerns from the community. We had some concerns from residents on, on um, relationships. So that's, where, that's what drove it. Now, I don't know what's driving it. It is very confusing. I don't see, I don't see the authenticity there, um, and I, I, quite frankly, um, am not really clear on that. So that's what I think is um, is uh, making me uh, consider this. And you know, to the extent that we can get more information, I think one of the consult, one of the findings that we had from the reports that was prepared by the consultant was that we incorporate the department and law enforcement into developing um, what kind of. Um, oversight, what kind of board, what kind of review there would be. And that's something I think that's missing, even though the chief I know has done a good job in providing us metrics with things that I know he and I have spoken with offline. You know, how the incident reports have been, you know, gathered, the data, um, the money that's been spent on, you know, excessive force matters, um, discipline actions. So all those things I think would be within the domain of, you know, a commission like this. But I think we have to do this hand in hand with, um, with the department. But Again, I just don't, um, you know, I don't know what's driving this, and it makes me question the intent. So um, I do have some, um, some very strong concerns with this. Uh, thank you. If I may, and then I'll go to you, Councilman Iglesias. I um, cannot support what's being proposed. Um, I believe uh, public safety is a different animal from any other uh, endeavor that we do here in the in the city, and I think it's our number one responsibility and priority. And so, we all have to be directly involved in it. And I think commissions tend to sometimes shelter or advice, um, and in certain places like uh, planning, um, you know, parks and recs, other areas, maybe it's appropriate. But in this. I think it's better if we're just directly involved 
all the time, if you will, whatever it needs. You know, the council is that, that entity. We are that oversight. And we have to spend extra effort and extra time all the time making sure that, uh, that the city is in good condition and safe. When I look at what we have in terms of officers, I know that we have less per thousand in other cities, but guess what? We're doing it better than other cities because we're safer than other cities. I know, I know, you know, some cities like a Miami or in Oakland, you look at their budgets and you look at their numbers, they're very inflated. They have a lot of staff and a lot of systems, but their citizens are in a condition much worse than anything we face here. So we are fortunate in many ways. We've had, you know, a long tradition of doing things well. And I think right now with, with the chief and your new contract and new city manager, technology that we're incorporating and using, I think we're on, a, we're on the right path. And so I think we need to continue that path. And I believe bringing a, a, a commission right now to advise us would not serve any productive purpose. So when we vote, when we vote, um, I'm ready to, to vote uh, against the, the recommendation if there, if there is any vote. This no vote. This is an action item. All right. But it's to give direction potentially to staff. My personal direction be leave it alone. Okay, go ahead. So um, I just, just to answer some questions that were brought up, um, the intent of this is to have the community have input on on what's happening with our police department. It's nothing that is ingenuine. I, I, I've seen it. I've lived here in Santa Ana since 1979. And, um, and, and it's issues that I see that are affecting our community. Um, I'm not, my presentation was that ultimately it would come to council because I believe that's the way the, um, the system is set up, especially in Anaheim. If I'm, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, it goes from, you know, from the oversight um, commission and then they have an outside independent auditor, which is OIR or something like that, and they're the ones that do all the investigations and, and, and all that when it comes to personnel uh, matters. But um, they're the ones that provide the oversight over what the commission, too, is doing. So it's something that goes hand in hand and it ultimately goes to you as a city manager and you would be giving us recommendation as a council. So I, I, there's a lot of things that, uh, you know, we could say that it's not happening in Santa Ana. We're just turning our eyes the other way. But there's a lot happening in Santa Ana that, you know, um, a lot of people may think that just because, you know, my party affiliation, I may be saying I always do things differently. But I'm doing it for the community, uh, Mr. Sarmiento. It's for the community that people have expressed their concerns. And that's why I have brought it up. You know, it's not to be punitive on our officers. It's to provide also a, a mechanism for them to feel supported. Um, because the, if having an oversight, you know, if, if nothing is going wrong, then what, what are we fearing? If nothing is wrong, then what are we fearing? So if we should have this oversight just to cover all our bases, have our community input, and also have uh, our police department being protected. So that's my, that's my intent behind this, is for us to have this. And it's going to be something that will prom promote accountability, uh, promote transparency, and promote public safety. So it's all that in place. So I just wanted to model something that has already been taking place in Anaheim. And, and it's been working for them. And we are very similar to Anaheim. And you know, there's issues that are happening out in our community that we choose not to, not to address. So. I'm hoping that you guys will go with my direction, but if not, then I, I understand your point of view is different than mine. Maybe we don't live in the same city, but I live here in Santa Ana, and I've seen it happen. So, so yeah. just, to, just to be clear, I'm not disputing the need for, the, for, for, the, for a commission or for a, uh, an oversight body or some sort of role, but... When it was brought back in 2017, it was driven by the community. So my recommendation would be, council member, sit down with the community and see what they're asking for and, and, and have it driven by a genuine need that you see. But work with them, work with the department, and if you can bring something back that can be reconciled, then I think that there is a role. But I think that bringing this, look, I have to question, I have to 
also consider the context in which this is written, in, in, in which this is brought. I'm not ignorant to what's going on. None of us are. So, look, to, to me, to question a person's motives is something that is vested to me by the voters. As an equal member of this council, I have to, I have to question that. So, to the extent that you're going to be genuine in your intent, demonstrate it, and look, win over the, the majority of the council, as we tried to do in 2017. We took it very far. We had, we had funds that were dedicated, and I, I told somebody that we didn't, but when, I'm, when I look back at the legislative history, there were funds that were dedicated for a consultant to study this. We were pretty far down this path. We didn't win the day, but we made the effort because we knew it was a necessary, at least it was a necessary and needed move. So, um, so that's, that would be my suggestion. That would be something that I think um, you know, we could do. But look, to the extent that I don't know what the dynamics are, it does make me question that. So I, I have to speak frankly. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro I have a question for Councilman Iglesias. So exactly what is the goal of the Oversight Committee? I know you mentioned a lot of things, but what is it that we're trying to accomplish? You said accountability, correct? Yeah. Well, I mean, I have a whole list of who holds them accountable. You think having a civilian oversight committee is going to change that? These people can go to help. jail. They can go to jail if they if they mess up. So I, you know, I'm just trying to figure. Uh, please don't interrupt. I didn't interrupt you. Don't interrupt me. Thank you. So please, please, thank you. So I, I'm asking a council member here. I'm just trying to figure out exactly. You know, I believe in accountability. But I, I just don't see where's the power behind an oversight committee. But but the process with an oversight committee um, in selecting them, it's it's a rigorous process. It's not just anyone that will you know be able to be part of it. So there, there's a process of you know who to select. So how do you um, qualify them? There, there's a process. So that's this is why I'm asking for us to give mm -hmm. direction to our city manager so right. she can go back and do the research and bring it back to us. Correct. And once we do that, I mean, what kind of power do they have? They don't put people in jail. They, they, they don't discipline they'll do recom anyone. Recom recommendations. We have, to, what about us? Are we like chopped liver up here? No, that's what I'm saying. We'll, yeah. we'll be the last Please ones. stop. We'll be the last ones to, to take action on the policy, but I right. believe Look, I we're starting to go around so, in circles right. This here. is what I was trying to get, the point I was trying to make. Thank you. All right. So with that uh, final comment, uh, yeah. Councilor Solari. Yeah, one last quick point. Another big improvement that we made since I first you know, got back on the council is uh, even though there was a small pilot program, we now have citywide, every police officer that's you know, out on patrol out in the community has a body-worn camera. And really, as a best practice, it is a good practice, and I'm glad that we're doing it, and it's been helpful for, for both sides. All right, so with that, I'm, I'm saying from my position, no. I think I heard a caution from Mayor Pro Tem, Councilor Sarmiento, yes from Iglesias, Jose, I think no, and David Benaloza, any thought? All right, so it's basically, you know, five to one. So with that, let's go on to um, 85B. Uh, work study session. No, oh. 85B. Oh, 85B. Uh, Brooke and Chris Schmidt. Hello again. Uh, so I just wanted to, I know this is an issue that I've talked to some of, some of you about, but it's definitely an issue that it is part of the countywide solution to a lot of the poverty related problems and kind of broader problems. And so really looking at the impact of people being brought to the jails, people being brought to specifically the jail in Santa Ana, um, or being released from other jails, but having their property still in Santa Ana and having to have the first thing they do be walk to Santa Ana to get their stuff back and figuring out what, what space there is for the city and other cities to help hold the county responsible for exit plans from the jail, for figuring out, just like when a person leaves a hospital, even more so people who suffer from severe disabilities, physical and mental health conditions, who may or may not have had a phone or funds at the time they were arrested, might have family or a home or places to go, but have no way to get there if there's no accountability for the county to ensure they have an exit plan. Um, so I think that's, that looking into kind of what those options are is at least in part what this is about, but I would definitely encourage the city to take steps to hold the county and the sheriff's department accountable for 
looking into what things it's doing that are increasing the pressures on this city and what responsibilities the county has in the same way that any other entity that takes ownership of a person has to have an exit plan to make appropriate calls to whoever's going to be picking that person up to provide taxi vouchers to get them back to where they came from um, both for for this community and for those individuals who may or may not be able to get themselves back to their homes thank you chris Good evening again. Um, I'm going to read something to you that was posted by the Association of Orange County Deputy Sheriffs on September 29th on Facebook. Three deputies injured during major disturbance at the Orange County Neighborhood State Prison, formerly known as the Central Men's Jail. Did anybody know we have a state prison in our city? Because that's what the Orange County Association of Shepherdy, Sheriff's Deputies is saying. I don't know if this is a joke or not, but this isn't funny to me. I fully support this agenda item. I hope our city, uh, you guys, direct staff to meet with the county and Orange County Sheriffs to create a memorandum of understanding on how they release inmates. I literally had to go out myself and figure out how they're released. Apparently sometime within this year they've updated their policy on how they release inmates from the central intake center here. People who are serving jail time in the jail are released at 2 or 3 a.m. But people who are just arraigned are let out between 9 p.m. and 12 p.m. People who are let out on bail are let out whenever. <clears throat> we all know we have a problem going on. We all talk about regional solutions to homelessness, but we all know the Orange County Sheriff contracts with 13 cities in Orange County, and if they arrest somebody, they're coming to the uh, intake release center. When they're done, they're shown the door and go, there you go, find your way back. I know this because I met a gentleman named Roger who knew how to get back to the Fullerton Transportation Center, and I had to tell him which train, well, which bus to take. Um, my other concern is earlier this year, the county and the sheriff uh, appropriated $9 million to increase the number of mental health beds in the central jail, which I'm all for, but you're basically turning the jail into a mental health facility. If a person was taken to a hospital or another medical provider, they have to have an exit plan on how to get that person back. They cannot just kick them out to the street. I believe LA Sheriff's Department has an exit plan under a consent decree. I hope we can get a copy of that so you can be provided to you to see how LA does it. I don't think it's fair for people to be arrested brought to our city and shown the door. I believe they should be taken back to the origin in which they were, the place of original where they were taken into custody. I fully support this. Thank you very much, David Penaloza, for putting this on the agenda. Thank you. And with that, let me bring it back to Councilor Penaloza, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This item um, 85B is to discuss and direct the city manager to direct staff to research and report back on the status of the central release of Orange County jail inmates and the location of State of California parolees in our community. This has been brought to my attention by dozens of residents throughout our city. I had questioned it myself, living here my whole life, and just seeing the, the severe impact that these uh, releases and the process and the way that the, they do it is, has had on our community and our residents in Santa Ana. Um, I'm not here to look out for the for the jail inmates and, and their well-being. I'm here to look out for the half a million residents that call Santa Ana home um, and, and pay taxes. I want to see uh, what, what the, the reports are, the, what the process is. I went to the Theo Lacey website. I went to the OC Jail website. I went to the, the Music Center and Irvine website. None of them had information on how their inmates are released. I have heard from uh, numerous people, uh, citizens, Santa Ana police officers, and a friend of mine who's an L.A. Sheriff's uh, officer who said that they're all arrested in numerous places in Orange County, brought to O.C. jail, booked, whatnot, and their, their possessions are taken, and then they're transferred either to, to Theo Lacey or, or if they're a, a juvie, a juvie they, they start there, but, or, or numerous area, or numerous of the county, county jail locations in the county. When they're released, they're bused back to the OC jail to gather their belongings. The, the, right now, I know that the music center uh, is going through an expansion. 
and, and it's going to get expanded and, and up to 3,600 beds, I believe it was. And, but my question is, when, how will those inmates be released? Are they going to be released in Santa Ana? Are we going to continue seeing them released in Santa Ana because we just you know, approved $3 million in workforce development for parolees? I know those were state, but that's the whole, you know, that's a two-part uh, section with the state parolees in our city. Um, I know that, that this is problematic for residents in our city. You know, we are seeing a, a severe impact in our community because of these uh, releases in our city, because of the state parolees that are brought to our city. Our city shouldn't be a dumping ground for other counties' problems, and that's what we have become. And I know someone's going to say, oh, if we, you know, seek legal action against the sheriffs or the county, it's going to cost us money. Well, we're spending already millions of dollars to fix and clean up the mess. We need to hold the, the county accountable. We need to hold the sheriffs accountable. We need to see the process they're doing. How are they releasing inmates? If, if uh, I don't mean to throw uh, Director Mendoza under the bus, but if he said that state parolees, but there's a law that makes them, you know, uh, having to be released in what county they were arrested, well, we should, we should look into that. We should look into see, you know, that residents that are, or, or uh, inmates that are released are released in, in the city they were arrested, whether it's San Clemente, whether it's, I'm assuming usually South County cities because that's where the sheriffs operate. And if they're bringing inmates in and then releasing them into our community, you know, that's, that's a problem. And not just the sheriffs, it's every police department in Orange County because a lot of them use the Orange County jail. And it's, uh, it's... Thank you. I think uh, you've articulated very well what you're saying. It's red. Why don't we let others give a little bit of input and then we'll bring it back. Okay. Thank you. Uh, comments on uh, what uh, Councilmember Peñalosa is suggesting. Councilmember Solorio. Yeah, just as a friendly suggestion, in addition to the city manager and staff reporting back on the status, maybe you can also have them look at some solutions of what we should pursue, whether it be legislation or, or legal action or other things, uh, because we know what the report is, you know, which are the things you've been mentioning, so, so you might want to give some thought to that. I know, uh, you know, the, the legislature for folks that are released from state prison have similar language like this, and the reality is this county board supervisor on their own isn't going to make a change like this, so unless if it's a, a legal action or legislative action, I just don't, uh, don't really see it, see it happening other than small little tweaks around the edges, so that's, um, that's the only thought, and, and I am looking at both the music and, and the other site because I know a couple of years ago when I looked up the similar information, they did have that, the information that if somebody was released, they can be picked up there at one of those facilities or from the central jail. So maybe they have since changed it in part because I know uh, Supervisor Doe has been looking at some aspects of this, but uh, uh, clearly there's more work to be done. Additional uh, thoughts or comments? I just want to suggest that um, Possibly we can contact some of the other larger cities in the state because I bet you we're not the only ones with this problem. Those that have central jails, often the counties tend to bring people from other cities to the central city, let's say, and then often when they're released, they, they have the same problem. I believe that potentially we could pursue state legislation. Some, you know, Somebody like uh, State Senator Umbra could carry that and force counties to have a mechanism where they would have to attempt uh, you know, to release people in the community that they were uh, apprehended in. Something of that nature that would have some teeth and all this takes money. You know, who's going to pay for it? Who's going to force them to pay for it? I think potentially a state law, and I know that takes time. You don't do it very quickly, but ultimately I think there might be a, a statewide solution that um, that could be helpful to us. Councilor Samiento, do you want to add anything? No, I'm simply supportive of having um, staff come back and report to us. I know that there was a, uh, a third party nonprofit provider that helps um, folks who are released. And um, you know, quite frankly, the legislature should have funded that um, ability because, I mean, I know with the, a lot of the early release programs, which was well intended by the legislature, they never funded the back end of it, which was to allow for those communities that were going to be impacted by the early releases to have some um, 
support system available to those folks who are being released. And so they're just out on their own. And you know what was once what was initially well intended turned out to be a nightmare for those communities like ours that have men's central jails. So um, you know I certainly would welcome the fact that you know some research is done, some options are brought back to us, and maybe some um, of those third-party service providers for this population, um, you know, as research and brought back to us. And All right. Thank, thank you to the council member for bringing this. All right. I think we have pretty good feedback. You, you got it? Yes, sir. I just yeah. want to give credit to our chief. He has already engaged in conversations with Sheriff Don Barnes, and it was a result of his conversations with the sheriff that changed the drop-off in the middle of the night, and he is continuing the dialogue with Sheriff Barnes on exactly what Council Member Sarmiento brought up regarding nonprofits assisting them or returning to their to their location of origin. So it Good is job, something chief. started, but I wanted to make sure he got credit for that. Thank you for that. So you'll be back to us in 30 days or so, or what? I would say two more. weeks. Do you want it more than 30 days? Um, he wants two weeks. What? Give me a um, reason. In a month's time. Okay, 30 It'll days. It'll be a better answer. But And it's important that we, we document conversations like this. If we have a conversation or invite the Sheriff Don Barnes and invite our state representatives, uh, state, assembly mer a mem state assembly member Daly, Senator Romberg, um, Congressman, uh, I know those are federal, but Congressman Ruda and Congressman Correa. Uh, Congressman Harley Ruda does represent most of the West Side, so we got to make sure that everybody comes and really uh, helps us, helps us really uh, address this because just, I mean, changing the time, that's not, they're still getting released in our city. And um, it, it's important that we that we really start holding the county accountable for for what the impact they're having. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So with that, uh, I'm going to go to the next um, item, which is a work study session. Okay. We have a speaker. Uh, Ty Fan, please. Hi again, council members, Tyviet Fan, resident here in Santa Ana. I just wanted to speak regarding the seals that you'll be considering tonight. I haven't had a chance to look at them yet, but I understand that we are deciding between a couple models for our seal. I would like to say that the having a seal is a great idea. I think it would look fantastic. However, I would urge you to consider e pluribus unum. Based on my comment earlier tonight about being an immigrant and being someone who came into this community, I think that that best represents who we are as a melting pot here in Orange County because Santa Ana comprises of many families, people of different backgrounds, different faiths. I was raised Buddhist. My husband was raised Hindu. We have, you know, family, family and friends who are non-religious, atheists, people who are Catholic, evangelical. I think that saying, you know what, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. I don't think there can be any stronger motto than to say that we as a community stand as one, we stand together, and I think that that would be a great representation for who we are as Santa Ana. Thank you. Go ahead, Paul, just go to the mic. Good evening, Paul Cook, Giles, French Park. Um, I don't know if it's appropriate to say this now or wait till after you've had your work study session so I can actually address what you're going to say, but in the interest of expediency, I'm going to speak now. In 1570, in England, Elizabeth Tudor said, I have no desire to open a window into men's souls. She said that as the wars of religion were raging across Europe between Roman Catholics and Protestants, I have no desire to open a window into your souls, but I can tell you that having been raised in an environment of, of active faith, expressions of faith in that environment are like the water a fish swims in. It's just part of the world. We accept it as a friendly, beneficent experience and move on. Not everyone has that experience. 
And I strongly believe that installing an overtly religious statement in this chamber, which is intended to be welcoming and empowering for all of our citizens, would be unnecessarily divisive and exclusionary. I don't think it's a good idea. I think the installation of the old national motto, e pluribus unum, would be a splendid recognition of the status of our city as a community of immigrants who are coming from many different backgrounds, many different places, building something new and wonderful. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Paul. So with that, I'm going to bring it to, to council member. Oh, you want to make a presentation? Go um, ahead. If I can do an interjection. So we did a work study session because we didn't receive a lot of clear-cut direction on exactly what style you wanted to do, which phrase you wanted to put up. So we're just very briefly going to show you other council chambers that have utilized seals and phrases. And then we have a couple different style choices to try to get better direction before we move forward with this, should you want us to move forward with it. So with that, Public Works Department's been working very hard on it. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and members of the City Council. Um, um, the, this uh, work study session will present to you display options for uh, In God We Trust here at the Council Chamber. But before we do that, I'd like to show you some options or some pictures of what other cities have done uh, in Orange County. Uh, this is the city of Buena Park. They have it behind them. This is the uh, city of Fountain Valley. Uh, it's on the outside of the uh, city chamber, council chamber. Uh, Irvine is in the behind of the uh, audience. Uh, La Palma is uh, in the back. Um, this is the city of Westminster. And this is the city of Your Belinda. Um, the options we came up with, we came up with five that I'd like to show you. Um, this one, option one, which is the motto and the seal. Um, it's on top, and the seal is sandwiched by the two um, seal, the city seal and the 150 anniversary seal, all the way on the top. Uh, option two is the motto and the seal, um, but uh, we have replaced the accordion door behind you with a curtain. Blue is an option for color. Uh, the third option is to replace the entire accordion um, door behind you with drywall and then we'll have the uh, seal behind you uh, on the drywall. The color can be changed, of course, or um, selected differently. Um, this option, number four, is the seal in the alcove. However, the, um, the In God We Trust would be uh, above on top. Again the color could be changed and the accordion door would be removed. Uh, this option is to replace the entire uh, background with wood paneling with the seal behind you. Um, all options include a recessing of a new large, uh, a new large uh, monitor that is going to be uh, installed here at council. Um, uh, in the future, in between, I want to say December and January time, the, the uh, TV screen there will be upgraded. Um, these are other treatments that we can offer or can be offered with the seal and the uh, In God We Trust. And there is also an option that we can uh, include the uh, E Pluribus Onum uh, in, the, uh, in the treatment. And uh, that's it. Thank you for that. Sure. Um, I know we're all going to jump into this in a minute. Hopefully we can resolve without too much discussion. But I think certainly uh, uh, e pluribus unum in a place like Santa Ana, which is so incredibly diverse, and yet we're always trying to come together to move things in a forward direction, I think uh, you know, makes a whole lot of sense for us to consider. So with that, uh, Ceci, I know you brought it up. Why don't you go say some words, and then let's let everybody have some input. Um, I want to thank staff for um, putting this together for us. 
Um, I like your recommendation where you have in God we trust and also the e pluribus sunum, at, you know, at the bottom included in it. I think it's it's a great um, opportunity for us to, like you were saying, Mayor, for us to uh, bring unity um, because we're a very diverse um, community. Um, I like all of them. I, I don't know what the wood if you were to put the wood backing behind this, I mean, how would that look different than the accordion panels that we have here? The options that were presented that have a new back wall would be, you wouldn't have accordion and it would be a brand new back wall in wood. Um, there is the prices listed on your the PowerPoint presentation. That would be one of the most expensive options yeah. is to replace a wood wall. Whereas keeping the accordion doors or doing a drape um, would be your less expensive ones, and then your your middle price one would be if we take the accordion doors out, but we drywall behind there. Okay, but um, I with the with the drapes, I didn't see the recommendation of having the e pluribus unum on it. We so. just did examples. You can pick and choose. You can mm -hmm. say, I, I like this style, but this is the phrase I want. I, I don't want the sesquicentennial mm -hmm. seal up. I only want the city seal. So it's just to give you options. Mm -hmm. I, I, for me, my, my recommendation would be to include both In God We Trust and the E Pluribus Nunum. Um, I like the way, um, I think it's La Palma, I think, has it that way in, in, the, in the things that you showed us the slides that we showed us. So I, I don't like their, you know, like their seal. I think ours is a little bit, it's nicer. Ours is nicer. But um, the, the way they have it set up, I think it's something that I would be supportive of, it being inclusive of, you know, the, the nation's motto and also the, the recommendations that came from the community member to include the pluribus unum on it too. So if my would be if we could go with both, put in God we trust and, um, the other e pluribus unum along with the city that would be awesome but is this going to be something that's going to be permanent or is it something that's going to be through the um the um, ones we presented would be attached they would be permanent okay until another council takes them away in a few years <laughs> you're so funny okay so yeah she thinks i'm funny <laughs> oh can i ask you a question councilwoman yeah if um so if you want both phrases and the city seal, was there a placement that you liked better in the different models that we had provided? So if we, I like it right here behind us. So it would okay. be here in the city council chambers back here. Up above, or do you, do you want the alcove changed out for it? I, I would say if we could include um, up above would be nice. Does anybody kind of want to... I take a little bit more time. I don't know if this yeah. is the best way to do things. Right. Having the city manager asking a question, we're looking around right. the room. I mean, you can end up with a weird building that way. Um, yeah. This is more decorating. I, I have a, Go some, ahead. some issues with, with just the cost of, of the, I mean, I'm in the wrong business. So these little gold-plated letters, I don't think it's real gold, but it's $35,000 to to put some letters up on the wall? That's a, that is a rough estimate. We will have to get some bids for the project and actual select material and finishes, and then we'll get you a, um, a more exact estimate. But we would like to show you probably a higher cost, more than a cheaper cost, just to let you know it's that not it, be five thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, it's... I was going to say, so see that you can do it, do it yourself, and go to Michael's and get some <laughs> some cardboard Come back. back. If you, if you got me, I'll but, my no, um, I I uh, definitely think we should, uh, you know, have more conversation with this and involve the community uh, because this council chambers is theirs, not ours, um, and just have a broader discussion of what exactly. Because I really do like the e pluribus unum um, in lieu because it's more inclusive of everything across the board and um, and that those are the the comments I if we were to go to any direction I do want to keep the accordion doors so that we limit the cost and just use that top part but I I would prefer a pluribus unum it's my uh, just to really be inclusive of everybody uh, which is exactly what that model means um, 
and th those are my opinions. So, so uh, definitely a, a more broader conversation. Maybe bring it up to the numerous neighborhood association meetings of what they would like to see if it's a good idea. Uh, put up a social media poll on our on our city's Facebook um, to see what what direction you know the majority of the city would want to take on this. I also, and I want to call on Councilor Sarmiento in a moment, but. You know, we have a pretty diverse community as we're talking about, Iplorizunum. I wonder some of the other faiths, the Buddhist community, for example, how will they think of this? Um, I think it's important that we try to get uh, different opinions. I mean, we recently had the celebration of the blessing of the city, and we had multiple faiths there. Um, it was a beautiful thing, but, you know, Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus and others. So with that, uh, Councilor Vince Sarmiento, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm, I'm, I'm having flashbacks to the meeting before last when some of these comments were made. I think that, um, look, out of respect to my colleagues, I think I dissent. I was the only one to dissent when this came before us initially. Um, and it wasn't to be dis divisive. It was to be respectful because I respect all of us up here. I think we're all people of faith. But that's, the, that's exactly the point. We're all people of faith, but of different faiths. We represent maybe you know Catholics, maybe Christians, maybe other faiths, but there are plenty of other faiths that aren't represented up here. And this is not our house. We occupy it to do legislative and government work. And we, I don't think that government or politics have a role in the church or any other place of worship, nor does that belong here. And I think that the two speakers that spoke earlier spoke extremely eloquent about what the point is of what we're doing. And I think that nobody disrespects religion. We just think that the founders, when they created our great you know, uh, governing documents, said there is a clear firewall between church and state to the extent that we can be as inclusive as possible because this is the quintessential town square. This is where people of all faiths or no faiths have to come before us and feel welcome here. And to the extent that we somehow, you know, ha make folks feel uncomfortable or not welcome, we're doing a disservice because these are their public funds that are going towards us, as little as it may cost or as expensive as it may be. But I do think that the two speakers spoke about not including e pluribusunum with in God we trust. I heard them say in lieu of, as the council member spoke, because I think in God we trust, to the extent that I'm a Catholic and I would like that, yeah, but I don't want, that, I don't want my views imposed on anybody that comes before us. It's already an intimidating environment to have them come and speak to us when they're here at the, at the podium and speaking to us on the dais. So um, I certainly would opt for, I like, the, I like the curtains, they're inexpensive, and maybe they'll create a nice contrast with us. Um, I like the seal. I can, I can support that. I can, I can get behind that. I really do like the e pluribusunum. I think that is a very, very appropriate way to um, brand our city and let people know that when they come before us, they, call, they all come before us on equal footing. And none of us is more valued than others. And um, that's, I think, who we've been. We have an extremely diverse city, uh, full of immigrants, full of different faiths. And um, we have a large, large community of folks that are not Christian and may have different beliefs. So I certainly don't want them to feel unwelcome in their house, because this is their house. All right, additional comment. Councilor Solorio, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, similar to the last two speakers, I like the idea of sharing some of these ideas with the community, getting, getting some feedback. Uh, this is the, you know, the people's house, you know, the people's uh, chamber. And so this, even though maybe not a you know, big decision for us, for the broader com community, uh, it is. Uh, I think most of us, you know, not that I've, you know, pulled the folks up here, but we're, you know, either Catholic or, or Christian largely be be behind us, but many in the community are not. Uh, and so I think we don't want to uh, offend others and we want to be thoughtful as we make this decision. So it's a community decision. I do lean towards e pluribus unum or, you know, the seal city of Santa Ana. So we can have some city pride. I think the city pride thing is always a, a great thing. 
Um, I do believe also, as I've mentioned before, that maybe in the lobby there might be opportunities for more educational materials, founding fathers, uh, in God we trust, uh, the history of democracy. I think some of the images as well had some examples of kind of freedom wall kinds of things. And that's the thing, too. Some of these things feel better in a historical context rather than just, you know, throwing it up on, on, on a wall. I would also like to try to keep uh, the dollars down in part, too, because I just feel there's a lot of unmet need out in the community and for us to just uh, spend too many dollars on our city hall um, uh, doesn't quite feel right. I, I would, lastly, on that same point to mention, uh, it would be my preference that we find capital dollars for this rather than Measure X sales tax dollars uh, because Measure X is commingled with general fund dollars, and as much as some folks may want to say, you know, there's you know, no Measure X dollars in there, no one can really tell you that, as we've heard now in multiple uh, sessions. So, uh, you know, I'm sure, especially if we keep the dollar amount slow, that we can find some unused capital dollars that could be used. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comment? Just really Who hasn't spoken? Has anybody not spoken? Go ahead, Mayor Pro Tem. So we're, we're ta I was out of the room, so we're talking about which. We're talking about what what display. should we do, or if anything. I like the In God We Trust. I like the blue curtains. I don't think people have a problem because it's on our money. They don't have a problem using it. I just went to the Capitol. I went to a, a, took a small tour there at the at the at the uh, Capitol. And there's people from all over the world, and in God we trust, everywhere. And they don't have a problem, and they're actually taking pictures and everything. I don't know what the big deal is. You know, it is a national model, so that's, that's my comment. Nice and short. <laughs> it's getting late. It's getting late. All right. Well, go ahead, Councilman Los, and now we'll go through and a second round. Just the, and then maybe just not include the, the 150th seal, because uh, by the time it goes up, it'll be 175. <laughs> Uh, from what I've seen, uh, just my opinion. So you know, it'll be. So let's not just let's focus on the city seal, and I prefer you pluribus unum. Of course, majority rules, and have that conversation. Thank you. So, just all right, Councilmember. So just Iglesias. for clarification, we gave direction to staff to go back and. Do this study, bring back, options. bring back options with In God We Trust, and um, they did that. They also added um, the E Pluribus Unum. So, why can't we do both? Like Councilmember Villegas was saying, this is in our city. I mean, it's in our national, it's our national mo motto. It's everywhere it's displayed in our, in our currency. It's also in other cities, so it's something that it's other cities. They're the um, chambers of the people too, so people go there. It's it's just I think it's the will of this council. This council doesn't want to do it, so just say that you just you're. I, I don't know what it is that you're afraid of, but um, from last we gave direction to the city um, manager was for her to go back and work with staff to bring us back in God we trust, and also you know now that we had that in information from the gentleman. Saying that e pluribus unum, I think it's it's good. We we could have both, but I don't think we should be going back on our direction and what we gave the city manager to do this. So I I, I would hope that we go forward and say we could do both, and we would be inclusive of everything and just displaying our na nation's motto. So um, I'm hoping that we do consider doing both and. You know, the, the, with the, the least expensive way to do it. Like I said, if you want me to, I'll draw up something. <laughs> I'll do a fundraiser for $25,000. I mean, if that's something that you guys want me to do, I will. But I think it's something that we should not go back on our direction because and I know the only one that stayed out of it was Sarmiento, uh, Council Member Sarmiento, but uh, everybody else, I, I don't know why it is that you're going back on your word. So thank you. I don't know that anybody's going back. I think we gave direction to explore, and now we're trying to decide. I don't think it, when I said go explore, to me it was just that. So is this just direction, or is there a vote here? Well, so far, it's work study okay. session. Very good. I can summarize what my understanding is, and you can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. Go ahead. Um, 
So I believe there is four that are more interested in only having E pluribus unum as a component. And there are two that are open to both or in God we trust on the phrase. Um, it seems like the majority really cares about the city seal, not worried about having the sesquicentennial seal up there. And that you, most of you like the idea of above, either, either with the accordion or a curtain. So if, if my understanding is correct, that's how I will proceed. Are folks comfortable with what uh, she is suggesting? The four that don't want to eat on them are. Um, the other two items that were mentioned was researching other things we could put in the lobby, and then uh, two also mentioned doing some type of a social media campaign. And may come back if, uh, you know, as we proceed, come back with dollar amounts so we have some idea what we're talking about before you go out and do anything. So before you go back, is okay, so I know Councilmember Solorio mentioned something about putting something in the lobby. Is that somewhere where we can display both in God We Trust and E Pluribus Unum? In, in, the, in the lobby? I'm sure we could find a place if the majority wants to have both displayed in the lobby. Are you guys comfortable with that? Putting it on the lobby? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. Actually, yeah. right above those doors on the, in the lobby. That's something, too, that I would... It looks nice, actually, to mm -hmm. walk it in. Okay. And we could do just the seal in here. And just the seal back here. Again, I think this is a dangerous way to do things. No, but it's, it's a work study, so it's something that we... Yeah, but, we, but that we're making decisions. We're not just studying. You're providing me direction, so I, I only hear yeah. two that are just interested in that option at this point. Just come back with options. And options in the... And lobby count term. to four. Okay. Yeah. All right. Crystal clear. All right, with that, city manager comments. Okay, I, ha I have a few because we have so much happening in our great city. So when you leave tonight, if you look over at the water tower, you may see that it's lit up in blue and yellow, and that's in support of UC Irvine's largest philanthropic campaign to date. It's called the Brilliant Future, so you can enjoy the additional colors that are out there. Um, Thursday, September 26, we conducted a down payment assistance workshop in council chambers and a total of 40 people attended. Um, we continue to promote the 150 anniversary event and there are mailers that are being sent out this week to businesses and to residents. And there's a coupon drawing for residents and businesses who can submit a chance to win a gift card. Um, additional promotions are happening uh, throughout the time all the way towards our big celebration, which occurs in October. Uh, mental Health Agency, I mentioned it in the homeless, but um, we did want to report back to you that we have drafted some letters. We've done research on it on the different code violations and all of the actions, so we'll have a, a more formal report for you as requested by council on that. And then there are a lot of foodie events in our city, so this Saturday we have the Taste of Santa Ana. It's in the parking lot at Main Place Mall. Um, I believe it's start, oh, tickets can be purchased online at tasteofsantaana.org. There's going to be raffles, games, and entertainment. And then Savor Santa Ana is on October 12th, Saturday from 5.30 to 9.30. And it's a sidewalk food festival that features more than 40 tastes from 46 plus restaurants in our downtown Santa Ana. And the tickets for that are $10 for five tastings. And lastly, I do want to do a big shout out to Daisy for working very hard at pulling together all the content for that homeless presentation. She had to work with every single operating department and crack the whip to get that data compiled for you. And this is on top of all of the other fabulous contributions she makes every day to our city. And that's it. Thank you. And the clerk, um, unfortunately, didn't give me this earlier, but I have them now. So I have a few speakers that want to address us on non-agenda items. So sorry about that, Madam City Manager. Brian Lottery, followed by Paul Berry. Also known as Lock Green. Good evening. Lock Green. Good evening, Mayor Polito and uh, Santa Ana City Council. My name is Brian Lockery. Um, I'm here today representing the Transportation Corridor Agencies. Most, most people know them as the Orange County Toll Roads. Uh, it's a public toll road system represented by uh, cities and county board of supervisors. You're represented here by Councilman Penaloza. 
and uh, we're here to uh, we're going to all the cities all the TCA member cities to let people know about the new sticker transponder that's going out to all of the um, uh, account holders uh, about 1.5 million account holders throughout the uh, uh, Orange County area. And uh, this new sticker, uh, folks will be getting it in the mail if they're uh, fast track account holders or express account holders. And it takes the place of the hard case transponder. Now, the hard case transponder, it, it may have a one, two, three switch on it, uh, which can be used in the uh, Los Angeles uh, uh, freeways, the 110 and the 10 freeway. Uh, and you can still use this through 2024. Um, however, uh, this is uh, interoperable throughout um, uh, the state of California and eventually will be interoperable uh, throughout the nation. So uh, uh, this is something that uh, I'm very proud of that we're uh, rolling this out. And um, uh, just to let people know, it goes, it sticks in either the lower left, the lower right windshield, or up by the uh, rear view mirror. And uh, once you stick it on, it can't be taken off, otherwise it breaks the transmitter that's in here. So make sure that if you have to peel it off for whatever reason, you need to order another one. Don't just re-stick it. And if you decide you don't want to use the hard case transponder, you have the opportunity to just to recycle it um, because it does have batteries. So uh, make sure you don't throw it in the trash to take it to household hazardous waste. So I appreciate your time and thank you very much. A couple questions. Um would it be possible at some point just to use the license plate and have the license plate registered so you don't do anything to the vehicle? And that uh, is, could be an eventuality. And uh, the fact of the matter is, once you go through the first time uh, through the toll plaza, this will pair up to your license plate so that, um, uh, so, so that it will be tied to your license plate. But, uh, in the future, that's certainly a because I think that would be ultimately much better unless you know you don't have this gadget, you don't have that decal, you just have technology figuring it out. Yeah, the license yeah. plates get damaged or yeah. stolen too. Though. There was a, that was the maybe the first question I asked when my first meeting back in January February was again it was a, a thing it's like why are we dealing with that little plastic transponder slides across your dashboard and <laughs> smacks your passenger or whatnot you know most of the time and uh and i was like let's you know put a sticker there the sensors that are inside books for security you know the same thing it's yep. very similar to that and and they were the ceo is nodding his head he's like oh we're, we're already working on that we're happy to have you on board because the board was kind of like eh, you know about it but I was like, no, nah, you know, but it was already in the works. So I wish I could take credit for it. But uh, it is a cool thing. Uh, it, it, it's very easy to apply. It's like a little Band-Aid. And uh, just like two months ago, my friends were all texting me. They were like, hey, did you send me this sticker? I'm like, no, I didn't, I didn't send you the sticker. They're supposed to be rolling out. But I hadn't gotten one. And last week, I still didn't have one. And I finally saw the CEO, and I was like, hey, give me, where's my sticker? So I'm happy, you know, to have them. You don't have to be switching. It's... It's easy, and, and the, the license plate thing was also a thing that I asked, and they gave me this whole legal answer about... Don't accept it. you got to keep and, driving the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So I, I think wore you the license down. plate, I, I, I'm not an engineer, but I understand the technology is just not quite there yet. Right. And sometimes you have to have somebody actually physically read the license plate, which is very cost prohibitive. Mm -hmm. rather than. But I think on the 91 Expressway at OCTA... We are able to read license plates. You can, and TCA can too, as well. It's well, just we read them every time. So yes. So you gotta. But it, it defaults. So yeah. if, if this doesn't work, it'll default to the license plate. But this is the primary way, but, and it's the least expensive way. Yeah, and this was also used so that you could go on the 91 Expressway and the toll roads in Orange County and go up to Northern California and be right. able to. Ultimately, you ought to be able to register your license plate and drive around the whole country. Well, yeah, but then it's different to toll agencies, and when they transfer your license plate to bill you to another toll agency, then hey, if the FBI data, can have crime stats on everybody, well, I, mean, in the I agree. Country. I'm with you. I was, I was, I had all these questions. You gotta, but you're a millennial. You got to drive the future. I, I Don't know. accept the past. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Yes, I'm Paul Berry. I'm a resident here. I came to rest right from DR Microgrid where I work. It's a company that's a startup. It's here in Santa Ana. We're in distributed energy, which is a, a, a term that everyone's going to become familiar with as things go along. Um, I uh, wanted to 
note uh, to everyone today, do we all remember Wings of the City? What a wonderful thing that was, the, uh, the statues downtown. It was just fantastic. Uh, it's actually been months now since that's been here. Uh, and it just points to the, the, the sophistication of uh, Santa Ana. This is a great place to live. Uh, also, I, just into the public record here, uh, we lost the uh, discount clothing store of Falas over the last year, and I, I know there's a lot of people who, who mourn that. That was a great uh, center for bringing a lot of people into downtown. Um, I've been here before on climate issues, and I want to uh, thank you all for endorsing the resolution on the uh, Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, uh, and Lou Correa just signed on that. Uh, I think that the city sent a very sophisticated and good message to the nation uh, that was not a unanimous uh, uh, resolution. Uh, there's a letter and a resolution, and I think that that really speaks to the, the uh, complications of uh, this sort of thing going forward. Um, uh, the high school kids in Santa Ana now are starting to organize to do 3.30 Friday uh, climate rallies uh, right here. And I uh, spoke with a few of them last week. They said they're going to continue to do that. So climate is an issue. Um, but what I've come here to do is to just ask uh, for the benefit of people who understand the CCA movement. This is the community choice aggregations that are happening. This is something that we all have to understand uh, when this is appropriate for Santa Ana to engage in this. And Irvine has got a, a process underway uh, it involves a, a JPA, a Joint Powers Agreement, and I would just ask the uh, City Council, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, that you would please give some direction to the City Manager and the Public Works Department to, to brief you all uh, so that you all know what's happening with Irvine. Uh, is, the, is this a moment that we should take advantage of, or what is happening over there? and also to seek the uh, counsel of other uh, elected officials in, in Orange County and uh, see where we fit. These are called uh, municipal uh, utilities or user-owned utilities. It's, uh, it has nothing to do with partisanship or anything. A business is driving this. Uh, and I just would hope that you'd, you'd follow through with, with something like that. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for your service and your stamina. It's fantastic. We have a 5K coming up. <laughs> right? When is that, Madam C? You sure? 5K will be on October 19th. Uh, starts at 8 a.m. We'll send out a press release tomorrow morning. So we can have <laughs> short time to train. All right. So uh, we have another speaker here, Bill. Conklin. Followed by Chris Schmidt. And Chris, you got to make it shorter because you've been up several times. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council members. Uh, my name is Bill Conklin, and this is my wife right here, Karina. And we have a family owned business in the city of Santa Ana. Um, the reason I've come to you tonight is uh, we actually have a, an appeal hearing date before the city council on the next regular city council uh, meeting date, which uh, is on October the 15th. Uh, we filed our appeal about 10 days ago, and we just got the hearing date uh, uh, from Selena Kelleher and the planning commission uh, today found out that it was on October 15. She was actually trying to get the date because she understood our circumstances. She was trying to get the date to be two weeks later uh, at the next council meeting. Um, so what our circumstances are is in June of this year, we um, made plans to go visit a uh, ill family member. She lives in Austria. Uh, so it's big plans, actually. We don't ever go there, hardly. Uh, but in the meantime, we've, she's gone from being ill to actually critically ill. And we don't know how to handle this because our tickets are scheduled for leaving on October the 10th. 
and the meeting date that we have set before the city council to uh, for our hearing for our appeal the, the hearing on our appeal is set for october the 15th five days later uh, we don't come back from austria quite that quickly so we're just asking it's a request of the city council to delay that hearing for our appeal uh, to the next scheduled meeting for the city council which again i believe is november the 5th you're a car wash right yes yeah um i believe that you have the right to appeal and that's what you've done um but you can't appeal you know for business reasons or trying to slow down a competitor or anything like that and i understand that's the nature of what is now occurring actually no actually no. because if you delay it further they're entitled to their hearing on the 15th and um and actually, you're now asking us to go beyond the 15th yeah actually it has nothing to do actually with business dealings competition um, I've heard, you know, what the market will bear, all of those things. It has nothing to do with those items. Uh, and Mayor, um, I just it, want to mention that because it's a quasi-adjudicative matter, you probably don't right. want to we, talk about the it's substance. It's not before us. So. Um, you might want to just address just, the time uh, just, issue. And just, all right, well, look, you've come down, sure. you've spoken. We can act or not. Okay. Uh, thank you. Chris Schmidt. Several months ago, um, my, one of my neighbors, Mr. Booker, said, hey, Chris, uh, several years ago, OCTA po promised us we would have concrete bus stop pads at all the bus stops along McFadden and Ettinger. And the next day, I went out, and I noticed they're not there. And there's asphalt that has spread out. My car literally bottomed out on one of them. I have a gutter that I reported three years ago that's defective, still hasn't been fixed. I'm a member of ETAC that oversees the city streets, and when I spoke to city staff, they said we barely have enough money to make all these repairs. Apparently, Public Works has a line item from Concrete Omnibus, and it's minimal, $250,000. I am told there is a list of requests to repair sidewalks and curbs, and we're not fixing them. When I spoke to OCTA, they told me, go back to your city. They have to spend their money to fix it, not OCTA. And I'm concerned because of what happened earlier this year with OCTA regarding M2 funds. I don't like it that we're being charged stuff and we're being told we're going to fix it and it never gets fixed. I would appreciate if somebody can find out when these bus pads will be installed at all the bus stops along McFadden and Ettinger because Mr. Booker said he never got an answer from the city. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members and staff. Uh, I'd probably be a little remiss if I didn't say uh, I'm opposed to 2525 project, but uh, I'd also like to say that uh, it was refreshing to hear you guys have the flexibility to award guarantee Chevrolet the contract. I think that's a good thing, and I'm glad to see that we're not as rigid as some people think. Uh, I'd also like to say that the uh, presentation on the homeless was very good. Uh, it was very informative, and I think uh, if people who are, are watching it, they'll get a lot out of it. Uh, along that line, uh, Park Santiago Neighborhood Association is having a park, essentially a Santiago Creek cleanup on October 12th. Uh, we've always had great cooperation from the police department, specifically uh, Sergeant Blake, uh, he's been very helpful in getting that uh, assistance that we need for cleaning up as far as trucks and everything else. Uh, if there's anybody else in the city staff that can help us out even further, we provide the manpower, but uh, there's a lot of stuff that we usually clean up, a lot of mattresses. I know the city's gone down there uh, before, but they just come back two, three days later, and I'm sure we'll have... Uh, several truckloads of stuff that we haul out of the river and so like i said if there's any other assistance that can be provided uh, we'd appreciate it and they can either get in contact with me or uh, our president uh, michael Valle. so thank you thank you let me now bring it to council for comments uh councilor vince sarmiento please thank you mr mayor and i'll be i'll be brief i i wanted to 
um, just say thank you to staff and thank you to all the speakers that came before us tonight and give a shout out to a couple of officers whose name I didn't, uh, I, I wasn't able to, um, to ask uh, for. Um, they came to my home because they found somebody going through my mail. And, um, you know, my mailbox is kind of set out right by the sidewalk. They saw somebody rifling through it and taking out some of our, um, some of our correspondence, and they, you know, uh, apprehended him, de detained him, and they came to the front door and asked if, you know, they were, you know, they resided there. And you could tell it was somebody who wasn't well and who needed some assistance, and they were very decent with him, but they did their work, and they came up, and I told him, you know, I didn't know him, and, yeah, he didn't have my consent to go through my mail, but it also is a federal offense to go through somebody's uh, mail. I didn't want to press charges, but I think the way your officers handled them, Chief, was, uh, was very humane and decent. Um, but that's the kind of thing that we're dealing with, right, where, you know, folks just aren't well. Um, I don't think there was any maliciousness involved. I just think the man didn't know what he was doing, and he, was, and he said it was his mail that he was getting. And so um, it's unfortunate, but that's what some of our residents are dealing with. So I think the, the presentation on the homelessness problem, the work that's being done, um, you know, we have, I think all of us have real life experiences of our, you know, contacts and, and, and people that we know in the city that have been dealing with that. So that was, you know, one comment. My, my last comment was, um, you know, I've been approached by many folks in the downtown who are being impacted by the construction that's taking place uh, for the light rail on 4th Street. So they um, uh, have had reductions in their revenues to the extent of 30, 40, 50 percent in um, um, customers and sales. So um, I don't know if, if OCTA has um, considered maybe providing some relief during that time when the construction take pla takes place, because I know it's being done in phases, but even if it's construction that's done maybe east of where a business is, it still prevents folks from getting in easily to those um, businesses that are used to having parking front um, and, 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 and traffic going through their um, corridor. So um, maybe, Mr. Mayor, what, if you'd like, maybe the council uh, with the city manager's assistance can draft something or approach OCTA to see how we right can Right now we're compel planning them. a meeting with OCTA and the businesses, city manager and myself. What I think might be appropriate, let's do that meeting and get back to the rest of the city council. I know what I know you're you. doing everything you can. I just think to the extent we can support you in those a absolutely. discussions and that advocacy, and I know it's council member Peñalosa's district. I don't want to speak out of turn. I just know that we, he's probably been approached as well. Oh, I have. So Believe to the me, extent that we can all kind of, I think, coalesce on this and work together and coordinate, it's more just being fair and, um, it, you know, seeing that there is going to be disruption to those businesses. And I know a couple of them are considering leaving. Some of them have closed. And that's the last thing that we want because ultimately the streetcar will be an enhancement and an but added value to the folks. But during that time, it's going to be very difficult. So whatever we can do, I just wanted to offer up my Thank support. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I got a report out that I uh, was in Washington, D.C. last week. I met with Senator Feinstein's office, the legislative uh, personnel, and uh, I thank them for the support on our Homeland Security grants. Very important that we receive those funds because they, uh, they're good for us regarding uh, law and fire and emergency response, active shooter and anti-terrorism. Uh, we are the county seat. I know Disneyland is up on the priority list, but we do have uh, to be prepared to, to help out. Also, uh, we spoke about the, uh, I gave them a report on how our uh, cult team works on the homeless issue. And uh, of all things, uh, they brought up the needle exchange program. So we had a discussion on that. And we talked about FEMA, how we could use some FEMA funds. And we also, I gave them an update on where we stood with the recent changes on cannabis and uh, the gentleman that I spoke with was someone that came out here last year, and he was up and down the state visiting all the different uh, cities. And uh, he came to Orange County, and uh, he had a lot of good questions. I was uh, very surprised. He, he knew an awful lot about what was going on, and his, I could tell these people work a lot up there. 
but I really, really enjoy being up there. Also, I met with Congressman Correa, and we talked about homelessness, and we talked about grants, we talked about the different laws that they could possibly change here in the state uh, regarding uh, mental health issues, like, uh, you know, follow-up, and because, uh, you know, the mental health issue and the homelessness, you know, a lot of it, uh, you know, goes hand in hand. And then we talked about the Family Justice Center and how he is supportive of that. And, um, you know, I also met with Holland and Knights, our lobbyists, who were setting up these meetings. And, you know, we have to go by their schedule because they're so busy going in and out. Congressman Correa did actually take me to the um, uh, House Judiciary Committee. Well, he was uh, actually working, and he got off the dice, came out, and we talked about it. It was an immigration issue that was taking place, and it was very, very interesting to learn how everything works. And um, then I also met with uh, BBK, the, our lawyers uh, from our city attorney's office, because I, I met with someone who specializes in the opportunity zones, and Santa Ana has opportunity zones right here where we are now. I'm trying to look into different ways that we can redo the Civic Center. It's on our radar. We've been trying to put this together. It's just a lot of information, and uh, you know we, we are uh, working towards that to make a, a change here, and that is my report. Thank you. Excellent report. Thank you very much. Councilor Jose Solorio, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, the streetcar, I, I did have that as a note. I've been receiving quite a number of uh, complaints myself. I'm happy, Mr. Mayor, that you and staff are meeting with uh, OCTA uh, and the merchants. And in addition to anything OCTA might be able to do, maybe there's some relief the city can offer. Uh, you know, we with controlling when streets are open or closed or water even bill. some signage, water bills, other utilities, trash, maybe there might be some things that uh, th that we can help with. They also have, even though I know there's questions on how much money is coming in from the parking fees, there's also kind of dollars that originate there that maybe we can, uh, we can work with. And then I did see uh, on my desk up here uh, this nice uh, flyer promoting the 150th celebration uh, at Centennial Park, Sunday, October 27th, 3 to 9 p.m., uh, it looks like it's going to be mailed to folks, so you know, look for it in your mailbox. And if you get it, it's real, and it's going to be good. And there's going to be a lot of you know, food, entertainment, uh, et cetera. So you know, a beautiful uh, presentation here. There's also a uh, time capsule ceremony, for example. So if individuals have ideas of what we should put in the time capsule, I know we're still looking for, for ideas for that. So I'm, I'm looking forward um, to that as well. And um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember David Peñalosa, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to uh, also piggyback off of what Vince, Councilmember Sarmiento said um, in regards to the impact that, we're, that the streetcar construction is having in downtown. I met with numerous restaurant owners and merchants along, and, and it is a, a serious uh, issue that they're facing right now. I know that, you know, two, three years from now, this is going to, bring a lot of business to downtown and, and whatnot, but these businesses, most of them do not own these buildings, are renting, and they can't make ends meet because it is, they are struggling. Um, I had lunch on Sunday at I Can Barbecue, that new barbecue place next to Velvet Lounge and off 4th Street. Very, very delicious. A lot of uh, good food, and you could see the investment they made in that space. And the owner happened to be there, and they came up to me, and they, they were worried. They are worried uh, because of the, the decline in traffic that they're – well, they said that they never got to experience the, the openness of the street because they just unfortunately opened during this, this construction. So I do want to make – thank you, Mr. Mayor, for having those conversations. Uh, you know, make sure that you could report back to us of what – if any changes are going to happen, I know they also discussed the idea, brought up the idea of, of the ability to validate uh, parking uh, at the numerous restaurants. They said would be helpful to them. Uh, last week, I just wanted to mention that I did meet with the uh, director of IT, Mr. Jack Trula, and our city manager, and, and Daisy was there as well. Uh, a lot of good things to come uh, to our just like overall technology infrastructure in our city. Very excited for that. It's going to 
save us a lot of time and, and, and just in doing things across the board, whether you're a resident or a business owner or a, a city employee, it, it's going to, you know, do wonders for all of us. So I'm excited to see those things happen. It's October 1st, and I know there's, there's, a, uh, there's a particular item that was promised to me in October. I'm going to make sure that I see it, uh, uh, you know, launched in October. And, uh, but I would please let me know if that can't be possible. You know, I, it's okay, but I just need to know uh, if, that, if we're not going to make that deadline. And uh, I also sent an email to you, Madam City Manager and Chief Valentin, uh, yesterday and today. Um, I, if I could get that, I, I, don't, I hate calling you guys out in a public setting, but, you know, I shouldn't wait more than a couple hours to get a response on a simple question. So if I could have that information by, the end, by tonight, that would be great. Um, and I will bring this up again if I don't get that information when I ask for it. Thank you. Councilmember Iglesias. So um, I just want to thank staff for the presentation, especially the homeless presentation. I really appreciate it. It gives us, um, I would say, like a guideline on what the things that we should be doing to address the homeless issue. It's something that is affecting the entire city, um, whether it be, you know, in, a, in our neighborhoods with individuals walking. Uh, like yesterday in my neighborhood, we saw this gentleman just walking the sidewalks on our street. Um, he was, you know, just with shorts on, no shirt and stuff, but he was just going everywhere. And, that, and that's, very, um, that's very intimidating, and it's very... It gives the, the, this community a sense of they don't feel safe. So um, if we could see how we, we are going to really make progress with the homeless issue, I would like to get from you, um, Madam City Manager, more of a report on where we're at with, um, with the, the services that we're providing, the, you know, the unsheltered individuals, and how many are we citing, how many are we, you know, arresting, um, and not and taking them, you know, not to jail, but providing them services and holding the count, county accountable for these services because uh, the county needs to be held accountable for the services when it comes to mental health. They have the um, responsibility to provide these services to our constituents here in Santa Ana. And um, so if I could have for myself on a monthly basis reports on you know those services that we're providing and how many individuals we're citing and everything. Also I would like to see the um, the update on the link. I know it's it's a shelter that we have and I've asked already on where we're at with the services. It seems like it's just a warehouse for individuals. I wanted more of a um, um, for you to provide me in, um, you know, updates on, okay, is the individual getting, leaving the, the shelter? How, how long are they taking to leave the shelter? Are they um, finding jobs? Are, are they not? Uh, all this stuff, I, I just, I, I still haven't received it. I know I've asked from it, for, uh, for it since like January when we did the, um, the, the tour of the link, and it seems like it's just a warehouse for individuals, not really something that is providing services in a way that we're going to provide them skills to become successful in our community. So I haven't received that, so I'm hoping that we can receive that. And um, I am hoping that we, you know, that for, for Saturday, I know we're having the Taste of Santa Ana, and I'm hoping to see all of you guys there. Um, for those of you that want tickets, I don't know if there's individuals that want tickets, uh, if we could have something on how we could provide those tickets to the community members, that would be great. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing what we're, the things that we're providing in Santa Ana when it comes to our um, eateries and our you know, restaurants. And I just want to thank everyone for all the due diligence that you guys do with all of your work to provide us the information that we need. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, quick Yes, go ahead. Thank you. I forgot to mention this earlier. Uh, the Orange County Fire Authority is having an open house uh, Saturday, October 5th. Um, during the day from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And our uh, two fire stations here, uh, OCFA, the one on uh, 1029 West 17th Street and the other, which is Station 75 at 120 West 
Warner Avenue. Uh, they're having an open house also, and that will be October 12th, same time, same hours. Thank you. Thank you. And what I'm going to do tonight is close the meeting in memory of uh, Stacy Dukes. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about him um, and then close in his honor. I had the privilege of being a neighbor of Stacy when I lived in Wilshire Square some years back. He was one of my neighbors, and I got to know him very well and got to really appreciate him over the years. Um, and here, as I read about his background, I just want to share some things that I think are uh, you know, very important in understanding Stacy. He was really an artist, a designer. Uh, for many years, he worked in San Francisco, going into you know, major design studios uh, and developing all sorts of uh, techniques and, and disciplines. Uh, after San Francisco, he came to L.A. Uh, in the 60s and 70s and what was at the time referred to the California uh, tradition. And then that, in turn, shaped his career in future uh, design fields. Uh, he started out in Seattle, so he kind of worked his way south. Seattle, San Francisco, L.A., and ended up here in Santa Ana. Uh, in Seattle, he got a, a bachelor's uh, degree uh, in design, and then at UCLA, he got a master's in industrial design. Uh, in the 70s and 80s, he became a professor at Cal State Long Beach. He taught furniture exhibits, graphical design, environmental design, um, and that really led him to opening up a studio here in 1983 in Santa Ana, Stacy Duke's Design Studio, where he undertook a broad range of graphic and structural projects, working with a wide variety of materials and processes. And I'll tell you one thing, um, the thing I remember best about Stacy was he just had a great smile. He just cared about people. He, you know, many years, in the latter years, he was in a wheelchair. He'd come out to the events, but he'd always be there at the Artist Village, supporting restaurants, supporting galleries. Uh, you know, just a, a wonderful, wonderful person. And so it's my privilege and honor to, um, to remember him fondly and adjourn tonight's meeting in his honor.